The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Luckies are milder, smoother and milder, with never a rough puff. Yes, scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. These scientific tests are confirmed by three independent consulting laboratories, and they prove... Lucky Strike, mildest of six major brands tested. There's no doubt, when you light up a Lucky, you get a smoother smoking, milder tasting cigarette. And you enjoy the rich taste of fine tobacco because... L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that gives you more real deep down smoking enjoyment. So for the rich taste of fine tobacco, for smoothness and mildness with never a rough puff, light up a Lucky. Yes, prove to yourself what scientific tests prove. Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, today is Mother's Day. And in honor of that occasion, we would like to bring you a man who has been more than a mother to us. And here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, that was a very nice introduction. But I, I think, I think you were being just a little bit Overly sentimental there. Oh, no, no, Jack. I meant every word of it. And you truly have been like a mother to our little group of thespians. <laughs> oh, Don. I... Donsie's right, Jackson. You've really looked out for us all these years. Oh, gee, Phil. We all agree on this, Jack. Dennis, hasn't Mr. Benny been like a mother to us? Yeah, me, he even spanks. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, I only did that once and you deserved it. Imagine coming over to my house and throwing a dead cat in the living room. You said you needed violin strings. <laughs> Never mind that. Now, keep quiet. Yes, Jennis, you shouldn't act like that. After all, Mr. Benny has protected us like a brood of little chicks and sheltered us under his wing. Don. Don. I couldn't shelter you if I had a wing like a B-29. <laughs> Believe me. Look, Jackson, we're trying to say something nice, and you and Dennis are lousing up the mood. We are? Yes, Jack. Maybe we've kidded you so often you don't realize how much you've helped us. Oh, I realize I've been a great help to all of you. I know that when you came to me for sympathy, I gave it to you. And when you came to me for advice, I gave it to you. And when you came to me for money... You gave us sympathy and advice. <laughs> Yes. I don't see any reason at all why I should give you extra money. Who's talking about extra money? We want only what we got coming. I can't understand you, kid. Just a little while ago, you said I was a mother hen and you were my brood of little chicks. Now, all of a sudden, Dennis, why are you staring at me? It's the first time I ever saw a hen with glasses. <laughs> now, cut that out and let's get on with the program. For goodness sake, you start something on this show and before you know it... Come in. Hi, Rube. <laughs> hmm. Jack, isn't that the man who painted your house? You ought to know. You brought him over. <laughs> Look, Mr. Hawkins, I'm trying to do a radio program. What do you want? I just dropped in to tell you that I saw your show the other night in Pasadena. <laughs> you, you did? Yep. Pretty good show. You ought to bring it out to Calabasas. <laughs> <laughs> Calabasas? Uh, it's a pretty big place. Right now, we got 422 people. 422 people? There's a convention in town. <laughs> Conve well, who's there when there isn't a convention? Me. Just you? Ah, uh, when the sun ain't shining and there's no shadow, I'm a lonely boy. <laughs> well, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Hawkins, but my itinerary is all set. Well, okay. Just thought it would be nice to have some entertainment. So long, Rube. <laughs> so long, so long. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder why he always calls me Rube. <laughs> all right, kids, let's get on with the show. Now, we've got a lot to do tonight. Oh, before we start, Jack, that fellow was just here reminded me of something. What is it, Don? I wanted to tell you that I also enjoyed your show in Pasadena. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Don. Oh, it was great, Jack. And you certainly had a wonderful cast. You, Phil, Rochester, Vivian Blaine. Don't forget Tabby. Tabby? Who's Tabby? The dead cat. He's Mr. Benny's A in G-strings. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much you know. The A-string came off a total stranger. <laughs> So don't be so smart. Hey, Livy, how'd you like the way me and my orchestra stopped the show? Great, wasn't it? Mm, you were very, very good, Phil, but there was one thing that puzzled me. What was it, Liv? <laughs> 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 uh, well, how come when the rest of the band was playing, that's what I like about the South, Frankie was playing Tiger Rag? Well, Frank, Frankie's on strike. That's his way of picketing. <laughs> Oh, are the musicians on strike? No, just Remley. He's mad at Jackson. Why? Oh, it's nothing. He's mad because I won't let him take his electric guitar on the tour. And I'm right, too. Whenever he has that thing on the stage, the whole band gathers around it. Around his electric guitar? Why? It makes ice cubes. <laughs> And when he spins his guitar to be fancy, he's really mixing martinis, you know? <laughs> Say, Phil, Phil, did you fix it up for Sammy the drummer to go on tour with us? Yeah, I spoke to the board, and Sammy can leave the state provided he's in bed every night by 10. <laughs> and tell him to keep his shirt button. Those numbers on his underwear look awful. <laughs> and Phil... Phil, while I'm on the subject, it wouldn't hurt if some of your other musicians got to bed early, too. I'm sick and tired of you and your boys running around all night. That's telling them, Mom. <laughs> Stop that, Dennis. Now, look, kid, it's time for your song. Now, what are you going to sing? Well, I have something appropriate for Mother's Day. Well, let's hear it. Okay. Hold it, Dennis. Come in. Yes? Telegram for Jack Benny. I'll take it, boy. Hey, uh... Oh, just a minute. Here. Gee, Mr. Benny, when you reached into your pocket, I expected a nickel or a dime, but I never expected this. Well, what'd he give you? Lint. <laughs> Get out of here. Jack. What? Who's the telegram from? Just a minute. Ah, oh, this is cute. It's from the boys of the Beverly Hills Beavers. Listen to this, Mary. Dear Mr. Benny, our treasure and friend, we just had a meeting and decided to send this greeting to you that should fill you with glee. God bless you and keep you, Mother McCree. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, isn't that sweet? Mr. Benny. Dennis, sing your song, Mr. Benny's Crying. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That long, long ago was thine 
has come to man's estate, grown stalwart in body and strong. You'd hardly know that he was the lad you loved with your slumber song. The years have altered the form and the life, but the heart is unchanged by time. Dennis Day singing Little Mother of Mine And very good, Dennis I always sing good on Mother's Day Dennis, you sing good every day What have you got against Mother's Day? <laughs> nothing, nothing I think Mother's Day is the finest day of the year It's about time, it's been cloudy all week <laughs> Oh, go sit down <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our special surprise of the evening, I'd like you to meet a young lady whom you've seen many times on the screen and will be appearing with us on our tour, Miss Vivian Blaine. Thank you, Jack. I'm awfully glad that you invited me over today. Well, well Vivian, the reason I asked you to come over is uh, because, uh, well, you know that scene... We do in our stage show, you know, you know, where you're supposed to run your hand through my hair when I'm kissing you. Uh huh. Well, it was, really, it was awfully embarrassing in Pasadena. What happened, Vivian? Well, instead of my hand going through his hair, it went under it. <laughs> yes, your, your fingernails are so sharp. <laughs> Jack. Why don't you let her do the kissing scene with Phil? Mary, that's the way it was supposed to be. But after the first rehearsal, Vivian said she'd rather do the kissing scene with me. So, Mary, you don't have to look at her as though she has two heads. <laughs> Vivian, why don't you do the scene with Phil? Well, every time we rehearsed it, it was the same thing. He'd slip his arms around me, snuggle up close, and whisper in my ear. Gee, what do he whisper? Good health to all from Rexall. <laughs> Some romantic guy I can show him a thing or two I'm you know? sure you can, Jack But when we do the love scene I would like to make just one request Certainly, Vivian, what is it? Well, I wish you'd just put your arms around me And let our lips meet in tender embrace oh. Don't grab me and pull yourself up by my earlobes <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that Now, Vivian, how about doing a song? Don, shall we tell him? Huh? Well, Jack, we thought we'd give you a little surprise, so I got Vivian to cook up something with a sportsman quartet. Say, that's wonderful. Let's have it. Okay. Oh, just a minute, Don. Come in. Oh, no. No. Come back. Come back some other time, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Savoni. <laughs> Look, look, Mr. Savoni, I'm trying to do a program. Look, what do you want to see me about? Well, I need a little money. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could help me out. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I don't mind giving you a hand out every once in a while, and I'll stake you to a meal this time, too. But why? For heaven's sake, why don't you get yourself a job? Any kind of a job. All I need is 10 cents so I can take a bus down to San Pedro. The man said for me to be on the bus by six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
To be on the bus or on the boat? On the boat by I six thought so. o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> You got yourself a job on a boat, eh? No I went on a quiz program And won two glorious weeks in Honolulu <laughs> You? You won two glorious On a quiz program? Mm hmm I just can't believe it Well, I'll tell you how it happened anyway Walking down the street <laughs> I wasn't doing anything. Just walking down the street. I didn't feel like doing anything. So I just walked down the street and I wasn't doing anything. While I was passing the radio station, a fellow in the uniform said, Hey, you. I said, who? He said, you. I said, me? He said, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to be on the quiz program? And while I was asking him if he could spare a dime for a cup of coffee, he takes me inside the studio, writes my name in a card, and sits me down. Ooh, so near! <laughs> well, I'm just sitting there. And I ain't doing anything. Just sitting there. All of a sudden, the master ceremony says, our next contestant is Mr. John Alcitavoni. I said, John Alcitavoni, holy smoke, that's me! <laughs> I can't look at him. <laughs> I can't get over your winning two weeks in Honolulu. What was the question? Well, he looked at me and said, John, in geographical terminology, what is the parallel of the biological aspect of the vernal equinox? <laughs> and you, you answer that question? What a lucky guess! <laughs> Savoni, here's the dime, and give my regards to Hilo Hattie. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, Don. All right, Don. Let's hear what Vivian and the boys have cooked up. Sun don't shine, I get my loving in the evening time when I'm with my baby. You'll never miss just one little kiss. It's no fun with the sun around, but I get going when the sun goes down and I meet my baby. That's when we kiss and kiss and kiss and then we kiss some more. Don't ask how many times we kiss. At a time like this, who keeps score? I don't care if the sun don't shine. I'll get my loving in the evening time when I'm... That's when I'll be with my baby. We don't care if the sun don't shine. Morning, noon, or in the evening time. Cause we all smoke lucky. We don't care about the time of day Or if any should reduce our pay Cause we all smoke lucky 
when you puff and puff and puff and then you puff some more. Don't ask how many times we puff, cause there's no rough puff and who keeps score? We don't care if the sun don't shine, morning, noon, or in the evening time, cause we're smoking lucky. The lucky Vivian, that was wonderful, really swell. Oh, thanks a lot, Jack. I've got to run along now and do some packing. I'll see you at the airport tomorrow. Okay, don't forget, we're taking the TWA Constellation on our whole trip. I'll be there. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Don, Don, that was really a great idea you had for a commercial. Oh, thanks, Jack. And now, kid... Uh, wait a minute, Jack. Huh? I've been thinking about that fella, Savoni. What about him? Well, he always comes to you to help him out. Uh, why don't you give him a job? Well, I'd like to, Mary, but I don't need any extra help. But, Jack, you could use him around the house as, uh, well, as a caretaker. Well, I've got Rochester for that. Well, maybe you could use him as a gardener. Mm, I've got Rochester for that, too. Well, maybe you could use him as a night watchman. He's got me for that. <laughs> Dennis. I sit up on the roof with a machine gun. <laughs> Now look, Dennis. Get away from that lemonade stand. <laughs> Dennis, stop that. <laughs> anyway, Mary. Mary, why are you so anxious to get a job for Silvoni? Well, Jack, of all the men I've ever seen, he's the only one that would be a perfect match for my sister, Babe. <laughs> Your sister, Babe? What makes you think that they're a perfect match? I mean, what has Babe got in common with Silvoni? Well, babe just hangs around the house She don't do anything She just hangs around the house I mean, she don't feel like doing anything She just hangs around the house She don't feel like doing anything All right, all right You can stop with that, too Now, kids, I got a lot of packing to do So let's get on with... Dennis, where are you going? To answer the door Nobody knocked No, but with this kind of a show, anything can happen What? How did he know? Come in. Hello, Mr. Benny. Well, Mr. Benny. Oh, Mr. Benny, please excuse me for interrupting the proceedings, but I had to see you before you go out personally appearing. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you did. I understand that when you finish your tour, you're getting on a boat and sailing for merry old Hanglon. So I brought you a gift. A gift? Yes. I knew you were going, so I baked a cake. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Benny. Oh, what I wouldn't give to go on a boat trip again. Oh, oh then you have made a crossing. Huh? Three times. Oh, Atlantic or Pacific? Westlake Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, but seriously, I would like to go to Hanglin because that's a wonderful place to pick up antiques. Well, that's right, but Mr. Kitzel, I didn't know you were a collector of antiques. Ho, ho, ho! <laughs> collector? In my house, I got the original tent that George Washington used at Valley Forge. The original tent? Yep. Yeah. Where did you get it? Warsaw Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kitzel, you're joking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, Mr. Kitzel, I'm awfully glad you dropped in. While I'm in England, I, if I see an interesting antique, I'll bring it back to you. Bless you, heart. Yes. And Mr. Benny, I nearly forgot something here. I brought you another gift. Another gift? Uh-huh. A book to read it on the boat. Here. Well, isn't that nice? That's Jimmy Starr's new book, Heads You Lose. Thank you, Mr. Kitzel. I wrote something on the inside. Let me read it. Oh, isn't that sweet? Go ahead. To Mr. Benny, that old friend of mine, may you always be healthy and 39. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kitzel. You're welcome, and good luck on your trip. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.
<laughs> yeah, I wish Mr. Kitzel was going on the tour with us. Say, Mary, can you drive me to the airport tomorrow? Yes, I guess I can, but why doesn't Rochester do it? Well, I sent Rochester on ahead to Kansas City. He's taking care of some advanced things for me. Well, I thought your press agent, Steve Bradley, took care of those things. No, I sent him to Milwaukee. In fact, I heard from him this morning. What a crazy publicity stunt he has cooked up now. He's nuts. Why, what does he want you to do? He wants me to be rolled into Milwaukee in a barrel of beer. <laughs> No. Yeah. Then on the city hall steps, they open the barrel, I jump out, and the mayor blows the foam off my head. <laughs> I'm not going to do a silly thing like that. Say, Mr. Benny. Yes? Answer the phone. What? <laughs> that kid is uncanny. Hello? I have a long-distance call from Kansas City for Mr. Jack Benny. Kansas City? The charges are reversed. Will you accept the call? Yes, yes. Do you want me to tell you when the three minutes are up? No, no. Look, jerk, get off the phone and put Jack Benny on. <laughs> I am jerk. A uh, Jack Benny. Now give me the call. Okay, don't get your Irish up. Me? <laughs> Here's your party. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> Hello, Rochester. So you finally got to Kansas City, eh? How was the flight? Fine, boss, fine. And believe me, everybody in Kansas City knows you're coming. Good, good. Yes, sir. Your name is on almost every billboard in town. Almost? It would have been on every one of them, but I ran out of chalk. <laughs> I told you to take two pieces. I did, I did. Oh. And, and, boss, I got a surprise for you. A surprise? Yeah, when you arrive in town, you'll be met by the mayor of Kansas City, the governor of Missouri, and all the important committees. The governor and the mayor? How did you manage to do that? I can't tell you on the phone, but if anybody calls you Harry, mumble something about Congress and keep moving. <laughs> Harry, G. Rochester, do you think I can get away with it? I'm not worried about you, but I told him that Mr. Harris was the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State? I hope they'll go for a curly-headed Atchison. <laughs> I knew you'd go too far. Now, look, Rasha, do you stop at Wichita like I told you to? Yes, boss. The Kansas Medical Society is holding a convention there, and 2,000 doctors will be over to see your show. 2,000 doctors in the audience? Yeah, and you better be good. One of them has a long hypodermic needle. <laughs> I'll watch it, I'll watch it. But, Rasha, there's only one thing that worries me. This business of being met by the governor and the mayor and me being called Harry, do you think I can get away with it? Uh, pardon me. Huh? Your three minutes are up, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Come on, Mary, I'll drive you home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, even though we will be out on a personal appearance tour... <coughs> I'll still be doing my radio program on Sunday. Meanwhile, I hope to see all my friends in Wichita Tuesday night. We'll be in Kansas City Wednesday, Des Moines Thursday, St. Paul Friday, Moline Saturday, and next Sunday night we'll be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jack, aren't you going to bring your show to Waukegan? Mary, I was born in Waukegan. How can you follow that? <laughs> Jack will be back in just a moment, but first... In a cigarette, mildness is a true measure of smoking enjoyment. So light up a Lucky because... Luckies are milder, smoother and milder, with never a rough puff. Yes, scientific tests prove Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. These scientific tests are confirmed by three independent consulting laboratories, and they prove... Lucky Strike, mildest of six major brands tested. And no wonder... It takes fine tobacco to make a fine cigarette. And L.S. M.F.T. L.S. M.F.T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. So for more real deep down smoking enjoyment, for a milder tasting cigarette with never a rough puff, smoke a Lucky. You'll enjoy the smooth, rich taste of Lucky's fine tobacco. You'll prove to yourself what scientific tests prove. Lucky Strike is milder than any other principal brand of cigarettes. Try a carton of Lucky Strike. Good night, folks. Happy Mother's Day. The character of John L.C. Savoni is played by Frankie Fontaine. Be sure to hear Dennis Day in the day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned in for the Emerson Andy Show, which follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Mother's Halo Was Tight, starring Virginia Bruce and John Beale. Gene Kelly is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Family Theater makes a special dedication of this program to the mothers of America, to the women who, through the generations of our history, have played an important part in the work of building not only the homes, not only the schools, but the spirit of this nation. They have brought to their work the ideals of belief in God and in the principles upon which our democracy is founded. The light touch of humor in tonight's play is done with a feeling that under the dignity, poise, and charm of American womanhood, there is the same understanding, tolerance, and humor that have become our basic national traits. In this program, therefore, we pay tribute to the American mothers, rich in kindness and faith and unafraid of sentiment. We pay tribute to all they are doing to bring back spiritual values into home life and to return all families to the important practice of daily family prayer in their homes. Gene Kelly will return following tonight's family theater play, starring Virginia Bruce and John Beale in Mother's Halo Was Tight. Sometimes things happen in the springtime that don't usually happen at any other time in the year. And in a household, it isn't always easy to face these situations. In this particular case, Father had decided that the solution of the problem was a spanking for Bobby. If you were Bobby's father, you might have decided the same way. And of course, if you were Bobby's mother, you'd be listening outside the door. And you might hear something like this. Um, <clears throat> well, son, I know this is a corny old phrase, but it seems to fit. I just want to say that this is going to hurt me much more than it does you. The, the spanking is, you mean? Yeah, that's right. Well, I suppose we might as well get it over with. Bend over my knee, son. But look, Dad, how can it hurt you more than me? Because it... It hurts in a different way. You mean in a different place? No, I mean I mean exactly what I said. Now, come on, let's get this over with. But look, Dad, you always say you want me to understand things. I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you're not just stalling, are you, Bobby? No, honest, Dad. Well, there's no use trying to put this off, you know. It's going to hurt just as much later on. I'm not trying to put it off, Dad. I just don't understand what you mean, honest. Well, all right, I'll try to explain it. When I say a spanking hurts me more than it does you, I mean it hurts me, well, here in my heart. Gee, Dad, you mean you got some kind of heart trouble? <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with my heart. What I'm trying to say is that it hurts me deeply to think that you'd do a thing like what you did today, to deserve this punishment. And I think you do deserve it. I'm sorry I did it, Dad. I'm awful sorry now that I thought it over. Well, you should have thought it over before you did it. Yeah, I know that now, Dad. I guess it was kind of a dopey thing to do. Playing hooky is a very serious offense, Bobby. And besides, think of the worry you caused your mother. Yeah, Dad, but there wasn't much doing in school, and it was a nice warm afternoon. I'm not talking about the weather, Bobby. Yes, sir. I'm speaking of your poor mother. 
Just think how she must have felt when a teacher called up and said you'd disappeared during recess. Well, she didn't know what could have happened to you. Maybe you'd wandered off the school grounds and got lost or been in an accident or something. Did she really think that? Of course she did. And there she was, helpless. She couldn't go to to find you because I had the car. She couldn't call me at the office because I was out on the golf course. She couldn't... The golf course? What are you doing out there, Dad? Playing golf. Oh. Well, there wasn't much doing at the office. It was such a nice warm afternoon, I thought I wouldn't... You mean you were playing hooky too, Dad? Well, in a manner of speaking, I guess you... Um, yes. Oh. Oh, what? Nothing, just... Oh. Oh. Well, let's get this over, Dad. Get what over? The spanking. Oh, oh, oh yes, the spanking. Um, I've been thinking, son. Maybe we could put this off for a while. No use trying to put it off, Dad. It's going to hurt just as much later on. I'm not trying to put it off. I just want a little time to think this over. I'll, I'll tell you what. You pile into bed now, and I'll come back a little later. It's awful early to go to sleep, Dad. Well, get into bed anyway. You can read or something. Hey, I know. I almost forgot. i got to do some homework. Well, this is a fine time to remember that. Well, you see, Dad, with everything happening, and I didn't have a chance. I can do it right in bed. All i got to do is write a composition on Mother for Mother's Day. On Mother, huh? Well, all right, hop into bed. Here's your pencil and your tablet. You do your work, and I'll be back in, oh, half an hour. To give me a spanking? I've told you, son, I haven't decided about that yet. Now, you get to work. I'll be back later. Okay, Dad. Let's see. My Mother, a composition by Robert Williams, Jr. Mm. Hello, you hard-hearted father. Oh, <laughs> you've been eavesdropping out here in the hall, huh, Kathy? Why not? It's my own house, my own husband, and my own son. <laughs> How'd you make out? Well, you must have heard. As I'd say in court, the defense produced new evidence, requiring a recess to consider parallels and precedents. <laughs> in other words, the prosecutor suddenly realized that the prisoner's a chip off the old block, and the spanking's out. Quiet, he'll hear you. Let's go in the living room. Besides, I'm not so sure the spanking is out. I haven't made up my mind yet. Oh, you're so funny, Bob. Funny? Oh. Well, when you came home, you were bound and determined you were going to give him a spanking, whether or no. And now you're weakening by the minute. No, I'm not. I still say he deserves punishment for his rank disobedience, for the worry he caused you. Oh, he won't do it again, Bob. And besides, spanking... Well, you know how I feel about that. Yeah, I know. You're one of those women who think you can't get anything into a boy's head by paddling the other end. Well, that isn't the way I put it, but... Hey, Bob, don't sit down there. That's my speech. What? All these papers? Speech? About what? Well, here, let me get it out of your way. It's a talk I'm going to give at the women's club tomorrow. For Mother's Day. That's all? Say, this um, Mother's Day is certainly turning out to, out to be a major industry around here. Bobby's writing a piece about it, too. So I heard. You two ought to get together. You'd be able to swap a few ideas. Well, I'm afraid my ideas wouldn't go very well in his composition. Oh, advanced, huh? Mm-hmm. You could almost say revolutionary. How can you get revolutionary about Mother's Day? What's the title of your speech? Mothers of the World Fight Back? Oh, don't be silly. I'm not being silly. I just want to find out. Well, if you're really interested... Of course I am. Well, you know our women's club, Bob. Well, just to tip my hat to. Oh, you're not interested. Sure I am. Honest. Go on. I'll listen. Well, we always feel that we ought to be independent, progressive. We women should keep up with the world. Oh, nothing too much wrong with that idea. So I thought that at our meeting tomorrow, I'd ask the chair's permission to give a short talk on a modern mother's viewpoint on Mother's Day. Fine. But what's so revolutionary about that? Well, I'd really have to read the speech to you to explain it, Bob. Why don't you? Oh, you'd rather read the paper, I know. When I can be read to by my lovely wife? 
Do I look crazy? <laughs> yes, sweet Bob. Yeah, that's what I keep telling him down at the courthouse. Well, let's hear the speech now. Come on, Kathy, darling, give out. Well, I would appreciate your opinion of it. That is, how it would strike you if you were the women's club. Oh, well, that'll take a bit of doing, but I'll make a stab at it. Okay, I'm the women's club. I'm 75 beautiful and intelligent ladies, modernly progressive. You have the floor, madam, and I'm giving you all my attention. Now, go ahead. <clears throat> madam Chairman, fellow members of the women's club, since the time of Mother Eve... I wonder if I should wear my blue gab... You know, or maybe that flowered print would be better. Do you think so? Now, that's a great opening for a speech. Fools the audience. They think you're going to talk about Mother's Day, and it turns out to be clothes. Oh, you. Oh, you, too. Let's have the speech, huh, darling? Blue gabardine, I guess. Speech, speech. All right, all right. Here I go. Since the time of Mother Eve, we mothers have been the recipients of more poems, songs, and hymns of praise than any other group of mortals. Mm -hmm. Lyrics have been written in our honor. Put them all together, they spell mother. Here, here. Poets have composed verses like... Well, there are a lot of verses, Bob, but I haven't got a quotation for that yet. And on May 10th, 1913, Congress passed a resolution commending the annual observance of Mother's Day. Incidentally, Bob, I checked that date in the encyclopedia. As the women's club, I was just about to rush home in a body and look it right up. Go on, darling, go on. Don't then stop interrupting. I am not saying, ladies, that such adulation is not pleasant. We all like to be honored and revered. But as a modern, progressive, busy mother... I feel that there's a danger of letting our halos go to our heads. This Mother's Day, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's admit we're not endowed with any extraordinary powers, that we're not the saints or always the angels the songs say we are, but that we do appreciate how important is our job of raising our families. And there, too, let's be honest. Let's admit that many times it's the families who raise us. In other words, well... Let me give you an example. One Saturday afternoon, last year, about this time, Bobby, he's my oldest, well, he came into the kitchen. Hi, Mom. Got anything to eat? Oh, my goodness. Sometimes I think you're just an appetite with skin on it. You'll find some cookies over there in the jar, I think. Okay, Mom. I'll take a look. Oh, boy, chocolate ones. Don't take too many, Bobby. It's only a couple of hours till dinner. I only took six. Mmm. You make soda cookies, Mom. Where have you been all afternoon, darling? Playing baseball down the street. Oh? I looked down there a few minutes ago. I didn't see any boys playing. Uh, uh we, we played around the corner. Oh, I didn't think to look around. Bobby, let me look at you. Something the matter? How'd your hair get wet? Uh, uh... One of, one of the kids had a squirt gun. Bobby? Yeah, Mom. He shot it right at me. Gee, I had an awful battle with him. Robert, you're not telling me the truth. You can ask any of the kids. You've been swimming, haven't you? I wish you'd tell me the truth, son. Have you been swimming? Yeah. Down at the river? Yeah, Mom. I think your father talked to you about that just last week, didn't he? Didn't he tell you that water's contaminated? That he didn't want you going down there under any conditions? Yes, ma'am. I realize, Robert, what a temptation a swimming hole can be on a warm day, particularly if the other boys were all going in. They were, Mom, honest. But the thing I can't excuse is you're telling me a direct untruth. You mean why? Well, that's an ugly word, but it's the right one to use because it's an ugly thing. I don't want you ever to lie to me again, Robert. Okay, Mom, I won't honest. When you've done something wrong, you make it worse by trying to lie out of it. No matter what happens, always tell the truth. You'll find as you grow older... Oh, uh, you answer that, will you, Bobby? Sure. Hello? Hello, Bobby. Is your mother there? Yeah, just a second. For you, Mom. Sounds like Mrs. Smith. Hmm, I wonder what she wants. Hello? Oh, uh, Mrs. Williams, how are you? Uh, rather busy, as usual. And you? Oh, I I'm in a state, Mrs. Williams. Uh, Jim's coming in on the chief, and I've got to drive onto the station to meet him. And the girl who is coming to stay with the baby hasn't shown up. I don't know what to do. Oh, dear. I, I was wondering, uh, would it be 
great much trouble for you to come over and sit with him, Mrs. Williams. It'll only be an hour or so. Only an hour or so, she said, but I knew from past experience it would be two hours at least. Two hours out of a busy afternoon. Hello, Mrs. Williams. It would be so easy to say no. No, I couldn't come, that I was just going out on an important engagement and Bob was waiting for me in the car to tell her a white lie. Mrs. Williams, are you there? And then I looked around at Bobby, at those clear, steady child's eyes watching me and perhaps guessing my thoughts, perhaps knowing that lie that was in my mind. I turned back to the phone. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Williams? Uh, yes, Mrs. Smith, yes. I'll be right over. Oh, thank you. That's what my son taught me that day, simply by our look. I guess for all of us, telling the truth is a hard lesson to learn. But since then, whenever I think a lie will get around something, I see his eyes watching me, and I think and I hope that I'll always stick to the truth. I know that every mother in this women's club may have had similar experiences. I had another one that I'll laugh at for a long time to come, though it didn't seem very funny at the time. Bobby had been at summer camp, so I went up to get him, and we were driving back in the car. Somehow we got to talking about puppies. You mean cops won't ever hurt, hurt your mom? No, Bobby. Policemen are your best friends. Never be afraid of them. But they carry guns and things. Well, of course. That's to protect you against bad people. That's what policemen are for. And traffic cops? Same thing. They protect you against bad drivers. They arrest people who drive too fast. Is that why that one is following us right now, Mom? Yes, probably. He's... What? Where? Right behind us on a motorcycle. Don't you see him? Oh, oh, oh I better slow down. Hey, what gives? Pull over, lady. Gee, Mom, we almost bumped right in the back of our car. What are you trying to do, lady? Pile up a whole string of cars. No, I- I'm sorry, officer. I-, I saw you behind me, and I slowed down, and... Well, I I guess the brakes grabbed. Anybody ever tell you you're supposed to put your hand out when you're going to stop? Well, of course I know, but I but I stopped so quickly I didn't have time. Uh huh. All right, let me see your driver's license. Uh, yes, sir. It's right here in my purse. Well, that's strange. I I was sure I well I think maybe it's in my other purse. Oh. No driver's license. Oh, I have a driver's license, officer. The trouble is, well, I, I, I don't have it with me. Uh-huh, I understand. That's something else for this ticket. Ticket? Driving without a license. Stopping without a proper hand yeah, signal. But, officer, I told you my, my brakes grab. Yeah. And faulty brakes. Oh, but look, officer. Now, if you'll get in touch with my husband, I'm sure he'll explain this to you. <laughs> he, he's Robert Williams, the attorney. Well, that's good for you, lady. You'll need an attorney for this ticket. You know, you could have caused a serious accident on a main highway. But you don't understand. The only reason I slowed down at all was because I saw you behind me, and I I was afraid I was driving too fast. You've got a guilt complex, lady. You weren't driving over the speed limit. Oh, dear. No reason to get excited just because you see a cop, lady. You stay here till I get your license number. Gee, Mom, you sure were right. Cops aren't anything to be afraid of. He's a nice man. Hmm. Isn't he, though? A lovely person. (laughs) That was one lesson I tried to teach Bobby where I ended impressing myself. But the finest thing that Bobby helped me teach myself was another law. The greatest of all laws. It was one Sunday morning. Hurry up, Bobby. Or you'll be late for church and Sunday school. Oh, gee, Mom. I have to go to school every day and then on Sundays, too. Why do I have to go to Sunday school? Well, because Daddy and I want you to learn about God, Bobby. Did you ever go to Sunday school when you were a little girl and learn about God? Of course I did. Every Sunday. Then you know all about God, Mom? Uh, yes, uh, a little. Um, you better run along now, Bobby. You'll be late. Okay, Mom. See you after a while. Bye, darling. Bye. And be careful crossing the streets. The 
But that morning, he wasn't careful crossing the street. The car that swerved around the corner. I don't want to tell you about it, but I do want to tell you what he helped me learn that afternoon in the hospital. Lying so still and pale in that little bed. And when he opened his eyes and looked up at me. Hi, Mom. Hi, darling. I didn't get to Sunday school. No, but but you'll go again. Y- you're sure? I'm sure. Would you ask God if I can, Mom? Ask God? You know how to ask him, Mom. You said you learned all about him. Yes. Just ask him for me, Mom, will you? That's all you gotta do. Just ask him. All right. All right, baby. Yes, that was something I learned. Something I had forgotten. The simple faith of my own child. His trust in me and in God. We mothers sometimes don't deserve all the credit we get because it's through our children we often learn a little more of the real meaning and purpose of life. You know, there'll be a lot of sentiment directed at us on Mother's Day, but, oh, let's take it with a grain of salt. Between us girls, we know we're not wearing wings and halos. We're just women who are trying to do a good job in our own homes, and we're learning the job as we go along. Thank you for your attention. Well, how was it, Bob? As the 75 ladies of the Women's Club, I'm now applauding you roundly. (laughs) Thank you, ladies. However, as your husband, I'm disagreeing with you. Disagreeing? Why, Bob? Well, there's something wrong in that speech. I can't put my finger on it, but let me think about it. Maybe I'd better go into Bobby's room and settle that spanking first. Oh, dear, I'd forgotten about that. I'll bet he hasn't. He's been lying in there waiting for me to make up my mind. Poor kid. You mean he he isn't going to get a spanking? Give that lady 64 silver dollars. <laughs> Thanks for deciding against it, Bob. Oh, I guess I just got steamed up when I came home and found him out of line. Excuse me, darling, I'll go break the news to him. No, I'll come along and tuck him in. Hmm? Swell. See, Bob, I'm anxious to know now, why do you disagree with my talk? Oh, I don't know exactly, Kathy. Your major premise is sound enough. Your illustrations are good, and your... Summation is all right. And that's faint praise, if I ever heard faint praise. And I have. It's just that... Well, we'll talk about it after we say goodnight to Bobby, huh? Well, young fella, I came to break the new... Look at him. He's sound asleep with the light on. Oh, the poor kid was tired. He fell asleep right in the middle of that composition he was writing. Take the pencil and paper out of his hand, Bob. I'll cover him up. Okay. Good night, son. Bless you, Bobby. (laughs) Take a look at this, Kathy. My mother, a composition by Robert Williams, Jr. (gasps) My, what handwriting. (laughs) Bad as mine. Here, let me see if I can read it. My mother is a very nice lady who is married to my father. Oh, that's what the theater people call second billing. Well, at least I get mentioned. (laughs) My mother is kind and good and never tells lies. She always obeys law. She's a good cook, too. I think my mother is a saint. A what? Saint, he says. (laughs) S-A-N-T. He means saint, of course. Just left out the I. (laughs) Well, I'll certainly straighten him out on that in the morning. In the first place, I'm not a saint. And in the second place, his spelling is terrible. It's as good as yours. But Bob Williams. That's true. You know something, Kathy? I've just realized what's wrong with your Mother's Day talk. The thing I couldn't quite put my finger on before. You spoke of mothers as a class and of motherhood as a job. It isn't that. Well, then what is it? Well, motherhood to everybody in the world means just one thing. It means the best mother who ever lived. His own mother. And she, that one mother... Stands for everything Bobby's put down here. For kindness, goodness, truth, and 
well, for sainthood. But, Bob, that's the point I was trying to make. That modern mothers don't want that kind of reverence. Oh, I know. And that's why I said your spelling is as bad as Bobby's. You left out the eye, too. What you mean to Bobby. And that's the whole significance of motherhood to everybody. All mothers mean only one mother. That's the way it's got to be. You mean I've got to wear a halo, even if it's too tight? That's right. Mother. Mother. You know something, Bob? What? That's a very beautiful word. This is Gene Kelly again. Well, mothers, it looks as though we gave you a halo tonight. But it's a halo with a lot of happiness. For there's a lot of happiness in homes that are blessed with parents who give their children the ideals of good home life. Today you hear many opinions about what children should be taught. But the greatest lesson children learn is from the example of their parents. As wife and mother... The American woman is the soul of her family, and upon her depends in great part the awakening spiritual values in a home, the harmony and unity that should be in every home, the continuous remembrance of God, and the daily practice of family prayer. For in praying together as a family, there is the inspiration of example. There is the strengthening of family bonds. It means that the family that prays together stays together. Before saying good night, I'd like to thank Virginia Bruce and John Beale for their performances this evening. Our thanks to D.H. Johnson for writing tonight's play and to Max Terror for his music. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Henry Blair, Florence Ravenel, and Charles Maxwell. Next week, our Family Theater stars will be John Lund and Donna Reed in Song for Long Road. Your host will be Glenn Langan. This is Gene Kelly saying good night and God bless you. This series of the Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at the same time when our Family Theater stars will be John Lund and Donna Reed with Glenn Langan as host. Dick Wynn speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
This is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymore, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. Mother Frances Chavir. The story begins in the year 1833 in Aachen, Germany, a city close to the Belgian border. There stands a magnificent home owned by John Henry Caspar Chavir, deputy mayor of the city, a prosperous manufacturer of that day. His wife is a Frenchwoman, Marie Louise. His pride and joy is his daughter, Frances, age 13. Oh, Papa, you're home early. Early, but not unwelcome, I hope, Frances. Oh, Papa, you're always fooling. <laughs> Mama will be so happy. How is she today? Cheerful, as always. You wouldn't know she was sick. You must remember her in your prayers. I do, always. Go up. Tell her I'll be there in a moment. All right, Papa. Good afternoon, Mama. Did you have a nice nap? Yes, baby. Here's your milk, nice and warm. Put it on the table, dear. Oh, you must drink it, Mama. The doctor said so. My little nurse. All right. Give it to me. And you must get well very soon. I will. Now run along, Francis. You should be out on such a lovely day. Papa came home early. I'll stay until he comes up. You must be very understanding with him, Francis. He's going through a difficult time. I will, Mama. These are strange times. There's something in the air... I feel it. Like when you were a little girl in France, Mama? Yes, something like that. Tell me about it. Oh, Francis, you've heard it a thousand times. I love to hear you tell it. Please, Mama. All right, baby. When I was a little girl in France, there was a great revolution. There was fear everywhere among the nobility. Because the people had decided they no longer wanted a king to rule them but rather a man of their own choosing. My mother and father and I were put in a prison. I was separated from them and never saw them again. They were very bad, these men who did this. Sudden change brings violence. What then, Mama? There was a man named Robespierre who led the people. He died suddenly, and many of the prisoners were freed. I was among them. You think there is such a change coming here, Mama? Not that kind. But there is ill feeling toward the church, especially among the Prussians who rule Germany. Is that why Papa doesn't wish me to go to church? He doesn't want you to stay away on Sunday. Just don't go every day. But I want to go. He has great plans for you, dear. A good marriage and a high place in society. He's afraid if you go to church so often, you'll want to enter the religious life. You mean become a nun? Yes, dear. Well, I don't want that. But I do like to go to church. Then I'll speak to your father. Mama. Yes? 
Why does anyone become a nun? I suppose because they feel God wishes it, and they want it more than marriage and children. But how does one know? Each knows in a different way, I should think. I imagine it's something that grows in you slowly over the years, and then you just know. How lucky I am to be here. Mama, you might have died in France when you were a little girl, and where would I be now? There is purpose in everything. I am only very grateful for these years given to me, to have you close to me, and your sisters, and brothers, and your father. Mama, what's wrong? Nothing. You're in pain, Mama. It's gone now. Why? Why do you stare at me? When I saw your face, Mama, I had the strangest feeling. Marie Louise Chevier never recovered from her illness. And so at the age of 14, Francis became head of the household. Even the servants who might resent or take advantage of one so young learned quickly to respond. Only on one score did they raise objections. There's a beggar at the back door, ma'am. Well, give him something, Fritz. It's not my place, ma'am. It's the duty of the head of the household. All right, I'll go myself. I'll see if I can find something for him. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Fritz. Where is Miss Francis going? The beggar at the door, Herr Shavir. Oh, did more than usual lately, haven't they? Times are difficult, sir. Well, you must be generous with them, Fritz. No need to worry, if you'll pardon me for saying so, with Miss Francis as head of the house. Hmm? I haven't noticed. Unless I stop her or Cook does, the house would be bare. <laughs> Perhaps I'd better speak to her. Good evening, Father. I didn't hear you come in. No? Oh, you're too busy giving away the house. Fritz, you've been telling stories. Uh, excuse me, I, I must see how Cook is coming on with me. I think you'd better. <laughs> Francis, you must keep your generosity within bounds. I try to, Father. Most of the things I give away, I, I make myself. The clothing I knit and some old things I patch up. That's another thing, young lady. I've seen the light burning in your room far too long into the night. Uh, I don't need much sleep. Now, making things for the poor is a good thing. Not at the risk of your health. Besides, you don't see your friends. Oh, I have lovely times, Father, and you know it. You'll soon be a full-grown woman. You will have your choice of the most eligible young men in Aachen. Or Germany, for that matter. You're not trying to marry me off already, Father. No, no. No, not for a few years yet. Good. And don't worry, you'll approve of my choice. I'm sure I will. Dinner is served, sir. Oh, good. Come along, Francis. I told Cook to bake my favorite roast for dinner. Oh, oh dear, you did? Hey, what's wrong with you, Francis? Oh, dear. Oh, you're not very hungry, are you, Father? Hungry? I'm famished. Come along. Ah, that smells good. What's this? Fritz, what's this? It looks very good, Father. Well, these are leftovers from yesterday's meal. I told Cook to have a roast. The roast is gone, sir. Gone? Gone where? Oh, we had such a big family to feed, Father. Who did? The beggar, sir. Oh, Francis. But the passing years served only to increase Francis' generosity. She developed into a lovely young woman and took her place in the gay society of that day. Yet she always found time to devote to the sick and the poor. These were happy years for Francis except that the threat of violence and repression feared by her father and mother for years past suddenly burst into reality. What's wrong, Father? It's come. It's come at last. What is it? You're so angry. The Prussians, those savages. What now? They've begun arresting the clergy. No. Even the Archbishop of Cologne, thrown into jail. I never thought they'd go that far. With the Prussian running things, Germany is always filled with bloodshed. Francis, you better stay away from church for a while. What a thing to ask, Father. For your own safety, child. Can't you see, Father? That's just what they want. But we have no alternative. We have. Francis. Father, you've read your history. 
Every time anyone attacks the church, instead of stamping it out, it grows stronger. Because people won't be intimidated where God is concerned. We've got to go, Father. Francis? Yes, Father? You know I don't want you on the streets after dark. Did you come home alone? Yes. Were you at St. John's Kitchen again? Yes. There are so many, so many hungry people. Doesn't close after five o'clock? I was visiting. Visiting whom? Some sick people. Francis, you know how I feel about the sick. You want to bring disease home with you? I'm very careful. Francis, come here. Come into the library. What is it, Father? Canon de Burr is here. He had to leave. Oh, I'm sorry. He's very disappointed to miss you. He brought you something. What? In there. Look. Oh, Father. All for me? You know how much the canon thinks of you. He brought these things for you, too, so. These linens, fine silver plate. He shouldn't have done that. He looks to your marriage as much as I do. I think he keeps alive only to preside at your wedding. And he shall, if I marry. When you marry, Francis. Have you been thinking about it? Well, I've been so busy. Francis, your baptismal godfather was the emperor Francis himself. You were raised in wealth and social position. Your future is charted for you. You look at these gifts. These represent your life, not feeding the poor and caring for the sick. There are others to care for them. But will they, Father? They've always managed before. Now, Francis, I want you to stick to your own kind and your own class. See your old friends, like Gertrude Frank. But Gertrude has joined our group, too. Well, it's a relief to know you have company down there. Gertrude's a fine girl, comes from a fine family. Why don't you have her home for dinner? All right, I'll ask her. And Francis. Yes, Father? Remember what I said. This is your life. In the solitude of her room at night, Francis was assailed by mixed emotions, great doubts, and unanswerable questions. As the days passed swiftly, Frances divided her time between the social life of Aachen and her work in the charity group, telling no one of her dilemma. Then one day at St. John's Kitchen, where she was helping to feed the poor, her friend Gertrude Frank approached her. Frances? Oh, hello, Gertrude. Frances? Yes? Nothing. Can I help you? I'm almost through. Wait. Don't go yet. Yes? Do you have something to say to me? Why do you ask that? Because you've been so strange. Several times in the past few days, I've looked up to see you staring at me. I'm sorry? You seemed about to speak to me, and then suddenly you'd turn away and leave. Francis. Yes? I, I can't. There, you've just done it again. I'm sorry. I've been under a strain lately. Seeing these people, I suppose. Oh, it's getting late. Father will be furious. I must go. Francis. Yes? Can I walk home with you? Why, of course. Come to dinner. Father asked me to invite you. After a pleasant dinner, Gertrude Frank departed for her home. Later in the evening, the canon and some other guests arrived to spend the night. While they were chatting with her father in the library, Frances, tired from her day's work, slipped away. Fritz? Uh, yes, ma'am? If father asks, tell him I've retired early. Yes, Miss Frances. <coughs> hey, the storm is getting worse. It came up so suddenly. I hope Gertrude got home all right. Now, who can that be this late? I'll see who it is, Fritz. Yes, ma'am. Why, Gertrude, the storm, 
I couldn't get home. You poor dear, you're soaked. Come on in. Just let me rest a while. You'll do nothing of the kind. It's much too late. You'll stay the night. I hate to intrude. Let me see. The guest rooms are filled, I'm afraid. Father's friends. But there's plenty of room for two in my room. Come on. You'd better get out of those wet things. If you're ready, Gertrude, I'll put the light out. Yes. Good night, Francis. Oh, I'm so tired. Hmm? I hope you haven't caught a chill, dear. You were looking very pale when you came in. I'm all right. Francis. Yes? What is it? I... Are you religious? I mean, more than the average girl. Well, that's a strange question. I'm sorry. Forget I asked. No, I didn't mean it that way. It's just... Well, there's no way of telling. Did you ever think you saw God? What are you leading up to, Gertrude? Please tell me. Once, when I was a little girl, my mother was ill. I was sitting with her. Suddenly she was racked with pain. It happened often toward the end. But this time, looking into her face, her eyes, suddenly it seemed as if I was looking into the face of Christ on the cross. It was a fleeting thing. But in our work, caring for the sick, sometimes I think I see him in the face of every sick man and woman, crying out to me. Do you think God could send a person a message through someone else? If he wished. Francis, what is it, dear? No, no, don't put on the light. Are you sure you're well? Please forgive me for asking, but I must know. Francis, when did you decide to become a nun? Don't answer if you don't want to, Francis. What a question. It supposes so much. Have I done anything to suggest that I might be planning to become a nun? No, but you are, aren't you? I don't know how you could know, Gertrude. I've only been thinking seriously of it in the past week. Francis, I must tell you something. I've been trying to tell you for three days, but each time I've lost courage. Yes, I thought you were acting strange. Francis, you will become a nun. And you'll start a new religious order. Gertrude, what are you saying? I kept telling myself I must be dreaming. I wouldn't have told you tonight, but on the way home, the storm came up. I had to come back to tell you. I don't know what to make of this. I had to tell you. But why me? I don't know. Are you sure? As sure as I am of anything. If it was anyone but you, I'd say you were dreaming. Oh, Francis, what does it all mean? I don't know. I don't know what to think. <laughs> Time passed swiftly, and Frances' days were full. The gay life among the city's elect, and her life caring for the sick and the poor. With the passing of time, inwardly, almost unknowingly, she was planning her future. There's another beggar at the door, Miss Frances. Yes, Fritz. Cook told me. I'm bringing him these things. Why, well, ma'am, those linens... There, from your wedding trousseau. Oh. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. Whatever could you be thinking of, Miss? I don't know. One would think you'd forgotten about marriage. 
Yes. Here, take these to the beggar. These linens, too? I won't be needing them now, Fritz. Where's father? In the library, ma'am. See that we're not disturbed for a while. I want to talk to him. Francis Shavir joined the Third Order of St. Francis. And not too many years later, with four other nuns meeting in the city of Aachen, there was formed a new congregation, the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis, modeled after the saint of Assisi, who had cast off worldly things to work among the poor and the suffering. Although Frances Shavir was the youngest of the small society, she was chosen leader and swiftly proved her qualities of leadership. Slowly, with the passing years, the congregation grew larger. But with its growth came great hardship and even public ill will. One incident brought Frances before a public official of Aachen. I regret the necessity of this meeting, Mother Shavir, but oh, your group has gone too far. It's a public disgrace. But we've done nothing disgraceful. Oh, that is a matter of opinion. To what do you refer? I received reports that you were taking women of the streets into your infirmary. Why, yes. They needed help. We make no distinction. Indeed. They're shunned by every decent woman. Yet you, a woman who has devoted her life to God, take them in and care for them. We must, because no one else will. They're shunned by everyone. But God shuns no one. Our duty is clear. Yeah, but I've had complaints even from some members of the clergy and the sisterhoods. I... Oh, uh, I, I must insist that it be stopped, Mother Shavir. Pardon me, Your Honor. Uh, yes, what is it? The Commissioner of Health sent a message. He says the disease is spreading. It's worse than he thought. Worse? I see. Well, all right. Tell him I'll do everything I can. Uh, you must excuse me, Mother Shavir. This is urgent. What is it? What dis disease did he speak of? Smallpox. <sighs> the doctor warned me. I, I had no idea it was so bad... He feared an epidemic, and now it's come. But surely the city is prepared. No, our doctors are overworked as it is. Everywhere I asked for help, I was rejected. But there is help available. No, no, I tell you, the disease is too contagious. When word gets out, there'll be a panic. No one would risk his life to help. I would. You? What can you do? The nuns in my congregation are experienced in practical nursing, and I can organize others to lend their help. May I suggest that you convert public buildings into hospitals at once? I'll supply the nursing staffs. You think it would work? If we act quickly, isolate the sick, check the disease, there may still be time to prevent it from wiping out the city. Mm. Very well. I will arrange for the buildings and assign doctors to each. I must hurry. Good day. Uh, Mother. Yes? Thank you. Thank you very much. The sisters nursed the sufferers day and night. And when the epidemic was checked, not one of them had contracted the disease, though each was on the verge of exhaustion. Thereafter, the tiny congregation spread rapidly with the goodwill and commendation of the entire city. In the years to come, under the guidance of its founder, Mother Frances Shavir, the congregation of the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis spread throughout Europe, and after that, to the United States. The first foundation was established in Cincinnati. At the time of the Civil War in the military hospitals, the sisters won for themselves the title of Angels of Mercy, and a presidential citation was awarded for the work they did in caring for the wounded soldiers. Nurse, where's the doctor in charge? He collapsed, exhausted. We've had no doctor here since yesterday. I was afraid of that. I've come to replace him. Quickly, take me to the worst cases first. This way, doctor. 
We use this room for major operations. There'll be no time to prepare the patients. There are too many. They're all prepared, Doctor. They're bringing in the first patient now. Excellent. You will assist me. Yes, Doctor. You did an excellent job, Doctor. When I passed out, I was afraid they were all doomed to die. I'm glad I arrived in time, but don't thank me. Thank those wonderful nurses you have here. Everything was ready for me. I can't tell you how many lives were saved because there was no delay. Yes, they've done more than you can imagine. Well, I must go. There's another battle at Gettysburg. They'll be needing help there. If I may, I'd like to take your head nurse with me. She's amazing with the wounded. Head nurse? Yes, the nurse who assisted me. Oh, yes, yes. Well, she's not a nurse, Doctor. Why, she's the best nurse I ever had. The doctor, the woman who assisted you is Mother Frances Chervere. Mother? Founder of the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis. I wish I could keep her here, but she's needed to direct all the others. Oh, too bad. But don't worry, Doctor. She always turns up where she's needed most. Today, Mother Frances Chevere is gone, and the first steps have been taken toward her canonization. The congregation she founded today numbers over 3,000 members, with 95 hospitals and institutions in Europe, and 27 in the United States. Nine of these establishments in Ohio, eight in New York State, and others located in New Jersey, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, and South Carolina all carrying out the work of their founder, who has come to be known as Mother of the Poor. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, accident according to plan. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There are many kinds of jealousy, and none of them are good. The jealous one in love is the most frequent. But there is another more terrible jealousy. Yes, that of a man for his co-worker. Tom Reddick was jealous of Charles Fremont's cleverness, his ability to succeed. Always when there was applause for a job well done, Charles Fremont was patted on the back, fated, given a raise. Charles, Charles, you did it again. Boys, uh, I don't know what we'd have done without that building. I only wish more of the men had your ability. Oh, thank you, Mr. Winston. I appreciate your kindness. Oh, not since, my boy. Charles, I'd like you to take over general managership of the plant. Effective next week. Oh, oh, congratulations, John. That's when the jealousy reaches a sickening height. When the man of whom you're jealous gets your job. Tom Reddick had been the general manager of the plant. But Tom Reddick hadn't been able to arrange the lease on the new building. Hadn't been able to do anything but his job the best way he could. Slowly and often blunderingly. And when he lost the job, that's when Tom Reddick knew he had to kill Charles Fremont. Be careful, Tom. Remember, you're a slow, blundering thinker. But this time, 
You have a plan that's beautiful in its simplicity. You'll have a few drinks with Charles that evening and offer to drive him home from work. And at the railroad crossing out on the highway, you'll get rid of Charles Fremont. It will look accidental. Charles will be out of the way, and you'll get your job back. So, after work that evening, you stop Charles in the washroom. Hello, Charlie. Congratulations on the promotion. Oh, thanks, Tom. I'm awfully sorry, fella, replacing you this way. It doesn't seem fair somehow. Don't be silly. I was never comfortable being general manager anyway. I'm more of a shop man. It feels strange when I'm not around machines. Oh, I'm glad you're taking it this way, old man. You know, if I thought it was going to bother you, I- I'd rather not have the job. It really doesn't mean that much to me. Now, cut that out. You're the man for the job, and you take it. Hey, let me buy you a drink, and we'll toast your promotion and my return to the shop. Well, uh, I should be getting home. Oh, come on. A drink will only take a few minutes. Well, okay. Let's go. This isn't going to be hard at all, is it, Tom? He sympathizes with you, and you've convinced him he deserves the job. So there are no hard feelings, are there, Tom? That's it. Take him in for a drink. Then suggest a ride home. The train passes that crossing at 6.30, so don't dawdle over your drink. Here's looking at you, Charlie. Best of luck. Thanks, Tom. <coughs> Oh, that could be a bad habit. Let me buy you one. Oh, it's almost six. I really... Oh, come on. Don't make me hang around here alone waiting for that train. Tell you what. I'll let you buy me a drink. You let me drive you home. Oh, that's darn decent of you. You're getting the worst of the bargain, though. Not at all. It's a pleasure. Take you right to your door. It's only a few blocks out of the way. So you have your drinks and get into the car with Charlie. Drive out of the lot, through town, and out onto the highway. If you time it right, you'll arrive at the crossing just at 6.30. If the train is on time, the signals will be going, and you'll have to stop the car. It'll be easy to tap Charlie over the head with a wrench you have in the side pocket. Then you can get out, set the gears, and run the car in front of the train. It's the same train you take when you go home evenings without your car. So you'll just climb aboard in the excitement and go on home. When the story comes out, you'll just say that Charlie wanted to borrow your car for the evening, and you let him, seeing as how he was a good and close friend of yours. Can't tell you how grateful I am, old man. I've gotten to hate that train trip. Forget it. Maybe we can fix it so you won't ever have to take the train. Oh, that'd be fine. Oh, oh, oh. Those drinks made me sleepy. We have another 30 minutes of driving, you do. Why don't you take a little nap? Oh, oh. I think I will, if you don't mind. Not at all. You just take a little nap. This is even easier than you figured it, isn't it, Tom? He's sleepy from the drinks, and he dozes right off. Now you won't have to tap him with a wrench. You drive at normal speed, and soon the railroad crossing is just ahead of you. No sign of the train yet. Maybe it was early tonight, Tom. Maybe the train has already gone past the crossing. No, there's the signal. The train has passed the far curve. It's coming. Everything is in your favor now. Charlie is sleeping soundly. The road is empty of cars, and the railroad was kind enough to put one of their new automatic signals at the crossing. And here comes the train. But maybe all the noise has awakened Charlie. You get the wrench out of the side pocket just in case and... Charlie? Charlie? He doesn't hear you. He's sound asleep. The train is close enough now. You get out of the car, put it in gear... fans, don't look now, but right near your home is one of the sponsors of this program. 
Yes, I mean your signal gasoline dealer. That friendly station wearing the black circle sign with the big yellow letter spelling signal gasoline. And he's a man you should know these days, not only because he brings you the whistler, but also because at stations wearing signals yellow and black circle sign, you'll find the West famous longer mileage gasoline. Signal go farther gasoline. And after all, what's more important these days than getting the most miles you can from every gasoline stamp? So make it a point before next week's Whistler broadcast to get acquainted with your signal gasoline dealer. Prove for yourself what more and more thousands of wise Western drivers are constantly discovering. That you do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. You did it, Tom Reddick. You killed Charlie Fremont. He's lying in that flaming wreck that was your automobile. And you hide there in the bushes until it's clear and you can sneak on the train. No one will know. No one saw you. You did it perfectly. But you keep rubbing your ankle, Tom. Does it hurt? Maybe you twisted it, jumping down into the bushes alongside the road. But it'll be all right, won't it? Nothing can go wrong now. The crime is done, and done well. It looks clear now, so you decide to run for it to get on the train. Hey, Matt, you hear something? What? I said, did you hear something? Did you hear somebody yell? No, no, come on, Larry. There must have been someone in that car. A car don't run into a train all by itself. Ah, we hit that car awful hard. He must have been thrown clear. I thought I heard him moaning. Take him over there. All right, you look over there. I'll keep looking around here. Well, the guy might still be alive, you know, if he got thrown clear. Oh, why don't you just stop talking so much and look a little bit harder? Well, you got no sympathy. Guy is probably in great pain if he is still alive, but you don't care. <laughs> hey, Max. Max, I did hear something. Right over here. What are you fellas doing over there? We're looking for the victim. Find him over here. He's over here, Larry. Come on. I just heard something right here. Come hit. on, come on. They found him. Stop playing hide and seek in them bushes. He's over here. Hey, is he still alive? No, he's dead. And no wonder. Take a look at him. You're all right, Tom. They didn't see you. You're still all right. But that fellow they call Larry... The fellow that heard you moan when your ankle was hurt. He might remember it later. So you change all your plans. You try to sneak away even with a bad ankle. Hey, Max. Max, look, there goes somebody running over that way. Huh? Where? Hey, you're right. Hey, hey, you stop. Hey. Come on, Max. Let's catch him. What's he doing around here running? We'll find out. Come on. Yeah. After him. Hey, hey, wait a minute, you. Well, he's slipping. Hey, maybe he was in the car, too. Hey, why is he running away? I don't know. We'll ask him when we catch him. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? Hey, oh. what's the matter with you? Uh. Can't a guy run if he wants to? Do you have to go running after well, him? Well, maybe he knows something. Knows something about what? Uh, you always make a big mystery about everything. Now, what would he know something about? About the guy that was dead. They say a guy that's doing all the running might have had something to do with it. Oh, you sound like a regular detective. Stop with that stuff already. The train's late. Let's go back and help. Wait a minute. I think we ought to catch that running guy. Oh, he's gone. He was probably running because he was late for his dinner. Now, cut it out and let's go back to the wreck. It's still all right, Tom. You got away, but that was awfully close. You hadn't figured on the ankle or a snoopy person. Now you've got to change all your plans. You can't get back to where the train is and... Your ankle is swollen from the running you did. But there's a bus stop down the road, and the bus goes right by your house. It's not far to the bus stop. Just walk slowly, and you'll make it all right. There's the bus waiting to leave. You get in and take your seat. Evening, Mr. Reddick. Haven't seen you in a long time. (laughs) 
It's all right, Tom. In a few minutes, you'll be home. You forgot, Tom. You can't go right home. The bus has to pass the railroad crossing, too, and the train is at the railroad crossing. You'll have to wait until they get your car off the track. Have to wait a few minutes, folks. Sorry. Hey, Mac. Yeah? What happened? Car ran into the train. They killed the guy driving it. Really? Anybody hurt? I told you. Kill the guy. I mean on the train. Anybody hurt on the train? No. Hey, open the door, will you? So this got to go with you and tell the widow what happened. Yeah. Good then. Hey, Max, come on. Okay, okay. Gee, I sure hate to have to tell that dame what happened, Larry. Shouldn't the police or somebody do it? No, it's better we should. Bad enough what happened without the police going to the house. Well, okay. Get in. Where do you want to go? The name of the deceased was Fremont. Charles Fremont. Lives on North Brookside Avenue. I passed a couple of blocks from there. Awful, ain't it? Ah, oh, well, you know how it is. People don't pay no attention to signals at all. Yeah. It's awful, but serves a guy right for not paying attention. Hey, here's a good seat. Yeah. Hey, buddy, that right? What? I was just telling the driver what a terrible thing it is. Oh, yeah, terrible. Hey, do I know you? Seems like I've seen you somewhere. I, I don't remember. I don't think... Well, I meet a lot of people. I just know. Did you... See the accident? Oh, me? Yeah, I did. I seen the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, my... it was terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my friend Max here and I were out taking a hike when we saw the accident. It was quite a joke. A guy driving the car. Yeah, that's a guy I feel sorry for. He was a pretty young guy. Really? Yeah. Maybe uh, 35. Me and Max here are going to tell his wife. I think it's better if we go than if the police were to go. It's the least you can do, you know. Yeah, it's the least you can do. You know, the funny thing, the guy wasn't driving his own car, but some other guy's car. Man, can you imagine letting a guy your car to drive and then he gets killed in it and flex your car? Especially now when it's so hard to get cars. I am Reddick. Tom Reddick. What? The guy that owned the car. His name was Tom Reddick. Yeah, we're going to tell him, too. Okay, folks, all clear. Here we go. That's not good, Tom. Things are piling up. Things you hadn't counted on. This man saw you running away, and now he's going to tell Charles Fremont's wife that he's dead. And then he's going to look for you to tell you your car's been wrecked. Why do some people always have to butt in, making you change plans? You've got to get out of that bus and get away. Get home before this Larry does, and some way get Hazel out of the house so that there'll be no one home... When Larry gets there. Beachwood, Beachwood Avenue. Good night, Mrs. Nelson. I'll get out here, too. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Reddick. I forgot you were here. That's all right. Excuse me, I'm late. It's awful about Mr. Freeman. Awful. Good night. Hey, driver, just a minute. Hey, what'd you call that guy? Mr. Reddick? Reddick, yeah. Hey, what's his face name? I don't know. Why? That car was owned by a guy named Reddick. That's why. Hey, stop the fuss. Oh, what difference does that make? Max, come on. Come on, I want to talk to that guy named Reddick. Yeah, we got to tell that woman you said. Where are you going now? The guy that just got off was named Reddick. So his name is Reddick. I don't follow you. Oh. Why don't we just go home and forget all about this? It's none of our business anyway. Come on, come on. Don't you understand? I tell this guy all about the accident, who was driving the car, and who owned the car. And he never said anything about his name being Reddick. And the guy that owned that car, his name was Reddick. He didn't say anything, then he's just a guy named Reddick who didn't own the car. Say, what's got into you? Oh, I never thought of that. You mean he could be perhaps Harry Reddick and he didn't even know this Tom Reddick that owned the car, huh? Yeah, now you're getting smart. It's a fine time to get smart after we get off the bus. Now we got to walk to the widow's house. Well, while we're walking, we can think of what to say to poor Mrs. Fremont. 
Ah, oh, that's a terrible thing to happen to a lady losing her hubby so suddenly. Yeah, but I still don't think this is any of our business. And besides, my missus is going to be awful sore at me coming home so late. Now, look, when you explain to her what you were doing, she'll be very proud of you. But every man has the heart to do what we're going to do. Yeah, you mean it's not every man who's such a budinsky to do what we're going to do. We could walk right back to the corner and get right on that bus and go right home. No. I got to tell the widow what happened. Hey. I know. Now what? Look at that street sign. This here is Hillbrook Street. Oh, that's very nice, I'm sure. Hillbrook Street is where this Reddick guy lives. Tom Reddick. Let's go tell him first what happened to his car, huh? Maybe he can help us tell Mrs. Fremont. You must know her husband, a dead husband, must have been a friend to borrow the car. Yeah, in fact, maybe he'll go tell her and we can go home. Yeah, now let me see. This house is number 479. Uh, what number did that guy say he lived in? Oh, I don't remember. Why don't we just forget all about it, Larry? Why do you want to butt in? I think it was number... 456. Let me see. I wrote it down here. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Number 456. All right. Which way do we go? I guess it's down here. Hey, look. That guy up ahead of us has got a bad leg. Oh, you're driving me crazy. Now, what difference does that it make? It don't make no difference. What's the matter with you? Can I remark to a friend that a guy up ahead has a bad leg? Oh, you're always remarking something. Sometimes I wish you'd shut up. Max, that's not nice. Well, I do. Here's 460. Hey, look. The guy with the bad leg, he's finally home. See? Say it's the house down there. Yeah, but he's not going in, see? He just stopped to look at the number. Hey, that's that other Reddick guy. The one on the bus. Well, he's not going in that house, and that's number 456. Yeah, it is. Well, I hope they got insurance on their car. That was close, Tom. You saw them just in time. So you just kept walking until they go in the house, and then you come back and wait for them to leave. They'll tell Hazel all about it, and after they leave, you can go in. Tell her you loaned the car to Charles Fremont and came home on the streetcar and bus. You're late because the bus got stopped at the crossing. You had no idea that your car was the one wrecked by the train, or that Charles Fremont was dead. Now those men are coming out of your house. Keep back, and they won't see you behind the hedge. Nice lady, she was upset. Well, of course she was upset. They all make me feel kind of like talking to people I don't even know. Well, it's a good thing we did. We might have gone right over to the widow's house. Which way did she say with the police station? Four blocks to the left. We better hurry. The police station. Why are they going to the police station? What did they talk to Hazel about? Who are those two men, Tom, and why do they keep following you? Better hurry in the house, Tom, and see what was said. Hazel? Hazel, I'm home. Well, it's about time. Where have you been? Dinner burned your crisp, and it cost 30 red now, coins. Now, don't start screaming again. I got stuck on the bus. There was an accident at the railroad crossing. Who were those men I saw leaving the house? So you lent your car to Charlie Fremont. You won't let me drive because you don't think I'm careful enough. But you lent the car to Charlie Fremont. How do you know? Who are those two men? That... that accident you saw from the bus, that was your car. Charlie Fremont had an accident in your car and got killed at that railroad crossing. What? Well, I had no idea that... Well, he did. What you loan it to him for? I can understand you're driving him home if you want to, but what you loan him the car for? You were coming home and he was coming home. Why'd you come home together? He told me he was going over to the other side of town to see a customer. How did I know he was going to come right home? Let me smell your breath. What? You had a few drinks, didn't you? I thought you had. You and that Charlie Fremont. You stop and have a cocktail before dinner and keep the dinner waiting until it's not fit to eat. Then come home and tell me some fantastic story about loaning the car to Charlie Fremont. What are you talking about? Those men over here. They asked me if we had any relatives living around us. I told them the only relative we had was my sister in California. That it must have been you they talked with on that bus. Maybe you can fool some people, but you can't fool me. I know you, Tom Reddick. You were in that car, and you got scared because you were both drunk. I told you I lent Charlie the car. How many times do I have to tell you I lent Charlie the car? Those two men told me about you. They saw you there at the railroad crossing. One of those men talked to you on the bus, and you made believe you'd never seen him before. Made believe you didn't even know people named Charlie Fremont and Tom Reddick. You're just a good-for-nothing drunk, and I wish I never married you. Look, look, Hazel, there's no chance you getting upset about this. Sure, I was in the car. We had a couple of drinks in town before coming home. Charlie insisted on it. 
I got scared when we had the accident. So I ran. You're not going to go and tell? No, are you? I most certainly am. I never did like Charlie Fremont. And his wife. That no good. Calling me up in the middle of the afternoon to crow over me. Mrs. Fremont called you up? To crow over me. Bragging about how her Charlie got your job away from you. She takes your job away from you so you go and have a drink with him to celebrate. Stop it. What's the matter with you? Aren't you ever happy? Don't you have any feeling toward me at all? What's that? I'm sure I don't know. The doorbell. Answer it. I'm not home. Don't you dare order me around, you drunk. Don't you dare even talk to me. Shut up. Yes? Uh, good evening. We thought that... Hey, Max. It's the guy. Yeah, maybe you were right. What do you want here? Who are you? Hey, now, look, Mr. Reddick. Why didn't you tell us on the bus who you were? We were just trying to help you. It's none of your business who I am. Now, get out of here. No, no, no. Take it easy, Mr. Reddick. Somebody has to do these unpleasant things. Me and Max here thought we would. The least you can do. He was in that car. I told you he was. Hey, so shut up. I will not shut up. You were in that car. You told me you were. You're so smart. Having a drink with a man who takes your job away from you. Mr. Reddick wants his job? Oh, gee, I'm sorry Mr. to hear Mr. Fremont that. got his job. So he had a drink with him to celebrate. And then they were drunk and had that accident. Wait a minute. You mean... You mean that Mr. Fremont got Mr. Reddick's job away from him? And they had some drinks together and then they were both in the car when I hit the train? Sure they were. Only Mr. Reddick ran away. Maybe he ran away because... Hey, wait a minute. Max, Max, he's trying to... Whatever. Get him, Max. He can't run far. He's got a bum ankle. Yeah, yeah, okay. There he goes down the lower. Follow him, Max. Hey, look. Look, he fell. Leave me alone. Uh, Leave uh, me alone. I'm sorry, Mr. Reddick, but I think we'd better take you to the police station. I think you murdered Mr. Fremont. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to make clear just what we mean by the more conscientious service your car gets from a signal gasoline dealer. For example, take Larry Duty's signal gasoline station in Oakland, California. While checking your water and oil, Larry's also busy making sure that excessive grease and corrosion isn't clogging your cooling system or that a loose or fraying fan belt isn't about to give you trouble, or that acid corrosion isn't eating your battery cable. And while he's testing your tires, he's on the alert for any little breaks in the rubber that could spread and ruin the tires. What's more, there's a good reason why you'll find these, plus many more unasked-for extras, not only at Larry Duty's signal station in Oakland, but right at your own neighborhood signal dealer. You see, being in business for himself, your signal dealer will go out of his way to keep you pleased so that you remain his regular customer. You can prove this for yourself by looking up the station in your neighborhood wearing signals, black and yellow circle signs. And there never was a more important time to do this than now, when your car needs signals more thorough service to help it last out the duration. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Tom, you bungled your perfect plan, didn't you? But then you never were any good at planning. That's why Charlie got ahead of you. And, of course, you let the little man who was always butting in make you so nervous that you gave yourself away. But when you got to the police station, you really thought fast for once. You kept your mouth shut and let them believe what they wanted to. Your wife's story helped. You were drunk. The accident happened. You weren't hurt. But you got scared and ran away. Maybe they'll believe that. And all you'll get will be a few years for manslaughter. Maybe they'll believe it. But even as you think it, you know very well they won't. The motive is too apparent. Charlie got your job, so you killed him. No, Tom, you won't get away with it. And so as you sit in your cell and brood over the fate that awaits you, you make up your mind. And you start resolutely into action. A small barred window is high over your head. And as you strain, you think of that little man who was always butting in. The little man who caused all your troubles. And you can almost hear his voice. Sure, sure, we know. We'll only be a minute. We got something very important to tell him. Ready, huh? Well, he's in 214. Boy, he'll really be glad to see us. Yeah, you bet. We just sent me your copy. He counted the copy. 
We got news for Mr. Reddick. Yeah? What kind of news? Well, there was something fishy about the accident where Mr. Fremont got killed. They had an autopsy. Yeah, and, and they found out something. They don't really have anything on Mr. Reddick. They're going to let him go. Yeah, let him go? Sure, and we came right over to tell him. When they had the autopsy, they found Mr. Fremont wasn't measured at all. He was dead when the train hit the car. He wasn't supposed to drink, and he died of a heart attack 20 minutes before the accident while he was still riding in the car. No kidding? Well, he'll be glad to hear that. Here's his... Hey! Hey, Mr. Reddick! Well, what do you know about that? Mr. Reddick went and hung himself. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of a friendly case of blackmail. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Bruce Elliott, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The fourth station of the cross. Jesus meets his afflicted mother. Now, Jesus fell headlong the street from the weight of his cross and was helped to his feet and made to resume his journey. The people in the cathedral moved slowly and looked to the fourth station to see a woman standing along the dusty road. Her arms are outstretched toward Jesus as he slowly comes along the crowded street. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee, because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. Consider the meeting of the Son and the Mother that took place on this journey. Jesus and Mary looked at each other, and their looks became as so many arrows to wound those hearts which loved each other so tenderly. And thou, my Queen, who was overwhelmed with sorrow, obtained for me by thy intercession a continual and tender remembrance of the passion of thy Son. The Passover was at hand, and Mary came down to Jerusalem, as was the custom of her people to make sacrifice, and to worship at the temple. Mary was greatly troubled in her heart. For the years since she had consented to conceive the Son of God had taught her how heavy was her responsibility. Joseph, her husband, was dead, and now she alone knew who her son was. She had seen but little of him since he did her bidding at the marriage feast at Cana, and she rejoiced that he was in Jerusalem, and that she might see him again. She was staying with some of the women who followed Jesus, and among them was Mary Magdalene, who praised Jesus at every opportunity. And one of the Pharisees shouted out, I was a sinner and had no right to anoint Jesus. But Jesus rebuked them all and told me to go in peace. And did you see Jesus again? Oh, yes. At Bethany, six days before this Passover. How was he? He seemed tired and very sad. I saw him as he was eating with the twelve. I had some nard and went in. I know it was a bold thing to do, but I did it. Don't stop, Mary. I'll introduce you after you've finished. Well, as I said before, 
I anointed his feet. This time there was a great clamor, and from his disciples, that dark-bearded one, Judas, shouted out, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That would have been Judas. So like him, always thinking of shekels and denarii. I think some of the others agreed. But Jesus silenced them very quickly. What did he say, Mary? He reminded them that the poor would always be about. But they would not always have him. What was that? He said that the poor would always be about. But the rest of it? But he wouldn't be with them always. And he went on to say that in pouring the ointment over him, I had done it for his burial. For his... Mary, what is it? Are you ill? No. No. Let me get you some wine, but let me introduce you. Women, this is Mary, mother of Jesus. This is Mary of Magdala and Elizabeth. It's blessed you are to have such a son. Here's some wine. Drink it, Mary. It'll make you feel better. Thank you. Wine... Why, Mary, you must have been present when he changed the water to wine at Cana. Yes, I was there. Oh, tell us all about it. Mary, did you see him do it? What did he say? What what did he say? Oh, please, don't ask her to. I'll call the others. You must tell us all about him. We want to know everything from the time he was little. I'm sure he was a perfect child and gave you no trouble. He gave Joseph and me no trouble. Once, when he was about 14, he was lost for three days. Lost for three whole days? You must have gone out of your mind. Where was he? We found him in the temple, talking to the rabbis about the scriptures. Think of that. A boy of 14 discussing scriptures. It's just too wonderful to believe. But there's one question I always ask myself. What is that? Where will it all end? I mean, he won't go on as he has forever, Mary. You should know. When will he deliver Israel and proclaim his kingdom? What you ask me, I don't know. Surely he's taken you into his confidence. It's but natural he would tell his mother. You must remember I've seen my son only a few times since that day at Cana. Of course, I hear from time to time what he's been doing. When next you see him, you should ask when the kingdom will be. Everyone's asking... Where do all these miracles lead? When will he raise up an army of angels and drive out the Romans and make Israel all-powerful among the nations of the earth? You will see him, won't you, while in Jerusalem? Yes. I'll not leave the city until I've seen him. Come in. It's good to see you. Is Mary here? Yes, on the roof. Is she alone? Yes, right up those stairs. John, is there anything wrong? Did you want to see her alone? No, no. I I just want to bring her word of Jesus' plans for the Passover feast. Then go to her. I'll stand close to the stair and see that you're not interrupted. And Mary of Magdala told me what he said when she anointed him at Bethany for his burial, John. I remember the words. And shortly after, he sent two disciples into Jerusalem to find a colt for him. They found it exactly as he said they would. And he rode it into Jerusalem in triumph. A colt? The foal of an ass? Yes, it was. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king will come to thee, the just and savior. He is poor and riding upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Appoint a solemn procession with leafy branches, even to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I give thanks to thee. Mary, where did you know all this? 
I'm not a learned rabbi, but I have listened to them saying the scriptures. Every passage which tells of my son. Every woman of Israel knows how he was to be born. And every daughter of Zion secretly hoped that she would be chosen. You don't know how they jeered at me in Nazareth and whispered behind my back. And how I had to go before the magistrate. And how Joseph stood by me. John, there is nothing written or said by the prophets I have not considered. But Mary, do you understand? Not everything, for much is hidden. But this I know, for it was said to me, to me, John, by Simeon at the presentation. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And now in this house I begin to feel the point of the sword from the words of Mary Magdalene. This ointment is for my burial. But why do you come, John? Oh, to tell you that Jesus will celebrate the feast of the Passover with the twelve at the house of Mark's father. Then I am not to see him again. He did not say, only that I come and tell you of this. John, you know him better than any. Has his time come? I cannot say, but it's well known the priests have plotted to kill him. Must he be brought then like a lamb to the slaughter? So it's been foretold. But must it be? God has his design. That cannot be changed. And men can only speculate as to the time and the place it will be complete. Men cannot change it, but God can. Twice your son has told us how he would die. On the Roman's cross. Cannot, will not God find another lamb to sacrifice? Even as he saved Sarah's son from Abraham's knife. Mary, do you not know why he was brought into the world? That he shall be great and call the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Even so. And all this will come to pass as promised. Jesus tells us that he must suffer many things in order that it be accomplished. God is all-powerful. The sower of life, the reaper of death... Can he not take away the sins of the world without the blood of my son? His son too, Mary. His only begotten son, whom he loved. Mine is a mother's love for her child, and it is stronger than death. I'll not give him up. Oh, woman, will you stand against the will of God? John, I am flesh and blood, and he ate and drank of me for the months he was in my womb. You were the cradle wherein God raised the Savior of mankind. Of my free will, I consented to the angel of the Lord for his conception. Can I not then consent to or deny the sacrifice? Would you deny the salvation to those who will come after? Would you say to the daughters of Israel, you and your children are lost because I am his mother and I love him? More than life itself. That is the way he loves us all. Father in heaven, I am your handmaiden. Have pity on me. Never separate me from my son. Whatever he must suffer, spare me not, and let his humiliation be mine. Blessed art thou, Mary. You must go now. Yes, we're preparing for the feast. I have something for him. Oh, a cloak. I hurried to finish it. I used only the soft wool of the lamb. Oh, this is fine work, Mary. No seams. No. I wanted it to be all of one piece. Go now and say to him that his will is mine.
John returned to the house where the feast was to be celebrated. Mary stayed on the roof until it was time for the feast in the house of the women. And then she went down to them. And soon after the feast was over, she went to her bed. For she did not wish to be burdened with questions from the others. And Mary slept fitfully until about the twelfth hour, at which time she was awakened by a distant sound. Mary? Mary? Here, at the window. Did you hear something? Listen. It must be midnight. They're changing the watch. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't awaken you. It's all right. I wasn't asleep. Wait. What is it? It's not the watch. There's too many men for that. Then what do you think? Listen. It's soldiers, Romans. They've changed their direction. They've been marching toward Gethsemane. Oh, Mary. What is it? Why do you look at me like that? Gethsemane is the place where Jesus often goes with the twelve to pray and be alone. Mary? I could find out nothing. Did you go to the high priest's house? The watch turned me back. They said a woman should not be out at this hour. They either did not know what had happened or would not tell me. What is the hour? It'll soon be dawn. Are you sure the returning soldier stopped at the high priest's house? I could only judge from the sound. They moved in that direction. The day is here. Soon we can go out. What? John! Oh, I-, I can stay but a moment. What has happened? Jesus is arrested. No. They've taken him to the high priest. We were at the garden. Judas betrayed Jesus and led the guards to him. Where are the others? We've scattered. The last I saw of Peter, he was following Jesus in the crowd at a distance. I, I don't know where the others are. I'm looking for them. What can the high priest do to him? They'll ask him, are you the son of God? And when he answers, they'll say he's blasphemed and condemn him to death. But he is. Yes. Yes, Mary. He'll be condemned for telling the truth. But Pilate will have to approve the sentence. Well, Pilate cares nothing about our laws, and he despises the high priest. That's our one hope. But I must go find the others. I'll send word where we are as soon as I can. Mary, where are you going? To the temple. Now the temple was not far from the Antonia, which was the dwelling place of Pilate, and the fortress of the Roman cohorts. Already the streets were filled with people, but they did not know Christ had been arrested, for the high priests were anxious that he be removed with as little disturbance as possible. And Mary entered the court of the women and spent much of the morning in prayer. Forgive me, O Lord, that I seem as to fight against thy will. I am thy servant, thy handmaiden, the bearer of thy son. This be his hour for which he was brought into the world. I humbly beseech thee to let me share it with him. The world cannot be redeemed but by his life. Then I beg of you, let me share his suffering, for I am his mother. Mary. Mary. What is it? Why have you come here? Peter and John sent me to get you. John is waiting for you at the house. Peter is keeping watch near the praetorium. 
What's happened to him? Good news, Mary. Pilate examined Jesus and said he could find no fault in him. Then he's free. No. Pilate sent him to Herod because he discovered he's a Galilean. But if Pilate found no fault... Come, John is waiting. He'll tell you more. I spread the news about Jesus' arrest. And then I ran into Peter doing the same thing. But Herod put John the Baptist to death... And he hates Jesus. But no one can be put to death without permission from Pilate. And Pilate's already said Jesus is innocent. In the end, he'll be sent back to Pilate, even if Herod does approve of the high priest's decision. Where's Peter? He stands away from the crowd to see what happens. But isn't he in danger? I I thought we were all in danger at first, but I've moved about without being questioned. It's only Jesus they're interested in. Why then has not Peter come? Mary... Peter's very ashamed. He reproaches himself. He... Why should Peter be ashamed to see me? Mary, at the supper last night, Peter was telling Jesus how he would gladly die for him. And Jesus told Peter he would deny him three times before the cock crows. And did he? Yes. Herod sent him back. Listen. In triumph. The people are claiming. Well, I'll go see what's happening. You women better stay here. Oh, John, hurry back to us. What's keeping him? Why is everything so still? A little while ago, everyone was shouting. I couldn't hear the words. It was a man's name, it seemed. But it was not Jesus. John. Mary. Did Pilate... Pilate has washed his hands of Jesus. And my son is to die. He blew hot and cold. He had Jesus scourged and thought that would satisfy them. But it didn't. Then he gave them a choice of Jesus or a murderer named Barabbas. That's the name they shouted. They chose the murder to be released. And what of Jesus? Crucify him, they shouted. And Pilate washed his hands. They're lifting the cross on him. I shall go to him. Oh, no. Peter begs you not to look upon him as he is. Please stay here, Mary. It will only add to his pain to see you. Now I, I must return. Mary. <laughs> Do not weep for me, child, for I am his mother. You will go to him now. Let me by. Please, let me by. Mary. Mary, you shouldn't have come. Unless God strike me dead, I will go to my son. She knelt in the dust in his path and uplifted her arms to him. And he saw her. And his lips moved as if trying to form a word. But his mouth was filled with dust, and it choked him. But Mary knew, and all the women in the crowd knew, the word Jesus tried to say. And many of them whispered it to themselves, so it seemed that he said the word with many voices. And they wept. Now, because the Sabbath was soon to begin, the soldiers pushed Jesus on. And when he had passed, a woman came from the crowd and reached down and helped Mary to her feet. You are his mother. Yes. My son is with him. And many say your son is the Messiah. And if that is so, you're the mother of the Messiah. 
What do you want of me? Ask Jesus to forgive my son. Who is your son? He walks behind Jesus. He carries the second cross. His name is Dismas. Now the procession halted a few steps beyond, and the soldiers were gathered about Jesus. And some of them were saying he would die before he reached Golgotha from the weight of the cross. The high priests did not want this to happen, and they argued that someone should be pressed into service to help him. Looking about, they saw a stout fellow, and they said to him, Come here and help this man carry his cross. Presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Fibber McGee and Molly in Mama Loves Papa. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Certain elements just naturally belong together. April and showers, corned beef and cabbage, Fibber McGee and Molly. For several years, the irresistible Mr. McGee and the immovable Molly have been helping make this a more cheerful world. And their weekly broadcast has become a national habit. Tonight, for the first time, they assume the mantle and buskin of the actor in legitimate drama. More or less legitimate. And star for us in the play... Mama Loves Papa. The combination of Fibber McGee and Molly and the Lux Radio Theater is a brand new one, but as natural as the team of Lux Toilet Soap and a lovely lady. Fibber, Mc... Fibber and Molly are standard entertainment wherever there's a radio in a living room. Lux Toilet Soap is a standard wherever women are interested in how they look, and that, well, covers a lot of ground. The chief problem we faced in arranging this production was persuading Fibber that he was an actor, after a long argument in my office, I finally had to threaten to play the part myself. For the public's sake, he gave in. And after a week's rehearsal, I, I can really salute Fibber and Molly as two great troopers who deserve the stars on their dressing room doors. There's something genuinely American about their humor, something in the grand old tradition of Mark Twain and all those who, who taught us how to laugh at ourselves. Mama Loves Papa takes Fibber and Molly into new territory, when Fibber, as Wilbur Todd, quite accidentally, gets involved in politics. As Mrs. Todd, Molly is still his chief counselor and does her part to get him out of trouble after she's gotten him in. Our part at the moment is to see that the curtain goes up right away on the first act of Mama Loves Papa, starring Fibber McGee as Wilbur Todd and Molly as Jesse Todd. If the locale of our story didn't have to have a name, we'd call it Average City, USA. If our characters didn't have to be called something distinctive, we'd refer to them as Mr. and Mrs. Everybody. As it is, our story takes place in Glenville, and our people are the Todds. 
Like most of us, they're an average, everyday, perfectly normal and happy family. Also like most of us, they have ham and eggs for breakfast, slightly burned toast, and a mild domestic spat. They've reached the last cost, the spat. All right, all right. Now what's the trouble? I didn't say anything was the trouble. Did I say anything? Well, then why give me that black look? I'm just passing it on, Mama. This toast has been giving me a black look. See? Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with that toast, Wilbur. Just a little burnt on the edges. That's good for you. It's, yeah, why, that's charcoal. I don't like charcoal, even with butter on it. Besides, Mama, it worries me. I know where to go to get cinders out of my eye, but when I get them in my now, throat... Now, now, you listen here, Wilbur. I've told you time and time again we need a new toaster. If you hadn't been so selfish and given up smoking, we'd have enough coupons by now to get a really decent one. <laughs> All right, Mama, all right. I can't get you off to work every morning and straighten your suspenders and shave the back of your neck and find your other sleeve garter and watch the toaster all at the same time, Wilbur. (laughs) But, Mama, I didn't... What we need is a maid. Wilbur, stop scraping that toast whilst I'm speaking to you. Oh, oh, excuse me, Mama. What were you saying? I said what we need is a maid. And we could have one, too, if you just had a little more gumption. How's gumption going to get a maid? You know what I'm talking about. They don't appreciate you down at that office. You know they don't. Uh Uh-huh. You're worth twice the money you're getting now. Uh-huh. More than twice the money. And if I were you, I'd certainly ask for it. Uh-huh. How long have you been working for Mr. Kirkwood? Uh-huh. Uh, oh! oh. Uh, ten years. Ten years. Mm-hmm. And not one raise in all that time. Not one raise. Who does he think you are? I got a bonus once. You know what's the trouble with you, Wilbur? You're afraid of yourself. You haven't got any confidence in your own ability. Your thoughts are all... All focused inside of you. You're always as scared of what people are thinking. You're a, you're a, a invertert, Wilbur. <laughs> introvert. Hmm? You mean introvert. How do you know? I read the same magazine article. <laughs> well, anyway, that's what you are. What you've got to do is show off a little. Crack jokes with people. Act big. Then they think you are somebody. Like that Mr. Phillips next door. He's no invertert. Introvert. Well, he isn't. Well, besides, I don't know any jokes. Well, you could make some up, couldn't you? I don't know, maybe. You, hey, you really think that would help, huh? Well, it certainly couldn't do any harm. Oh, Wilbur, I don't mean to be always picking on you, but we're just not getting anywhere. You see that, don't you? We're right where we were the day we got married. I hate to think of where we might be ten years from now. It's only for your own good, Wilbur. You're right, Mama, but, but don't worry. Things will be okay, and I'll... Well, I'll crack jokes with the best of them. You wait and see. Oh, it's not just cracking jokes. Well, you said it would help. Oh, Wilbur. Oh, gosh. There's the 810. I've got to run. Finish your coffee. No time, Mama. Where's your hat? I got it. So long, Mama. Be back on the 6-5. Aren't you going to kiss me? Oh, sure. Goodbye. Be a good girl and don't take any wooden nickels. (laughs) Don't you get it, Mama? Ain't funny, Wilbur. Oh, well. (laughs) I do better on Tuesdays. Now, let's see, Miss Baedeker. Where were we in that letter? And you may expect this order as soon as possible. That's right. Now, take this. Uh, let me see, uh... Mr. Todd, I wish you'd hurry. I gotta take eight letters for Mr. Johnson yet. Oh, name's familiar. But don't rush me, Miss Baedeker. Oh, here it is. Oh, uh, uh, the, uh... The shipment will include the additional furniture for the sanctuary. Yours very truly, Kirkwood Furniture Company, per Wilbur Todd. That'll be all, Miss Baedeker. And that last sentence is that word sanctuary? Yeah, sanctuary. Sanctuary much. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> hey, hey, Todd. <laughs> yes, Mr. Burke, what is it? <laughs> the boss wants to see you. Better get in there. Oh, sure. Hey, Burke, a rather amusing thing just happened here. I was dictating... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, see me later, will you? And don't forget about Mr. Kirkwood. Oh, oh sure, sure. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Kirkwood. Come in, Todd. What took you so long? Well, I was just... In... Todd, I want to speak to you about that Chicago consignment. We're way behind in our shipments. And if we don't put our shoulders to the wheel, we'll lose the whole order. Now, I want you to bear down on the factory. Make them jump, here. Jump? Yes, sir. I want action, and lots of action. Oh, you'll get it, Mr. Kirkwood. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, pardon me, Mr. Kirkwood, but a rather amusing thing happened this morning. Huh? Yeah. I says a rather amusing little thing happened this morning. <laughs> Miss Baedeker said to me, uh, I was dictating, you know, and she said to me, uh, uh, Mr. Todd, was that last word sanctuary? <laughs> and I said, yes, sanctuary much. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, that was, uh, sort of a, a joke, you know, uh, comical. Todd, are you crazy? Huh? I'm just through talking myself hoarse to you, and you stand there and tell me jokes. But, Mr. Kirkwood, I That's don't... the whole trouble with business today. Everybody thinks it's funny. But, Mr. You don't see me laughing, do you? I'll say so. Well, remember I'm... that. And if you can't remember it, let me remind you that there are always ten men waiting to take over your desk. Now, get out! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ooh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Todd, I was just thinking over what you said. Sanctuary much. That's very funny, Mr. Todd. It is, huh? <laughs> it means like saying thank you very much, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, I-, I didn't get it before. Hmm. Oh, I-, I almost forgot your wife's on the phone, Mr. Todd. Oh, thanks. Hello, Mama. Hello, Wilbur. How's everything going, dearie? Oh, fine, fine. Just dandy. I just wanted to remind you that I'm going to the ladies' club meeting this afternoon. Oh, you want me to pick up the hamburger on my way home? Uh, will you, Papa? We're going to have a pretty important speaker today. Dr. Basil Payne on marriage with her bound. I wouldn't want to miss that. Oh, no, no. Of course not. <laughs> well, you run along and have a good time, Mama. All right. Goodbye, dearie. Goodbye. Marriage with her bound. Hmm. I'd like to hear that one myself. And so, in conclusion, let me leave one thought with you ladies. That behind every man's success in this world, there is a woman who was behind Napoleon. By Josephine, of course. <laughs> and who was behind George Washington? Martha. <laughs> and who was behind King Solomon? King Solomon had a great deal behind him. (laughs) Oh, but seriously, though, in every man's heart, ladies, is the seed of success, waiting, waiting in the darkness for the sunshine of a woman's encouragement to make it flower. Thank you. Now, uh, are there any questions, ladies? Well, uh, Dr. Payne... Yes, madam? What I want to know is... Well, how exactly can I shine on my husband? (laughs) Well, may I see you after the meeting, madam? Now, uh, are there any more general questions? That's the way it is, Dr. Mm Payne. I want to help Wilbur, but I just don't know how to go about it. I thought maybe you could suggest something. Uh, Well, Mrs. Todd, uh, just what seems to be the trouble with your husband? Well, now I'll tell you. In the first place... Uh, Just a moment. I haven't any too much time. Uh, My train, you know. Oh, well... Mrs. uh... Todd, uh, have you ever thought of the value of uh, clothes? Clothes? As an expression of personality. Oh. As an advertisement, so to speak. Oh, yes. To tell the world exactly what we are or what we would like to be. Uh, Does your husband dress well? Uh, No, just warm. I thought so. (laughs) Uh, He looks like an unsuccessful man, and so he is an unsuccessful man. He tells the world beforehand that no one is to take him too seriously, that his opinion on any matter of importance is not worth knowing. Oh, you mean if Wilbur would dress up a little, he'd get along, huh? But of course, my dear lady. There's something about clothes, the right kind of clothes, that keeps a man on his toes, spiritually alert, as it were. You try it. Make him dress well, look important, and then watch him take his place in the world. Dr. Payne, I think you've got it. Mama, I won't do it I won't wear a high hat for anybody No, sir Now, now, Wilbur, I don't want any nonsense You try that hat on again and see how it looks But but a high silk hat, Mama What will people think of me? How can I face my friends in a high silk hat? You haven't got any friends Well, I can hope, can't I? Oh, gosh, Mama, listen. Uh, Have you decided, sir, uh, what hat will it be, please? Uh, This one here, the silk one. No, sir, I won't wear it. Wrap it up, please. Yes, madam. Mama, will you listen a minute? Keep quiet. Uh, Anything else, sir? No. Oh, yes, there is. He wants uh, what goes with it, you know, with the high silk hat. Oh, yes, yes, of course. The morning coat. Yes, the morning coat. And striped pants and a pair of spats. For me? And I want everything to be an expression of his personality, sir. I'll try, madam. Uh, 
Emile, here. Mama, you're making a terrible mistake. This is a waste of money. Uh, measure the gentleman for a morning coat and trousers, Emile. Uh, we oui, miss here. Uh, Mama, will you just be reasonable? Stand still, Wilbur. When am I going to wear this? I haven't been to a wedding in ten years. You're not going to a wedding. Well, what started this anyway? I. Uh, <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> he tickles. <laughs> oh, cut it out, bud. Cut it out. <laughs> Now, listen, Mama. Now, sir, <laughs> if you'll just step over this way, we'll see if we can catch them. Mama, Mama, please don't let them do this to me. Wilbur, it's no use. If you had heard Dr. Payne yesterday, you'd realize what it means to be well-dressed. You've got to advertise yourself, Wilbur. Oh, Dr. Payne. So I've got him to thank for this, huh? Dr. Payne is a very successful man. Well, what of it? I'll bet he wasn't all dressed up in a high hat and spats, was he? No, he wasn't. Well, there you are. But he probably is dressed up when he goes to business. Yeah, when he goes to... Mama. Mama, you, you don't mean that you expect me... You can't mean in the office? That high hat? Oh, no, Mama. No! Oh, now, someday, Wilbur, you'll thank me for this. Oh, Mama. <laughs> Gwenny, Gwenny, did you see Mr. Todd this morning? Yeah, I saw him come in. He had on a silk hat. Yeah, and spats and stuff. Gee, he looked awful pale, didn't he? Yeah, it's too bad, all right. I sure feel sorry for him. Good morning, Todd. Oh, hello, Burke. I'm awfully sorry, Todd. Was it anyone close? Huh? Well... Uh, when's the funeral? Today? Oh, oh, the, oh, the funeral. <laughs> yes, the uh, funeral. Oh, we, well, we couldn't help but notice, Todd, the clothes and all. Oh, y- yes, yes, of course. Yeah. And the whole force wants me to express their regrets. And, well, now, if there's anything we can do, uh, don't hesitate, will you? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Good morning, Miss Baedeker. Good morning, Mr. Kirkwood. Good morning, Burke. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Todd. To- oh. oh, I'm sorry, Todd. Uh, immediate family. Well, uh, good morning, Mr. Kirkwood. No, not very immediate. Uh, Mrs. Todd's uncle. Oh, no, that's too bad. That's too bad. Well, now listen, you needn't hang around, Todd. You, you, you just take the day off. Oh, but Mr. Kirkwood, that won't be necessary. Huh? Oh, well, uh, I mean, uh, the noon hour will be sufficient. Nonsense, nonsense. You ought to be home consoling Mrs. Todd. Now go on, run along. Run along, Todd. Oh, but Mr. Kirkwood... Now you do as I say. Well, all right. Thank you. Not at all. And, oh, Todd. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, Todd. State of how do you do? Get all dressed up to go to work, and they think I'm going to a funeral. Got to walk in the park all day because I'm all dressed up. No place to go. Got to go walking in the park. Hmm. Mama, Mama, Mama! Look at the funny man! Look at the funny man's clothes! <laughs> oh, cut it out, sis! Hush, dear. You mustn't laugh at him, dear. He's earning his living. How does he earn his living, Mama? Why, his chest lights up with a sign, dear. That's a lie. My chest does not light up, madam. Mama, he's mad. Come, dear. Don't pay any attention to him. I think he's crazy. Chest lights up with a sign. Hmm. Mama, he's mad. Well, who wouldn't be mad? Walking around in a park all dressed up like you're going to... What's the matter with the royal parade? I'll tell you what's the matter with the royal parade, gentlemen. It's the idle rich, that's what. The idle rich who walk around in high hats and spats and long tail coat. Oh, well, look who's coming. Now, get a load of that, gentlemen. Hey, you. You talking to me? Certainly I'm talking to you. Come here, buddy. Are you awakened, man, buddy? Are you waking today, buddy? Oh, well, uh, n- n- no, not today. Not today, he says. <laughs> not today, huh? What day, then, buddy? Well, I just was... No day, that's what day. Take a good look at him, folks. The idle rich, bloated with food, reeking with champagne. Now, listen, I never bloated with Who champagne. Who do you think you are, buddy, walking around here, flaunting your wealth in our face? I'm not flaunting my... Get back to your limousine. 
This here park is for the common people, not for the elite. Now you wait a minute, my fine feathered friend. You can't talk to me like Folks, that. Are we gonna stand for this? Get him out of here. He's a blood on the landscape. No. You better beat it, mister. What for? I haven't done anything. I got my Come rights. On, folks, give him the wings. Oh, cut it out now. Cut it out. Let me alone. Hey, After him, folks, here. get the idle witch. Give him the wings. Are we gonna stand for this sort of thing? Give it to I think now I got a pack of hoodlums after me. Police! Police! Help! Help! Police! Right over here, sir. Right over here. Oh, officer, I'm certainly glad to see you. Uh, I need your help, officer. Yes, sir, Commissioner. Yes, sir. I know all about it, and I'll get you there right away, Commissioner. Commissioner? Who's a commissioner? Just get right on the motorcycle, Commissioner. Now, wait a minute, officer. But I they're don't... waiting for you, sir. The car went out a half an hour ago. Be on the lookout for the commissioner of parks. He's late. Get on the handlebars, Commissioner. <clears throat> now, wait. This has gone far enough, officer. Commissioner, do you want me to lose my job? Now, please, please get on the motorcycle. But where are you taking me? To the dedication exercises of the new playground. That's where you want to go, isn't it? What new playground? I don't know anything about a new playground. Well, you're supposed to be there, sir. They've been waiting for you. They can't dedicate the playground without the commissioner of parks, you know. Listen, I am not the commissioner. Hang on, Commissioner. Take it easy. Take it easy. Don't worry, Commissioner. I'll have you there in no time at all. And this new playground, ladies and gentlemen, this monument to the youth of our city will stand as a great reminder that the growing boys and girls of today are the future voters of tomorrow. We must remember that this playground is a... Mrs. McIntosh, are you sure the commissioner was notified to be here? Well, of course he was. My husband telephoned him this morning to remind him. Well, is he always this late? Well, how should I know? I've never seen him in my life. Nobody has. But it was your husband had him appointed, wasn't it? Now, just a minute, Mr. Thomas. It was my husband that had you appointed, too. And if you have any complaints, make them to him and not to me. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. McIntosh. Hey, Thomas, he's here. The commissioner. Well, get him up here. Well, here he is, Mr. Thomas. Now, listen, officer. Sir, this is a terrible mistake. Oh, Commissioner, you're, you're, you're late. Have you got your speech ready? Speech? What speech? Well, then you'll have to make it up as you go along. Ladies and gentlemen, he has just arrived. The Commissioner of Park. <laughs> go ahead, Commissioner. <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. Well, all right then. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, listen, I'm not going to make a speech in this rain, mister. Everybody's leaving anyway. All right, forget it. Uh, just a minute, Commissioner. Can we get just one picture, please? Look this way, Commissioner. I wish somebody would listen to me. I'm not the Commissioner. Oh, Mrs. McIntosh, will you get in this, please? Oh, of course. Right here? That's it. Get in the swing there. Oh, Commissioner, you give Mrs. McIntosh a push, Commissioner. But I'm not the... There we are. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Now, wait, wait. My name is Todd. I'm Wilbur Todd. Is that one D or two, sir? <laughs> Todd. T-O-D-D. That's my name. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Todd. We'll get the name right. Don't worry. Don't so long, worry. Commissioner. Oh. And thanks. Oh. Just a second. What did you say your name was? Todd? Todd. With two Ds. Then you're not Mr. Roberts, the park commissioner? Todd, lady. With two Ds. Well, if you're not the commissioner, what are you doing here? Well, that's what I'd like to know. I'm going home. And I just dare anybody to stop me. I just dare them, that's all. Good afternoon, Todd. Oh, oh, why, Mr. Kirkwood. Yes, very strange I should happen to be at this dedication, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. I mean... And uh, it's also very strange that you should be here, Todd. Oh, Mr. Kirkwood, I, I can explain it. I can explain everything. I'm sure you can. For shame, Todd. Why, Mr. Kirkwood... If Kirk you wanted a day off, why didn't you ask me? but to use the death of a dear relation as an excuse to... Oh, for shame. But my dear relation didn't die, Mr. Kirkwood. Then you lied. Yes, sir. Or no, sir. If there's one thing I can't abide, it's a fibber. Todd, you're fired! Oh, sure. In just a moment, Fibba McGee and Molly will return in Act Two of Mama Loves Papa. Do you remember a game you played when you were a child? Musical chairs, I think it's called. There's one less chair than there are children, so each time the music stops, one child is left out. Remember? Go on, keep on marching, Bobby. No, no, no baby stop until the music really stops. No, no, Tommy, dear, get out. You mustn't sit down till it stops. That's it. Don't hold on. Now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why, Bobby's one. Never mind, Tommy. Tommy, come here. 
there now, don't cry. You know, it's Bobby's birthday, and don't you think on his birthday it's nice for him to win? Gee, yes, Mrs. Dean. I am glad he won, because he's your little boy. And you're awful nice. Gee, I like you, Mrs. Dean. You're so pretty, and and you smell so nice. <laughs> Why, Tommy. Mrs. Dean is amused at Tommy's little boy compliment, but she's pleased, too, because she's clever enough to know there's nothing makes a woman more attractive than that sort of immaculate freshness that women call daintiness. Men just know a woman is nice to be near. They're likely to tell her she's sweet. And clever women like Mrs. Dean do everything they can to protect this charm always. Thousands of them are taking the screen star's tip and using Lux toilet soap as a bath soap, too. They find a daily bath with luxurious, active lather, a delightful way to make daintiness sure. If you're not now enjoying the luxury of a daily Lux toilet soap beauty bath, get three cakes of this fragrant gentle soap and try it, won't you? You'll love the way Lux toilet soap's rich, creamy lather caresses your skin, swiftly carries away every trace of dust and dirt. You'll like the delicate clinging perfume it leaves on your skin. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Mama Loves Papa, starring Fibba McGee as Wilbur Todd and Molly as Jesse Todd. Bright and early the following morning, the newspapers appear on the streets of Glenville. On page one, under the title, Upsy Daisy, is a photograph of one Wilbur Todd, attired in silk hat and spats, engaged in pushing a swing. On the swing is pictured Mrs. Franklin Avery McIntosh. The photograph and the story make very interesting reading, especially for Mr. McIntosh. Upsy Daisy. Park Commissioner Wilbur Todd makes merry with Mrs. Franklin Avery McIntosh at opening of new playground. Mr. Wilbur Todd, unknown before yesterday afternoon, popped up suddenly as our new Commissioner of Public Parks. Who is this rabbit anyway? I never saw him before. Now, don't get all excited. His name is Todd. Yes, yes, I can see that, but who is he? Who is he? Where was Roberts? Your very obedient Commissioner Roberts, darling, never showed up. No, he didn't show up, huh? No word, no excuse. And suddenly... There was Todd. Just popped out of nowhere to give you a push in the swing, huh? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I hope you're not going to be jealous of a simpleton like that. Jealous? Now, listen, Gladys, there's more than jealousy involved here. Don't you realize what this story does? No, I don't. All right, then let me explain. Do you know those pretty gowns and fur coats that you're so fond of? Do you know how I get them, my sweet? I sell furniture and playground equipment to our fair city. And the only reason I can sell to our fair city is that I have enough influence at the city hall to appoint my own commissioners. Oh, shut up! Shut up, shut up. That's all Talk you can say, shut up. Talk to me as if I was a child. Well, maybe you are. If you're such a wizard at politics, why don't you appoint a commissioner with brains? Because I don't want anybody with brains. Brains are a drug on the market. What I want is a moron. Well, you've certainly got one in Roberts. Oh, Roberts. Roberts is through. I couldn't keep him in the job now if I wanted to. Not after this mess. Well, then, appoint a new sure, one. Sure, sure, appoint a new one. Just like that. Well, the newspapers have done that for me. Wilbur Todd, our new commissioner of public parks. Wilbur Todd makes merry with Mrs. Franklin, Avery... Hey, hey, wait a minute. Gladys, this, uh, this Todd person, what was he like? I told you, he looks like a, a radio comedian. A dyed-in-the-wool dope. Yes, 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 but what does he do? Well, from what I could understand from the guy who was bawling him out, he's now unemployed. Oh, he is, huh? Well, well. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Reed. Get me the city hall. Upsy Daisy. Commissioner Wilbur Todd makes merry with Mrs. Franklin Avery McIntosh at opening. Oh, Mama, stop it, will you? You've read that thing 20 times. And I'm still trying to understand it. And I'm still trying to understand why you're not going to work this morning. I, I told you, Mama. I I was fired. Why? Look, Mama. It all started yesterday morning when I. Well, when I left the office to go to the funeral. Whose funeral? Well, your uncle's funeral. My uncle's funeral? That man never had a sick day in his life, and yesterday you went to his funeral. But I didn't go. Well, how could you if he isn't dead? Oh, Mama, let's start all over again. You got me all dressed up yesterday morning. Not to go to a funeral. That's what you think. I never mentioned my uncle. Not a word. Did I tell you my uncle was dead? Did I? 
No, Mama. Well, heavenly days, who did tell you? <laughs> the boss. The boss. The boss told you that my uncle was dead. Oh, Mama, skip it, skip it. Nobody died. I didn't go to a funeral. I went in and out in the park to take a walk. Now we're getting someplace. Go on. <laughs> and the next thing you know, that woman said my chest lit up. Ah, chest lit up. Mm-hmm. Go on, Wilbur. Well... Then there was that other fellow I had to run away from because he told everybody I was loaded with food and reeking with champagne. Ah, champagne, mm hmm And when the cop put me on the handlebars, well, I didn't know what to say. Mm-hmm. Wilbur, it's all very plain. Well, that's good. I got you all dressed up yesterday to try to make a success out of you, and you went out and got drunk. <laughs> Mama, I didn't get drunk. I didn't. Oh, it's no use, Wilbur. I can smell it on you right now. Mama, how can I prove it to you? Tell me how, Mama. I'm sorry, Wilbur, but you're a great disappointment to me. There's the door. I'll answer it, no, Mama. No, don't try to get up. I'll do it myself. Huh? You'd probably fall flat on your face. <laughs> what is it, please? Good morning. Mr. Todd here. Yes, he is. Who wants him? Well, we're from the city hall. The city hall? Come right in, gentlemen. Wilbur! Wilbur, the city hall is here. Now, there you are, Mama. There. I guess this will prove it to you. They want me for impersonating a commissioner. Mr. Todd? All right, bud. I'll go quietly. Oh, Wilbur. Just a moment, Mr. Todd. I have a little paper here. Ah, yes. Know all men by these presents. Now, that, that won't be necessary. Just don't put the cuffs on me, that's all. <laughs> oh, Wilbur. One moment, please. By these presents, that by the power invested in me with the people of Glenville, I do hereby decree, as of this state written, that Wilbur Todd be appointed Commissioner of Public Parks. By these presents, that by the power invested in me with the people of Glenville, I do hereby decree, as of this state written, that Wilbur Todd be appointed Commissioner of Public Parks. Commissioner of... Mama! No, of Public Parks. Oh, Wilbur, a public man. Congratulations, Mr. Todd. Mama, what you said about me falling on my... Uh, Yes, Wilbur. It looks like you were right. Ah. Step right in the office, Mr. Todd. Boys, boys. I want you to meet our new commissioner. Commissioner Todd, the boys. Hi, boys. Uh, How do you do? How do you do? Have a cigar, Commissioner. Well, thanks, but I don't... Oh, uh... go on. Take two. (laughs) And here's our good friend Frank McIntosh, the man that you and the city have to thank for your appointment. How are you, Commissioner? Uh, Hi, bud. I hope I'll be able to justify the faith you've placed in me. (laughs) Why, of course you will. Well, boys, suppose we run along. Oh, oh, wait. Uh, Don't let me uh, put you out of your office. My office? (laughs) Commissioner, this is your office. It is? Gee... Leather chairs and everything. Well, say, I... Well, look, uh, anytime any of you fellas want to use a phone, uh, just come in here. Uh, I, I seem to have three of them. <laughs> so long, Commissioner. <laughs> well, Todd, how are you going to like public life? Well, I... I don't know what to say about all this. I, I never been a big shot before. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. Oh, have a cigar? Well, thanks, but I... Oh, I, go I... ahead, go ahead. Well, Todd, if you're the smart man I think you are, you'll go far down here. Now, see to that. You know, you look like a man interested in little kiddies. Oh, yes, yes, I am. I'm very fond of kiddies. They're so, so full of uh, youth, I guess. (laughs) Well, I'm fond of them myself. Like to see them get lots of fresh air, lots of play. You know, build young America. Yes, indeed. You see, I manufacture playground equipment. Oh, is that so? Yes, been filling the city's orders for years. Oh, by the way, did you know Roberts? Roberts? Yes, he had this job before you, but he bought equipment from another company. He got it cheaper, but the stuff's no good. Now, my price is high, but so is my quality. You understand? Oh, high quality. Sure, sure. I understand, Mr. McIntosh. Oh, oh, call me Frank. (laughs) Okay, Frank. Uh, My name's Wilbur. Uh, Call me Todd. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, Todd, any time I can be of any help to you, just call on me. Oh, by the way. Here's a little paper you might sign. An order for some new equipment. Nothing important, just a few thousand dollars. Oh, a few thousand, eh? Mm-hmm. Oh, sounds reasonable. I'll look it over. You'll look it o- Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Well, so long, Todd. So long, Frank. I don't know how to thank you for all this. Thank Mrs. McIntosh. She's the one. Mrs. McIntosh? Yes, she says you sure push a mean swing. <laughs> oh, gosh. Say that. That was funny, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh, by the way, are you married, Todd? Yes, sir, I certainly am. To the sweetest little woman in the world. Fine. Well, why don't you two come over to my place this weekend? We've got some people coming, the right people. You know, nothing like meeting the right people. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Good, we'll look for you. Well, so long, Todd. So long, Frank. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, yes? Uh, have a cigar. Hello? Hello, is this you, Mama? Listen, Mama, I don't think I'll be able to get home for dinner tonight. Do you mind? I gotta see the boys about something. I'm awfully sorry, Mama. Hello? Is this you, Mama? Well, this is Wilbur. Won't be able to make it for dinner tonight, Mom. I gotta see the mayor. Pretty important. Don't wait up. Hello? Oh, yes, I know. You've got to see the governor this time, I suppose. Oh, all right, Wilbur. No, I'm not mad. I'm just... All right, Wilbur. Goodbye. There you are, Mama. The West Side Playground. And it's all mine. I always had an idea it belonged to the city. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Me being the commissioner and all, it's, it's like a dream, isn't it? Well, it has its points. It's nice you being a public official and all, and plenty of money for a change. You mean plenty of money instead of change. <laughs> How am I doing, Mama? Uh, you're improving, Wilbur, slow but sure. Well, all right, son, all right. We'll send you home and have it fixed. It hurts. It hurts. Hey, something must have happened. Oh, uh, that little lad has a cut knee. Now, 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 go ahead, Johnny. Uh, you take him home, will you? Oh, attendant, attendant. Oh, good morning, Commissioner. Something happened to that kid? Oh, yes, sir. A seesaw broke and cut his leg open. Oh, say, that's bad. Does that kind of thing happen often? Well, not here, but uh, over in East Park last month, there were four accidents. One pretty serious. It's faulty material, Commissioner. Oh, no, 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 that's impossible. <laughs> Why, his stuff has quality. He said so himself. Well, it might have had quality once, sir, but it's getting awful old. Well, uh, good morning, sir. Mama, did you hear that? I thought you told me there was new equipment being bought all the time. Mm, there is. Must be a mistake someplace. You know, when we go over to McIntosh's party, I think I'll ask him about this. Don't look now, darling, but the McIntoshes are inviting the most peculiar people. Who is she? Oh, you mean the one in the uh, dress? Well, if you can call it that. Well, don't laugh, but that's the park commissioner's wife. No. Careful. Excuse me, but uh, have you seen my husband? No, I I'm afraid I haven't. Come on, Janice. Mm. Nice, friendly people around here. Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. Yes? I'm looking for my husband. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm not hiding him. <laughs> isn't it wonderful how men can hide away and talk business all night? Yes, isn't it? Of course, I guess my husband's pretty busy with Mr. McIntosh. My husband's a public official. Hmm, how interesting. What does your husband do? Oh, he's still governor of the state. Oh. Good night. Uh, good night. Gladys. Gladys. Well? Come over here. Listen, I'm having trouble with that Todd person. Again? Yes, he's been asking a lot of fool questions about the equipment we delivered months ago, and I don't like it. And he's got an order in his pocket he's been carrying around ever since I had him appointed. I want that order signed, tonight. Well, what's the big rush? Oh, darling, do as I say. Get him to sign that thing and I'll have him where I want him. He won't be able to open his mouth then. Well, what am I, a magician? How can I make him sign anything? Oh, Gladys, please, for the sake of that, that, that new bracelet you've been asking for. Oh, all right. Well, thank heaven. Oh, there he is. Go ahead and good luck to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Todd. Mr. Todd. Good evening, Mrs. McIntosh. <laughs> All alone, Mr. Todd? No, I'm just looking for Mama. I mean, my wife. Oh, I'm sure she's all right. Uh, come and have some champagne. Champagne? Oh, I, I don't usually indulge oh, in... Oh, but you will with me, won't you? <laughs> well, I... Oh, I guess. <laughs> well... <laughs> come on, Mr. Todd. We'll find a nice, quiet spot all by ourselves. Anybody seen my husband? I'm looking for Commissioner Todd. Have you seen my husband? Has anybody seen my husband? <laughs> Go on, Mr. Todd. Have some more. <laughs> no. no more, no more. Oh, it's awful good. <laughs> it certainly is. 
Well, no more. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, what about that paper thing? You know. Paper thing? Oh, you know. The thing you were going to sign. <laughs> oh, the thing I was... Oh, let's talk some more about that. Oh, no, no. No more talk. <laughs> no more talk, Mrs. McIntosh? Oh, call me Gladys. <laughs> Call me Todd. <laughs> Todd! What? <laughs> oh, that's a cute name. Yeah. Yeah, hey, I'm getting sleepy. How do you spell it? <laughs> sleepy? No, Todd. How do you spell it? <laughs> oh. T O double. <laughs> well, uh, write it down and let me see. No pen. Well, I got one. Here. No paper. Oh. Uh, maybe you got some in your pocket. Pocket? Oh, yeah. Uh, what's that? Paper. Now, right. Spell out your name and let me see. Huh? Where? Uh, right there. Down there. Won a medal for penmanship once. No. Sure. Palmer Method. Oh. Watch this. I got curly cues on the ends. <laughs> W I L B U R Curly Q. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Go on. <laughs> Capital T O D D Curly Q. How's that? Oh, Todd, it's beautiful. Can I keep it? I'm sure. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm sleepy. <laughs> I could go to sleep, right? I could go to sleep. <laughs> Oh. Excuse me, I didn't... Oh. Oh, uh, come in, Mrs. Todd. I'm afraid your husband is rather tired. Yes, he certainly looks it. He's a charming man. You ought to take better care of him. Oh, Mama. Oh, Mama, my head. Put this ice bag on. Oh, oh, oh. What time is it? Three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock? How do we get home? We didn't hitchhike. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I could only remember what happened. Isn't it terrible, Mama? I can't remember. No, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. What do you mean by that? It's not your fault, Wilbur. It's mine. I just don't fit into your high sphere. What are you talking about, Mama? Ah, uh, well, Dr. Payne says that a wife has got to be a help to her husband. If she isn't that, then she isn't anything. I thought I was doing such a wonderful thing when I tried to make you over. Well, I've made you over, and I've put you out of my class. I can't help you now, Wilbur, so I'm just getting out. Oh, no. You can't. You can't do that. I won't make any fuss or scandal. I'll just leave. Oh, but, Mama... Then you can go on and be a success without me hampering you. But, Mama, I wouldn't know what to do without you hampering me, Mama. I'm sorry, Wilbur. My mind's made up, and you know me when I make up my mind. Does your head feel any better, dearie? Uh, I don't know. It'll be all right in the morning. Good night, Wilbur. Good night. In just a few moments, our stars, Fibber McGee and Molly, will return in Act Three of Mama Loves Papa. Now... Let's imagine we're looking on at a scene at Pasadena Station. Golly, I don't see her. I suppose she decided not to come. There she is, there, all in gray. Don't you see? Oh, she looks lovely. Yoo-hoo, Barbara, here we are. Come on, Marie, let's grab this taxi so we can get her home fast. Well, Barbara, here we are. This is your room. Think you'll like it all right? Think you like Hollywood? Oh, it's a darling little room. Look at the view. Real palm trees and mountains. Oh, look. That must be a screen star. <laughs> <laughs> Just because she wears slacks and dark glasses? Oh, no, Barbie. Why, there are hundreds of girls here who do that. That's probably some poor little extra like us. But don't worry. You're going to meet some screen stars very soon now. Oh, Anne, you mean really meet them? Oh, tell me who. Mm, let's surprise her, Anne. We'll tell you this much, Bob. We've been invited to have lunch with Loretta Young today. Loretta Young? Oh, oh goodness, I've got to start primping right away. Oh, here's my soap. She's got Lux soap. She's brought Lux soap? 
to Hollywood. Well, of course I have, and I'm just about to give myself an active lather facial. What's so surprising about that? I thought practically everyone in Hollywood used Lux soap. <laughs> of course, Barbie. Practically every girl in the movies here uses Lux soap. That's just the point. We've stacks of Lux soap in the bathroom. We always have. And now, Barbara, eager to look her best when she meets some of the famous screen beauty she's admired for so long, is giving herself an active lather facial with Lux toilet soap, just the way the screen stars do. Loretta Young, Barbara Stanwyck, Irene Dunn, Anne Sheridan, Claudette Colbert, and lots of others. It's easy to do and quick. And you can be sure that when Barbara arrives at Loretta Young's, her eyes all bright with excitement, her complexion will be looking its freshest and loveliest. An active lather facial is a wonderful beauty pickup at any time of day. And as a protection to the skin, a Lux toilet soap facial at bedtime is important. You know, lots of women, without realizing it, gradually spoil their own looks through careless cleansing. Lux toilet soap's active lather does a thorough job, a sure job. Get three cakes of Lux toilet soap, that's the economical way, and give your skin 30 days of regular active lather beauty care. See if you don't find Lux toilet soap care really works. Gives you wonderful help in keeping skin smooth, soft, and attractive, the way you want it to be, the way it ought to be. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. curtain rises on the third act of Mama Loves Papa. It's said that troubles never come singly, but in series of threes. Wilbur Todd has become involved with Mr. McIntosh, number one. His good wife, Jessie, is on the verge of leaving him, number two. And now to the mayor's office comes misfortune number three, in the person of the Citizens Committee. I tell you, Mr. Mayor, the graft in this city must end. We have the press behind us, the voters, and the majority of our public officials. But nothing can be done unless we attack the evil at its source. A mere handful of grasping politicians who have a stranglehold in our city's finances. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. I needn't tell you that you have my wholehearted support. But you can't expect me to take action on every city official in the hopes of punishing the few guilty ones. I must have names. Mr. Mayor, we have the names. Just look at this list. At the top stands Mr. Franklin McIntosh. And here below are the men in his pay. Men he's had appointed to influential positions in order to milk the budget down to the last dollar. Mr. Mayor, this committee demands the immediate arrest of every person on this list. Gentlemen, we'll take action at once. Mama, won't you think it over? Please, Mama, you can't walk out on me like this. What's the use of talking, Wilbur? We went all over this last night. Look, Mama, I'll give up my job as commissioner. I'll find something else. I never wanted to be a big shot anyway. You can't do that. I won't let you. I always knew you had it in you, Wilbur. It just took a little coaxing to bring it out, that's all. And someday, Wilbur, you're going to be a big man in this town. I can feel it coming now, and I'm not going to interfere. Hand me that grip, dearie. Oh, Mama, you wouldn't interfere. You could be a big woman. No, no, not me. I'd only hold you back. And I want you to get everything that's coming to you. I'll get it. Yes? Good morning. We're from the city hall. Come in, please. Thanks. Wilbur, they're from the city hall. Oh, I can't bother with that now. I'm not coming down this morning, boys. Oh, no? No. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Todd, but... Well, so am I. Just let me alone, boys. I'm in trouble. Well, he says he's in trouble, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll beat it, boys. Scram. Sure, sure. You better get the cuffs, Joe. All set. Hey, what do you mean, cuffs? What is this? Oh, it's very simple, Mr. Todd. You're under arrest. Arrest? Wilbur, what have you done? Got a Max. Hey, let me alone. Come on, Todd. Oh, oh Wilbur. Oh, Wilbur. <laughs> Listen, what is this? I haven't done anything. Of course not. Of course not. Oh, Mama, don't cry. This is a mistake, that's all. Oh, Wilbur. They can't put me in jail. They can't do it, Mama. They don't dare put me in jail. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Shut up down there. Let me out of here. You can't do this to me. I got rights. I'll have the law on you. Uh, shut up. Pipe down. Okay, Sid. Here's your man. Hello, Commissioner. Who are you? 
Sid's the name. Just call me Sid. Open up here, officer. What do you want? I come down to get you out. You're a free man, Commissioner. Oh, I am, huh? Why, sure. <laughs> you don't think Mr. McIntosh will let you stay in jail. <laughs> no, sir. I got a writ for you, see? Oh, boy. That, that's quick work. Say, when you're one of the boys, it's always quick work. Come on, Commish. Mr. McIntosh wants to see you. Oh, he does, eh? Well, that's fine, because I want to see Mr. McIntosh. <laughs> well, well, gentlemen, I see you're all here. No casualties, I hope. Area one, Mr. McIntosh. Just a little mistake, boys, that's all. The Citizens Committee got a little overambitious. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen every once in a while, but it'll all blow over. As long as we all stick together, gentlemen, they can't prove a thing. No, sir. Here's the last one, Mr. McIntosh, the commission himself. Well, come in, Todd. Come in. I'm glad to see you. I want to speak to you, Mr. McIntosh. Sure, sure. Have a cigar? I don't smoke. Listen, do you know where I was? I was just in jail. No. Well, that happens to the best of us, Todd. It happened to most of us this morning. Huh? <laughs> sure, but here we all are. Oh, have a drink? I don't drink either, and I want to know what this is all about. Now, look, Todd, you're a big boy now. There isn't really any Santa Claus, you know, except me. I've been St. Nick to the boys here for a long time. <laughs> oh, oh, I get it. Why, why, you're nothing but a bunch of crooks. Now, you take it easy, Todd. You got me this commissioner's job so you could put over some more funny deals. What are you talking about, more funny deals? Oh, I know. I may look pretty dumb, but I know how to read. You've been selling a lot of playground stuff to the city, and all they've got to show for it is bills. Well, the uh... equipment in the playgrounds is just the same. Has been the same for the last seven years. Oh. Not one piece of that new equipment was ever delivered. So what? Well, you're not going to get away with it. That's so what. I'll expose you and your friends, and they'll run you out of town. On a rail. That's what. Fine. And you'll be right there with us, Todd. You know that, I suppose. I haven't done anything. You gave me an order, Commissioner. Or don't you remember last night? Last night? I don't remember anything about last night. All right, then just take my word for it. You're all sewed up in this deal, Commissioner, and you'll string along or land in jail. And this time, I'll forget to send Sid down with a writ. All right, Mr. McIntosh. I guess you've got me where you want me. Well. So maybe I'll just have to land in that jail. What? Now, don't be a fool, Todd. Mr. McIntosh, I'm not cut out for this, and I can't argue with you. I'm just an ordinary small-timer without too much brains but I've got what you might call a conscience. Now, look. You're not you... just fooling around with politics. You're fooling around with the health and the safety of little kids. Well, you... Now, maybe I can stay out of jail all right by stringing along with you, but I'm not going to stay out of jail if it means sending some kid to the hospital. What? Now, you just go ahead and do your worst to me, because that's what I'm going to do to you. Are you home? Mama. I guess she's gone. No, I'm not, Wilbur. Oh, you're still here, huh? I've been waiting for you. I couldn't leave without... Well, while you were in jail. You got out all right, huh? Well, I'm out now, but... Something tells me it's just a temporary arrangement. <laughs> what happened, Wilbur? I gave that Mr. McIntosh a piece of my mind. I told him off all right. Him and his whole crowd... They're crooks, Mama. No. Sure. There it is in the paper. See? Oh, but why, you're here, too. Oh, yeah, I'm all over it. Wilbur, what's going to happen now? Well, first of all, I resigned. You mean you have no job? I haven't got anything. Well, I guess I was born to be a failure. You'll be better off without me, Mama. Oh, now, wait. You just sit down there and rest. What you need is a nice hot cup of coffee. But, Mama, don't you have to catch a train or something? What train? But you said Now, you... don't argue. You're just tired and hungry. I'll go see what's in the icebox. Mama. What? They're here, Mama. They've come to get me. Oh, don't worry. I'll wait for you, Wilbur. If it's 20 years. Open up here. Open up here. Open up. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye, Wilbur. Come to see me in jail, will you? Yes, Wilbur, I'll bring you some nice cigars. <laughs> I don't smoke, Mama. Mr. Todd here? Yes, he is. All right, gentlemen, give. 
Hey, say, what? Mr. Mayor! Evening, Mr. Todd. Just a little expression of appreciation from the Citizens Club of Glenville. You've done a fine job, Mr. Todd. We'll have every one of those crooks in jail by morning. But what about Wilbur? Mrs. Todd, your husband is public-spirited citizen number one. Oh! <laughs> Mama, it's a dream. Wake me up. Todd, Todd, why, you old rascal, you. Oh, Mr. Kirkwood. <laughs> Wonderful work, Todd. Wonderful. That was a brilliant idea of yours. What idea, Mr. Kirkwood? <laughs> why, getting in with those crooks just so we could expose them. A regular undercover man, eh, Todd? <laughs> Undercover, man. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. And listen, Todd, if you're not going to be too busy, I've got a job waiting for you. The managership of the Kirkwood Furniture Company. Manager? Mama, did you hear? Oh, I always knew you'd be a big man, Wilbur. Oh, wait. Mr. Kirkwood, I don't want it. Huh? Just, just give me back my desk and my old job. That's all. Anything you say, Todd. Speech! 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 Wilbur! A speech! They want you to make a speech! What will I say? What will I say? Go ahead, Wilbur. Go ahead. My dear fellow citizens, all I gotta say is thank you very much. <laughs> Curtain falls on Mama Loves Papa. And returning to the footlights now for a curtain call are two of America's foremost actors. What are you staring at, McGee? Well, I don't want to miss seeing two of America's foremost actors. <laughs> I think he means us, McGee. Us, Mama? Yeah. Oh, oh gee. Oh, thanks, Mr. DeMille. Oh, I can't think of a word to say. <laughs> that won't last long. <laughs> <laughs> Fibber, I've seen a long line of actors in the American theater. Edwin Booth, Henry Irving, Mansfield, Southern... All the Barrymores, but you two... I think uh, you're right, Mr. DeMille. Careful, McGee. <laughs> I can't disagree with a man like Mr. DeMille. <laughs> but, Fibber, you, you didn't let me finish. Oh, now, let's not change the subject. I was just going to suggest that if you ever get in a spot to Mr. Er, uh, <laughs> C.B., <laughs> you know, Clark Gable or Spencer Tracy might break a leg on the way to the broadcast sometime, I'd only be too uh, glad McGee, to... McGee, huh? the night you're Clark Gable, can I be Myrna Loy? <laughs> Don't interrupt, Molly. Well, well, as I was saying, C.B., that if you ever need anybody to pinch hit for Gable, I'll be glad to fill in. <laughs> your generosity, Fibber, is surpassed only by your courage. Well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well, now that you're a great actor, McGee, let me be just uh, Molly McGee and... Uh... And that's being something, Molly, as millions of people can testify. Well, now, just for that, Mr. DeMille, I'll tell you a bit of news you'll be wanting to hear. No, no, Molly, no. Quiet, dearie, quiet. Why shouldn't I tell Mr. DeMille I use Lux Soap, even if I'm not Myrna Loy? <laughs> you don't have to be a movie star to use Lux Soap. And that's the truth, McGee. The less looks we have, the more important it is to keep what we've got. And it's a dandy piece of soap, that Lux is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it put better, Molly. Uh, don't forget about me helping out in place of uh, Clark Gable, C.B. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be turning his head if that's possible, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> we won't need him yet, Molly. Next Monday night, and I hope I've recovered my voice from the 300 Northwest Mounted Policemen I just left it with at the studio. <laughs> but next Monday night, we're counting on Gloria Jean, Robert Cummings, Nan Gray, C. Aubrey Smith, and Beulah Bondi. Our play is the Underpup. And you'll hear these you'll hear these stars in the same roles they played in the Universal Pictures hit. It's a heartwarming story of a little girl from what some call the wrong side of the tracks and how she straightens out the troubled lives of a good many people. She isn't really old enough to be an underdog, so, so our play is called The Underpup, with 12-year-old Gloria Jean in the same part that brought her fame on the screen. Hey, Molly, we'd better listen in and get some pointers from a play like The Underpup. Yeah. Well, good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, all. <laughs> good night, fella. You were both fabulous, and I'm not kidding. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gloria Jean, Robert Cummings, Nan Gray, C. Aubrey Smith, and Beulah Bondi in The Underpup. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from 
Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Lou Merrill as Mr. McIntosh, Celeste Rush as Mrs. McIntosh, Arthur Q. Bryan as O'Leary, Emery Parnell as Mr. Kirkwood, Linda Douglas as Miss Baedeker, Warren Ash as Dr. Payne, Hal K. Dawson as Burke, Ralph Sedan as Clerk, Abe Reynolds as Sid, Victor Rodman as Thomas, Edward Marr as Soapbox Orator, John Fee as Photographer, James Eagles as Attendant, Kay Sutton as Gwenny, Barbara Jean Wong as Little Girl, Dwayne Thompson as Mother, Wally Mayer as Policeman, and Philip Steed as Grogan. Fibber McGee and Molly appeared tonight through the courtesy of the makers of Johnson's Wax. Our play tonight was an adaptation of the Paramount picture, Mama Loves Papa. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello, this is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymore, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. The Mother's Gift. I turn the pages of the book before me. There are centuries of history recorded here. There are stories of yesterday and today. And each is the story of a mother. As the rainbow brightens the clouds, as a flower graces the days of spring, so shall the mother of pure heart display her beauty in the book of time. Let us look now at the first page. Let us read first the story of her whose memory will last unto generations. For she will be forever the inspiration of all until the end of time. Maria Gra In the west, the sun drops slowly over Mount Carmel. There were already shadows of darkness in the eastern sky, and between the majesty of the mountains, under the sky aflame with the glory of God's handiwork, lay Nazareth in Galilee. There, as the day came peacefully to a close, 
a maiden knelt in prayer, her eyes uplifted to the heavens. Suddenly the air was filled with music, and a voice spoke forth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And the maiden's heart was troubled, but the angelic voice spoke on. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. And so, while the glory of the Lord manifested itself in the majesty of the setting sun, here, within this simple dwelling, an even greater glory shone forth from his hand. Here, in this humble place, the power of the Lord dimmed forever the sun, the moon, the stars, and a thousand other beauties of his own creation. For here was a soul filled with divine grace. Thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary knew in her heart that this was the word of God. The sun dropped slowly over Mount Carmel, and the evening star appeared in the heavens. But here in Nazareth was the brightest star of all, she who would show the way to our Lord God by the light from her soul. O oh, sing to the Lord a new canticle, because he hath done wonderful things. Sing to the Lord a song of thanksgiving, for he hath given us to know the greatest mother of all time. And so I turn the pages of the book. Here are the names of many who look to Mary as the ideal to be reached. And among them is one called Helena in the third century after our Lord. I was called Helena, and because I had learned of the one true God, I knew that only through him would true peace ever come into the hearts of men. And so I prayed that my son, too, might learn to believe. That was my thought as I listened to his plans. Once my armies have crossed the Alps, the rest is easy. Nothing can stop me then. I shall rule the entire Roman Empire before many months have passed. Well, Mother, have you nothing to say? My son, I have a question to ask. Yes? What is it? Why are you so determined to become the emperor? Well, isn't that rather obvious? Certainly you know the weakened state in which Diocletian left his empire. This is an opportunity for a man with ambition to seize the reins. Then it is only ambition that leads you to battle for an empire. <laughs> what more could you want to inspire a man? You will fail, my son. Fail? You may win the battle, but you will fail as an emperor like Diocletian and the others. Have you no confidence in my strength? The strength of any ruler is only as great as his spirit is filled with justice and charity. <laughs> An emperor whose only thought is of ambition has neither of these. Justice, charity, those are Christian terms. And how I have prayed that you would come to know and love the teachings of Christ. I shall win my empire and rule it by the sword. Another mother once gave her son to be the salvation of the world. What joy would have been mine if you could have been the salvation of a people as the first Christian ruler of the Roman Empire. Hope is eternal if it is placed in the confidence of Mary's son. And so I went forth from my kingdom to the land of Galilee and Judea, and I knelt on that hallowed spot in Nazareth. Oh, Mary, you are his mother. 
Will you not guide my son to have faith in the cross? That he may bring glory to an empire in the name of Christ. The wind is bitter, even here where we're sheltered below this mountain. Defeat is bitter, too. What's happened to you, Constantine? Even your soldiers have observed how you've lost your ambition. Ambition? How can you have ambition in the face of defeats and disillusionment? But the battle isn't over. For me, it is. Surely you don't mean you'd withdraw the army now? Why should I freeze to death here in the Alps? There's no hope of our getting any further. It's impossible. Go out and give the command. Instruct each division to turn back. But your men are willing to go on. I'm they... not. I shall never be the ruler of Rome. I know it now. This is the crossroad of my life. Look! Go on, do look as I... Look at the sky! Listen! Look, look! Look at the sky! Look! There in the sky. Why, it's a cross. And there's writing. It is written in Roman letters. Yes. In this sign thou shalt conquer. It was my mother's last prayer that I could learn of the teachings of Christ to bring justice and charity to the empire. And I shall. I have come to the crossroad, but I know now which road I shall take. For now, truly, I have something worthy for which to battle. I will win with the cross in my hand. And so God gave the gift of faith to Constantine, whose mother prayed that her son might be the salvation of an empire. His reign was known forever for justice and charity toward all. Those Christian principles which his saintly mother, Queen Helena, taught him. I turn the pages again. The years roll on. I think once more of Mary, who heard the prophecy of Simeon. A sword of sorrow shall pierce your heart. But her silent answer was, Thy will be done, O Lord. Now we come to the story of another whose heart was pierced with a sword. But in following the light of Mary, she placed her hope in the Lord's goodness. That was my mother, Monica. What is there in a man that makes him so stubborn as to turn aside deliberately from the truth? For I think I knew in my heart from the very beginning that my mother was right. You go from one pursuit to another aimlessly, from one philosophy to another, and in the end you will be alone and desolate. For you will believe nothing. Oh, oh, leave me alone. I can lead my own life. Mother, I'm not a child to be tied to your apron strings. Only a child plays aimlessly with one toy after another. The novelty of each thing wears off because you had nothing of value in the first place. But her words fell on deaf ears. I thought of my mother as a woman who knew little of worldly things. And so I followed wherever pleasure beckoned. Come with us, Augustine. There are dancing girls in Chicago. Exciting races and coffees, come, Augustine. Come, Augustine, come. My life was filled with trifles. My wandering soul looked for contentment in the temporary pleasures of the world. And all the time, the voice of my mother rang in my ears. You go from one pursuit to another aimlessly. What if I do? Are you to remind me of it all my life? Augustine, Augustine. Uh, and Antonius? Augustine, you cried out. Oh, oh, I, I'm sorry, Antonius. I, I was thinking out loud, I guess. I, yes. 
Yes, I was thinking of how sick and the death I am with everything in life. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. You need a new interest. Now, why don't you study oratory here in Carthage? You know, you've got an excellent voice. Well, that's all I have got. Oh, no funds, huh? Well, that's easily remedied. Let me be your patron. Oh, no, no, indeed not. I'm certainly not going to impose on your friendship. Oh, don't be a fool, Augustine. Mark my words. You could become a great orator. Think of the power you'd have to sway people. Why, you might become a great teacher. <laughs> and I would bask in reflected glory. A great orator? Uh-huh. Yes. Or well, even my mother would be pleased with that. But I could hardly expect my mother to be pleased with what I taught. I heard you as I stood there with the crowd. Yes? And what did you think of my speech? I thought of the gifts God has given you. A voice to influence the minds of men. And a brain with which you could do great good. Or great evil. Oh, my son... How can you use those talents to lead men to doctrines of evil? Now, just because they aren't your beliefs, Mother, you think they're evil. Because I know that my beliefs are founded on truth. And yours are formed by pagans who have sought to adapt their teachings to their own evil ways. Now, if I have found happiness in teaching my ideas to others, they are the right beliefs for me. But you haven't found happiness, Augustine. And you never will until you have the courage to look into your own soul and see how blind you are. Have you no thought of tomorrow? What lies ahead of you, Augustine? Think, my son, think, before it's too late. Resolved never to see my mother again. I went from one city to another, always searching for something which I never seemed to find. Rome, the golden city of the empire. I was soon tired of its pleasures. And then Milan. There I won the most coveted award, an appointment to the chair of rhetoric. Surely I told myself, here my ability was recognized. But even this seemed to bring me little happiness. Somehow... I felt more at peace when I walked in the beautiful gardens of the famous Bishop Ambrose. And upon one occasion, the bishop himself found me there. You understand, sir, that I am not in sympathy with the beliefs of Christians. <laughs> yes, but surely, my son, that will not prevent you from enjoying the beauties of my garden. Oh, oh no, no, indeed. The truth is that I sometimes feel more at peace here than in any spot I've ever been. That's possible. To me, of course, the explanation is simple. Here, you are very close to Christ himself, in the little chapel here in the garden. Now, you don't expect me to subscribe to that, sir. Oh, no, no, no. That is merely my belief. Tell me, have you ever studied the teachings of Christ? When I was a child, I... I see. Then in that case, as a man of education, a teacher, you would certainly wish to acquaint yourself with the life and works of the one who influenced the world so greatly as part of your intellectual background. I never thought of it that way before. You read Latin and Greek? Oh, yes. Yes, in Carthage I studied both. Good. Then I shall entrust you to some of my most precious manuscripts. Oh, you're very gracious, sir. I... I shall take good care of them. You mentioned studying in Carthage. I met a most remarkable woman this morning from Carthage. And there are many remarkable women in Carthage. But not another like this one. Of that I am certain. For 17 years, she has prayed for the conversion of her son. And in all that time, she has never given up hope. Invincible faith like hers, my son, is not to be crushed. You see, she has faith in God and in her own son. And do you think there is hope of her son being converted? Yes, Augustine. I do. You call me Augustine? Yes, my son. And when your mother left me this morning, I bade her keep her faith. Surely it is not possible that the son of that mother's tears 
should perish. She had followed me to Rome and to Milan, and I had not known. She had sacrificed her home, her friends, her few cherished possessions. Why did you do it? You, you've given up everything for me. No, Augustine. I have given up nothing because you are near me. You are more important to me than anything else in the world. Mother, I... let me do something for you in return. I... Will you come to church with me, as you did when you were a child? Even though I don't accept your beliefs? You will be with me in God's house. At least I will have that. How serene life appeared on that morning when I accompanied my mother to church. Again I felt as I had in the garden of the bishop. The world seemed far away. A sort of peace came into my spirit. But I could not accept the beliefs of Christianity. There was too much to be sacrificed if one was to be a Christian. A Christian must give up too much of worldly pleasure. Pleasure? Oh, Augustine, how can a young man with a keen mind like yours think only of today? What lies ahead for you? That's what my mother said one time. Have you ever thought of the future? Christ came into this world and sacrificed his life to save you. You, Augustine. And you talk of sacrificing pleasure. Oh, my son, listen to these words and think. Mary gave us her son. He was her life and all her love. But she gave him to us that we might have life eternal. Think, Augustine. Think of life eternal when you talk of pleasure. And so I walked alone in the garden. And I thought of many things. I think I even prayed. For I know the words came to my lips. Oh, Lord God, give me to know what is in my heart. Suddenly, there on the bench beside me, I saw the scroll which the bishop had left. Something impelled me to turn it over. And there before me, I saw the words of Paul. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the light of God's grace poured into my soul. And so the heart of Monica was made whole with joy. As Mary, after her sorrow, understood the glory of the resurrection, so Monica rejoiced in the redemption of her son, Augustine. She walked in Mary's light and had confidence in the Lord. I understand, I am ready, I devote myself to serve. Those words might well have been in Mary's heart that day long ago in Nazareth. And now I see them in the pages of this book. For they were engraved also on the heart of Blanche, the queen regent of France in the 13th century. Blanche devoted her life to rearing a child who would serve his people well by understanding their problems. They say of him now that he was the greatest king of medieval France, loved by the poor and respected by his enemies. Even when he was small, his heart was filled with admiration for his queenly mother. My mother was a great lady, not because she was a queen. Anyone can be a queen, but because she was good and kind. She loved the poor people and was very fair to everyone. That was what she tried to teach me. If you are going to be a good ruler, Louis, you must remember that your kingdom has both poor people and rich people, bad people and good, so you must rule justly for all of them. And believe me, dear one, I would rather see you an honest peasant than a selfish king. So you see, I know I had to learn to be a good king if I were to make my mother happy. That's why I listen very carefully. Whenever anyone came to court to complain, I sat very quietly beside my mother and listened. The land was given to me, Your Majesty, by the late king, your husband. It is definitely mine. It was forfeited to me in payment of a gambling debt. That debt was paid in money afterward. But the land had already been forfeited. Gentlemen, well, stop this bickering. Yes, Your Majesty. Well, madam, is it necessary to have this child present while we discuss the merits of the case? He will be your king when he comes of age. 
It is not too early for him to learn to know his subjects. Very well, madam. Tell me, who lives on this land? I know one at present, because you evicted them when I took it over. And where did these people go when they left the land? Well, <laughs> to tell the truth, I really don't know. They were your tenants, and you, as lord of the land, were responsible for their welfare. But you don't know where they went. Oh, I'm sure they found a place to live. But you put them out of their homes. And you, sir, when you took over the land, of course, put it to some good use? Well, I... In a year when the people of France have been starving... You produced something for the good of your country? Well, I intended to, when the rights of the land had been settled permanently. You selfish, thoughtless creatures. At a time when hundreds of my subjects suffered from famine and plague, you have been so concerned with your own petty bickering that you have thought only of yourselves. You forget, madam, that we have great estates to manage. We have many other things to think of. You've forgotten that we are rulers, too, in a smaller way. Forgotten? No, I have remembered... I remember the words written first in Hebrew and then in Greek. The words of the Holy Scripture. Have they made thee ruler? Be not lifted up. Be among them as one of them. Have care of them. And when thou hast acquitted thyself of all thy charge, take thy place. Yes, I have remembered that you are rulers of large estates, and with your honor goes responsibility. But, Your Majesty, surely we are responsible. I shall be very happy to do whatever you recommend if the land remains in my possession. The tenants were treated properly while they were my tenants. Neither of you is fit to own this land. You, sir, who gambled with the dwelling place of your people, and you who wasted the chance to put it to some use, you are not worthy either of you to possess the gift which was given by my husband. This land will revert to the crown and it will be used for the good of our subjects who will share in the bounty of the kingdom. After the men had left, my mother spoke to me. Tell me, my son, what have you learned today that will help you to be a good and wise ruler? Well, I learned that I will always have to think of those who have no one to protect them. Yes. And... And if you're an important person in the world, you have many duties to others. Responsibilities. Yes, dear. But you will always remember all that you've learned today if you keep in your heart the teachings of Christ our Lord. I will try to do that, Mother. Do you know, I learned something else today. Oh? I learned that I have a very wise and good mother. I understand. I am ready. I devote myself to serve. These were the words engraved on the heart of Blanche, whose son, Louis IX of France, became a king noted for his wisdom, his learning, and his piety. Pages of the Book of Time record the names of many more. Stories of yesterday and today. And each is the story of a mother who walked in the way of Mary, whose soul has shone forth through the centuries with the light of divine grace. In the twilight of the evening almost 2,000 years ago, she was given to all of us through the wisdom and glory of God. She will forever be his mother and ours. O oh, sing to the Lord a new canticle, because he hath done wonderful things. Sing to the Lord a song of thanksgiving, for he hath given us to know the greatest mother of all time. program, a copyrighted feature, Coast to Coast, presented by Campana, the makers of Solitaire, the new cake makeup, and Campana Bomb, the famous hand lotion. Theater Time Broadway, and another premiere is scheduled for the Little Theater off Times Square.
If you're a lucky ticket holder, you're due for one of the most exciting experiences in Theaterland, an opening night performance of a brand new play. This is the occasion that will bring out dramatic critics, movie scouts, and of course a packed house, so we'd better be on our way. It's just a short walk around the corner. Will you join me? Broadway and 42nd Street. Back what that jammed in at your theater goes. And up ahead is the little theater off Times Square. Well, here we are at the little theater off Times Square. Have your tickets ready, please. Have your tickets ready, please. Good evening, Mr. First Nighter. The usher will show you to your box. Thank you. We'll go right in. We're comfortably seated. Let's have a look at the program. Tonight's brand new play is entitled Mother's Angel Children by Anthony Wayne. Barbara Luddy, our popular leading lady, tops the all-star cast. And opposite Miss Luddy is her guest leading man, Willard Waterman. The play is pure fiction, of course, and does not refer to real people or to actual events. Now, just before first curtain, let's listen to Eric Sagerquist and his famous First Nighter Orchestra. I'm going to fan this field with machine gun bullets in a line 18 inches above the ground. Any part of you that sticks up higher than that will have a slice taken off it. Okay. Start calling. Major Bob, I made it. I made it. <laughs> and a boy, Neville. Me too, Major Bob. Yes, good work, sir. You're a fine pair of commandos. We're rangers. Oh, but rangers are American. The British have commandos. I don't care. We're rangers. Hey, what's going on? Just because you've been over here four years, you mustn't forget your own country. But I want to be an American like you, Major Bob. Me too. <laughs> I think I'll have to speak to Grandma Davis. I, I don't believe Mr. Churchill would approve of the way she's raising you. If it hadn't been for America, there wouldn't be any Mr. Churchill. His mother was an American. Hmm, perhaps so. Oh, come on. I've got to be getting back to the house. I'm due at Mitchell Field in two hours. Look who's in front of the house. Well, it's Cynthia. Say, maybe I'll get a lift out to the field. Hi there, Cynthia. Hello, Bob, dear. Oh, and how's that dear little Sarah and her handsome brother Neville, hmm? I'm fine, thank you, Miss Cynthia. Me too, thank you. <laughs> I thought I might be going your way, Major Davis. <laughs> Anywhere near Mitchell Field? Why, right by their front door. <laughs> oh, lucky me. I'll get my things and be right out. You like Major Bob, don't you? Why, yes, I think he's very nice. You plan to marry him? Well, <laughs> no, it's uh, just a little previous. Besides, it's for the man to decide. That's what they say. But when it comes to marrying, I've decided that men are just putty in women's hands. <laughs> <laughs> Neville, I'm afraid you've been watching some she-wolves in action. <laughs> uh, already. Oh, well, hop in. Now, you mind your P's and Q's, children. Do as Grandma tells you. I'll be seeing you next weekend. Goodbye, Major Bob. Bye. Grandma Davis? What's eating you? Grandma Davis, do you like Miss Cynthia? Why? Major Bob likes her, I think. Mm, he likes ketchup on grapefruit, too. Well, if he likes her, I ought to like her, too. But I don't. And don't let it keep you awake, lad. Strictly off the record, I think she's a little twerp. Me, too. Good. But now sit down, both of you. I have some important news for you. Your mother sent you over here nearly four years ago, you know, so you'd be safe from the bombing in London. Yes. That probably was the hardest thing a mother could do, part for the children. She's missed you. You missed her, too. Yes, I know, son. But she didn't want to bring you back until everything was safe in England again for children. You mean we're going back? Better than that. Your mother's coming over for you. Mommy's coming here? She's coming to America? If all goes well, she'll be right here with us in four days. Sarah, did you hear that? Mother's coming. Oh, goody. <laughs> she was lucky enough to get passage on the clipper. So 
So she'll be flying across the ocean. Gosh, the lucky stiff. I can hardly wait. Uh, we we'll keep her here for a good visit before she takes you back to England. Back to England? Yeah, you shouldn't go before your school term is up. No. But we'll all plan to meet her at the airport Thursday. <laughs> have to rush this gate. Neville, Sarah, hello. Hello, hello. Mother. Neville, oh, Mother's little boy. Oh, grown to be such a big boy. And my baby, Sarah. If you aren't a baby any longer, you're becoming a young lady. Oh, I want to squeeze you to death. Hello, Margaret, darling. Granny Davis. Give me a kiss. <laughs> now, if I can just find the handkerchief, blow my nose, it'll be all right. How would you like the trip on the plane, Mother? Oh, it was thrilling, Neville. But I wish you could have been along... I remember how you've always loved airplanes. I still do. Me too. Oh, do you, dear? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid we'll all be going back by boat. Is it all arranged, Mother? Well, you can forget it if it is, because you're not going for a while. What do you mean? You're going to have a good rest, some real food, and a little fun at my house first. <laughs> What a little man you've grown to be, Neville. You put yourself to bed and managed so wonderfully. You forgot I've grown quite a bit since you saw me. No, I don't, darling. I've grown every day, every minute with you. I don't know how much Mother missed her, big boy. I missed you too, Mother. Your daddy would be proud of you, Neville. He was killed in France, wasn't he? Yes. He died early in the war. Was the Blitz over England very horrible, Mother? <laughs> well, I'm glad you and Sarah were on this side of the water. You're a stout fellow. Thank you, Neville. I like that. Makes me feel warm all over. Good night, dear. Good night, Mother, dear. All in bed, Sarah? Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't know how happy Mommy is to be tucking her own little girl into bed again. I'm very happy you're here. So am I. And we'll never be separated again. You will never die. Ever. You'll like America. We do. I'm sure I shall. Mommy. Yes? I think you're very pretty. <laughs> now, whatever made you say that, Sarah? But I do. I guess I just forgot how pretty you are. Flatterer. But I love it. Now to sleep with you, darling. Good night. Night. Sarah? Yes, Neville? Shh. I want to talk to you. What about? About Mother. Isn't she nice? Sure. And I've been thinking. What? Well, she's all alone, isn't she? She has us. No, I mean she hasn't got a husband. Hmm. Maybe she don't want one. Well, she ought to have one. She's young and pretty. Yes. She ought to marry someone like Major Bob. Wouldn't that be swell, Neville? See? Then he'd be our father. I like that. Let's tell her. No. we got to be secret like Indians. Because Major Bob likes Miss Cynthia. Oh, her. we got to liquidate her first. <laughs> what does that mean? Liquidate her. Fix it so Major Bob won't like her anymore. Then we fix it so he marries mother. But how can we do that, Neville? Now, i got a plan. Listen. <laughs> Act of tonight's play in the little theater of Times Square. Welcome to the outer lobby or downstairs, please. That lovely melody was inspired by a girl named Sylvia. Sylvia, whose face is so beautiful, it drifts through dreams. Smooth and adorable dream complexions, lovely enough to inspire instant admiration, are coming through from Hollywood to New York and right across the country thanks to Solitaire, Campana's new cake makeup containing lanolin. So why don't you step out with a Solitaire complexion? Thrill to its even smoothness, its flattering natural color tones. You'll welcome its dewy, fresh softness of texture and the clever way it helps to hide small skin blemishes. Yes, indeed, you'll love Solitaire, and others will love it on you. See for yourself how kind Solitaire is to your skin because of its lanolin-rich base. 
Lanolin, you know, helps prevent skin dryness. And listen, these busy days, are you always in a hurry? Well, then you'll adore the way solitaire sponges on in a jiffy. Stays smooth and even for hours and hours without retouching. It helps you look prettier longer. And let me impress you with this fact. Solitaire gives you one of the largest compacts of high-quality cake makeup on the market today for only 60 cents. Step up to your favorite cosmetic counter and insist on Solitaire in any one of six flattering shades. You'll be down in a minute. Oh. I haven't seen your mother. What do you have there, Marble? Yes. Miss Cynthia, don't you think my mommy's pretty? Oh, yes, I do, Sarah. I think she's lovely. That's what Major Bob said. She's so young and... He did? Yes, and a lot more, too. Really? Well, he said he liked her better than you. Oh? But he said you hung on to him like a bloodsucker and he didn't know how to shake her. Now, just a minute. This is a little too thick. What about it, Sarah? That's what he said. I don't believe a word of it. He said mother's the kind of girl he'd like to marry. So that's what's behind it all. He thinks you're a big twerp. No, Neville. A little one. Why, you impudent little... Listen to me, you little brat. I'll have you deported. I'll have you turned in as aliens. Did you dare... What kind of talk is that? What's going on here? Well, these children have been positively rude. Well, I don't see any reason for you to... Oh, wait will answer that phone. Look, Sarah, I can put both these marbles in my mouth. Be careful. You might swallow them. <coughs> what, <coughs> Neville? What's the matter? <laughs> oh, Sarah, you swallow the marble. It's stuck in his throat. Is that a money fair? Yes. Is that... Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Turn him upside down and slap his back. Come here, Neville. Now I've got your feet over the chair. Get it out, you little demon. <laughs> what? Yes, I saw it. I think this is disgraceful, Cynthia. What do you mean? For you to lose your temper to such an extent you'd beat a child, it, it's barbaric. So, it's barbaric, is it? Well, maybe they were rude, but they're only children. You might attempt to control yourself. And you might stick your head in the mud puddle. You and these brats and the, the lovely Mrs. Boswell. Well, well, why do you bring their mother into this? I didn't bring her in. She came in on re reverse lend lease, and she's plenty reverse as far as I'm concerned. That's a fine way for a lady to talk. Who said I'm a lady? I mean, of course I'm a lady. Uh, but one thing, Major Bob Davis, I'm not going to fight the Battle of Britain all over again. Goodbye. Uh, Cynthia, wait. Oh, go on, then. She did. <laughs> Women. They're the root of all trouble. Pretty roots, though, don't you think, Major Bob? Uh, I hope I never see another one again. Hello, everyone. You didn't get your hope, Major Bob. Uh, no. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Mother. Is something wrong? Wrong? What could be wrong? Well, Cynthia just whizzed by me, spurting flames like a spitfire. You're lucky she didn't dive on you. <laughs> but when I said hello, she responded with a peculiar noise that I think was meant to be unpleasant. Does it sound like this, Mother? <laughs> That's it? Whatever does it mean? In a nutshell, Mother... Nuts to you. It's called a brown cheer. Oh, I didn't realize she was cheering me. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Where's what's her name? Who? You know, thingamabob. Oh, you mean, you mean Cynthia? She took a powder. Oh. Um, look, Margaret, uh, I have two tickets for that new show, The Voice of the Parrot. Uh, why not join me and we'll go in town tonight and see it? That dirty show, it's not fit for a lady to see. By the way, you got an extra ticket? <laughs> Granny, you're incorrigible. <laughs> well, how about it, Margaret? I'd love to, Bob, but really, I shouldn't leave the children here alone. Alone? What do I look like? Banquo's goat? <laughs> uh, never mind. Maybe I do. But I don't think it's fair to ask you. Stop for nonsense. If that tight wad son of mine makes you an offer, take him up. Hey, now, Granny. <laughs> Very well, I'll go. Thank you, Bob. 
difficult question to answer, Nettle. Well, suppose you wanted two people to fall in love. How could you make them? <laughs> Darling, don't tell me you fancy yourself as Cupid. Of course not. Cupid's just a little kid that goes around with no clothes on. <laughs> uh, actually, I've never been very good at matchmaking. One usually tries to arrange for the two people to be thrown together a lot, I believe. But what if nothing happens? I really don't know. Uh, they say that jealousy sometimes acts as a spark to love. Jealousy, huh? This is a very deep subject for a little boy. Why not bother yourself with marbles or cricket? And that romance until you're older. Yeah, maybe I'd better. Uh, by the way, you notice how much Major Bob hangs around you when he's here? Oh, he's just being nice because I'm a guest here. Oh, yes? Major Bob is a gentleman. Well, even if he is, he likes you. Never, your imagination is positively running away with you. His imagination when he tells me so? Oh, did he? Certainly. Well... Hello, children. What's cooking? Fried chicken. For dinner. <laughs> Where's my, uh, your mother? Over next door at Mr. Bancroft. At Bancroft? Oh, he's been seeing a lot of mother lately. That weak need draft dodger? Mother thinks he's nice. She does, huh? Yeah, and he's taking quite a shine to Mother's. Oh, it's incredible. I thought your mother had better taste. He's very wealthy, too. Now, never mind. Don't tell me any more. <laughs> what do you kids think of him? Us? I don't like him. Me, too. I just hope Mother doesn't marry him. But we want her to be happy. Hey, wait a minute. Here comes your mother across the lawn now. Uh, you kids duck. I want to talk to her alone. Okay, Major Bob. We won't listen. Hello, Bob. Just get in? Yes. Been visiting our attractive neighbor? Tom Bancroft? Yes. No, I'm fascinated with him. He's growing orchids. Mm, lovely. Where's he growing them? In his hair? Well, that's an odd thing to say, Bob. Been seeing quite a bit of this Bancroft, haven't you? No, just occasionally. Charming moron, isn't he? <laughs> I... Bob, it isn't possible. You're not jealous. Who's jealous? Why should I be jealous? <laughs> Me, jealous. Perhaps I was mistaken. Yeah, perhaps I was, too. I gave you credit for better judgment than a guy like Bancroft. Who, for instance? Well, all right. Me. All right. I might be in love with you. Isn't this rather sudden? Not more so than Bancroft. Of course, he's got plenty of spare time and plenty of dough. I'm just on army pay. That's a rather ugly thing to say, Bob. Well, it's true. A couple of millions isn't to be sneezed at. But you might think of your children. You suppose they want Bancroft for a father? Think of my children. Do you suppose I let them leave me for four years because I like it? Well, they don't like him. They have nothing to worry about. I barely know Tom Bancroft. I, I tried to be pleasant because he's your neighbor. Am I supposed to believe that? Whether you do or not is a matter of complete indifference to me. But it's rather obvious that I've already overstayed my welcome here. Oh, now, wait a minute. Please, Margaret. I, I didn't mean... Let's forget it. But the children and I will be leaving just as soon as I can book passage. <laughs> Many of you ladies have been asking a question that I would like to answer. The question is, how can I keep my hands soft and smooth regardless of the extra work I'm doing? All right, here's the answer. Replace the natural oils your skin loses with lanolin. You see, when your skin loses its natural oils due to hard work, exposure, and frequent washing... It becomes dry and parched looking. The softness and smoothness is gone. So the answer is, keep your skin supplied with a substance which scientists say most nearly duplicates the functions of the natural oils of the skin. And that substance is lanolin. And lanolin is contained in Campana Cream Balm. So when your hands lose their natural oils and become dry and unlovely, turn first to Campana Cream Balm containing lanolin. Now, keep in mind that Campana Cream Balm contains lanolin, in addition to all its other skin-softening ingredients. And you'll understand why this new lotion with lanolin is growing in popularity daily. Campana Cream Balm is lusciously creamy, instantly soothing, delightfully fragrant. 
and completely free of after-use stickiness. So don't let your hands lose their appeal to romance. Ask for Campana Cream Balm in the yellow and white carton. If your hands are extra sensitive and extra dry from spring house cleaning duties, you may prefer Campana's other lotion, original Campana Balm in the green and white carton, an extra rich, concentrated lotion for extra busy hands. Mother. Oh, I have some mending to do, and I'm more comfortable up here in the bedroom. Maybe you don't want to see Major Bob, either. Why do you say that? I heard him telling Granny that he acted like a heel. He said that? Uh-huh. He seemed awfully unhappy. Well, he acted very badly, indeed. Are you mad at him, Mother? No, never. You mustn't bother yourself about this. We'll be leaving for home shortly. I should be glad to get back to England. This kind of seems like home to me. Yes, you've become quite Americanized. That's only natural after four years. Mother? Yes? Are you in love with Mr. Bancroft? Oh, darling, I'm not in love with anyone except my own little Sarah and Neville. Not with anyone? Not with anyone. I go along and play. My, but you're an old warrior. Granny, are you busy? I haven't been busy for 20 years. Could I talk to you? Why not? Man to man? Me too. Sit down. You interest me strangely. Sit here, Sarah. Now, why are the brows all furrowed with care? Granny, I'm a dope. Is that all? We spoiled everything. Sarah and I wanted Mother and Major Bob to fall in love and get married. Then Major Bob would be our father. We'd be Americans and wouldn't have to go back. Well, so far, so good. Of course, first of all, we had to get Major Bob out of love with Miss Cynthia. So we liquidated her. Why, you infamous, depraved, ruthless little rapscallions. <laughs> nice word. <laughs> but Major Bob didn't fall in love with Mother then. So we decided to make him jealous. Go on. You know the rest. He got so jealous, he got mad. He made Mother mad. Now they won't speak to each other. They've been mad for three weeks. Yes, yes, I'd say you lost things up in good shape. It's all my fault, too. What can we do, Granny? Everything would be fine if they just get married. Well, let me put my thinking cap on. See if I can unravel this. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? Oh, gosh. It's Miss Cynthia. Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. And there's those two darling children. Hello, Miss Cynthia. Hello. Bob isn't here. Oh, too bad. I did want to see him. You're... Not mad at us? Mad at you? Why, Neville, I love you dearly. If it hadn't been for you, I'd still be going with Bob and would never have met Tom. Well, who's this lucky fellow, Tom? Tom Bancroft. Haven't you heard? We'll be married next week. <laughs> Imagine me with all that money. I don't know what to do with it. Mm, I don't suppose so. <laughs> well, tell Bob, won't you? And... The children's mother. Oh, I'm as happy as a bird. Goodbye. Goodbye. A bird, huh? Probably a vulture. Neville, everything's gone backwards. She's getting married instead of mother. Yeah, I'm a fine Cupid. Listen here. I think I've got a plan. You go out and play. And I'll call you when I have it all ready. <laughs> Mother? Well, I haven't seen you since lunch. Well, are we late for dinner? No, no, it's only 5.30. Where have you been? Oh, Margaret and I took a little walk. Margaret and you? Mm-hmm. I thought you two were glaring at each other. No, not anymore. We patched all that up. Well, I'm glad of that. You know, I think she's the most wonderful girl in the world, Bunny. You certainly run from cold to hot in a hurry. As a matter of fact, I want to talk to you about her. Yes? I don't believe you're going to approve, but... Bob! Bob! Oh, what's the matter, Margaret? Oh, Bob, the children... They've run away. Run away? Look at this note. We 
We wanted you and Major Bob to get married so he would be our father. <laughs> Margaret, do you hear that? Yes, but read on. But you're mad at each other, and we don't want to go back to England, so we're going west. Goodbye, Neville and Sarah. We've got to find them, Bob. Perhaps something's happened to well, they them. They can't be very far. Oh, and to think I... I was afraid to tell them. Tell them what? That Bob and I were married last week. You were married? Yes, I, I'm sorry, Mother. I was going to tell you. Well, I was afraid the children might not understand or approve of my marrying again. I... <laughs> Here you go, Sarah. Oh, my darling. You and Major Bob are really married? Yes, really, dear. We didn't run away. Oh, I'm so glad you didn't. Yes, but why did you leave the note saying you were? You wanted to, uh, we wanted you to get married, and Granny thought that that might bring you to your senses. Oh, Granny. No, huh? no, 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 don't look at me like that. You ought to marry her a month ago. Gosh, yes. We had an awful time getting you two married. <laughs> Margaret, it seems we've been a little slow about things. <laughs> <laughs> well, kids, looks like you're a couple of Yankees now. How's it feel? Hunky dory. Boy, I'm right in the groove now. Oh, boy. Me, too. And the curtain falls on another performance in the little theater off Times Square. Miss Lottie and Mr. Waterman are in front of our footlights. And now our leading lady, Miss Lottie, has a message for you from the government. 1944 is the year when we carry the war to our enemy. This is when we must throw into the fight everything we've got. So keep in mind every day that paper and cardboard are vital war materials. Save every bit of paper and all kinds of used cardboard boxes. Look in the attic or storeroom. Collect all you can. If you have any trouble getting your waste paper picked up, call the radio station to which you are listening. Before we move out of the theater, let me invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when Barbara Luddy will be starred in an original romance entitled Tall Like a Queen. Now we move out of the theater and into the street. What do you say we stroll down Broadway? Good night, Mr. First Center. Good night. The First Nighter program is a copyrighted radio feature. Listen, men. Tomorrow morning, right after you shave, try using Dress Skin, Campana's famous aftershave lotion. Makes your face feel cool, comfortable, refreshed, well-groomed. Yes, sir, Dress Skin, spelled D-R-E-S-K-I-N, is again available in limited quantities. Ask for Dress Skin at any drugstore. This is Mutual. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Donald Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Baby Me. If you have a family of football fans, you know what an afternoon at the game can do to their appetite. Send them zooming up higher than a kite. So be prepared with a good hearty meal. And for dessert, that all-star favorite, Jell-O. You always win with Jell-O. You make a touchdown every time. It's so good to look at, gayer than the college colors. Cheerful and bright and appetizing. And it's so good to eat. Jell-O's rich, zestful fruit flavors make a real occasion out of every meal. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. All six are chock full of extra rich flavor that tastes as tempting as the ripe fruit itself. There are dozens and dozens of different ways to serve Jell-O, and you'll find attractive recipes on every package. So look for those big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O. <laughs> That 
was Baby Me, played by the orchestra. Now, folks, as you all know, 447 years ago last Thursday, Christopher Columbus discovered America. That's right, Don. To finance this expedition, he borrowed a huge sum of money from Queen Isabella of Spain. Yep. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man Columbus would have had trouble with, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jalo again, this is Jack Benny talking And Don, although I appreciate your timely introduction Aren't you assuming too much? Now, what do you mean? Well, how do you know Columbus would have had trouble borrowing money from me? That's just a wild guess well, Jack, I was merely trying to be topical, that's all Last Thursday was Columbus Day and I wanted to tie you in with him Don, tying me in with Columbus is indeed flattering But you didn't have to make me tight He didn't make you tight, he just lifted the veil <laughs> Oh, he did. Now, listen, Phil, and this goes for you, too, Don. Uh, we're beginning a new season. I think we ought to make a few changes. I'm sure there are more vital things to talk about than me being tight. I'm awfully sorry, Jack. Me, too. Don, I believe. <laughs> you know, fellas, this is only our second broadcast, and during this new season, we ought to try and get on more believable subjects. You're right, Jack. We've all been picking on you too much. You said it, Mary. Hmm, imagine saying I wouldn't finance Columbus. Well, if I'd have been living in those days, I would have been glad to loan him the money. Yeah, but he'd have, have a tough time sailing that boat with one arm. <laughs> Mary, I wouldn't have asked for collateral. <laughs> to hear you talk, you'd think I never spent a dime. Well? Well, nothing. What about that party I threw Wednesday night at the Coconut Grove? What party? You know, the party I threw at the Coconut Grove. Didn't I pay the check for ten people? Didn't I leave a big tip? Yeah, but you took a tree home for firewood. <laughs> I did not. I just took a few branches that fell off. <laughs> so don't exaggerate. Boy, that's rich. Benny the wood chopper. Bill, get this straight. I didn't go to the Coconut Grove Wednesday night to chop down any trees. Then why did you wear that lumberjack shirt? <laughs> that wasn't a lumberjack shirt. That was my tuxedo shirt that was washed with some plaid socks. <laughs> So there. Why, Jack, you ought to sue the laundry. He can't. He did it himself. <laughs> well, you're certainly right up on your toes tonight, Miss Livingston. It's quite a contrast to your opening performance last Sunday. You said it, Jack. Oh, boy, was I nervous. I nearly fainted. I'll say it is. It's a wonder you couldn't control yourself. You've been on the air before. Why all the worry? Did you ever have a strap break in the middle of a program? <laughs> Oh, I see. So that's what happened, huh? Say, Mary, is that why you borrowed my fraternity pin? Yeah. Phil, how can a hillbilly that only went as far as third grade have a fraternity pin? What are you talking about? I'm a college man. What college? Corn Pone Tech. <laughs> corn Pone Tech? Yeah, Corn Pone, Corn Pone, here we come, shaving a haircut. <laughs> Bay Rum. <laughs> Oh, a barber college. Well, well, I'm certainly, I'm certainly glad to hear that, Phil. Right after the program, I'll let you cut my hair. Okay, just send it over to Wiltshire Bowl. <laughs> All right, Smarty. No cover charge. Mary. <laughs> now, wait a minute, fellas. That's another topic I want dismissed this season. I don't want to hear another word about my toupee. Because I don't wear one. What's that over your right ear, a halo? <laughs> now, Mary, cut it out and let's change the subject. Say, Don, come here a minute. What is it, Jack? Uh, did you hear any nice reports on our opening program last Sunday? I mean, was there any good comment on it? Why, yes, everyone I talked with liked it very much, and they were especially enthusiastic about our new tenor, Dennis Day. Oh, that's swell. Of course, he was a little nervous his first time on the air. Well, I have to admit, Jack, that I was pretty nervous myself. I had the shakes, too. Phil, you've never had anything that a good night's sleep won't cure. <laughs> <laughs> but really, Don, I'm very happy about Dennis. Of course, uh, I'm going to have to do something about that mother of his. Oh, boy, what I've gone through with her already. Well, after all, Jack, it's a mother's instinct to look after the best interests of her son. I know that, Don, but I don't want her around while we're broadcasting. Oh, why don't you put your foot down, Jack? Why don't you threaten her? Not a good that'll do. She's bigger than I am. <laughs> look, we've been on the air ten minutes and they haven't shown up yet. And you know why? Because I told her to be here on time. Oh, Jack, you're just imagining things. Mrs. Day seems to be a very nice woman. Don, you don't have to put up with her like I do. 
She's always interfering with my business. She came over to my house the other day and made Dennis stop mowing the lawn. <laughs> How do you like that? Don't tell me you got that kid mowing your lawn already. Well, it keeps him out of mischief, and besides, Dennis was perfectly willing to do it. He should be. You got it in his contract. <laughs> I have not. His mother took it out. <laughs> anyway, my lawn sure looks nice, half mowed. Well, why don't you make Rochester finish it? Oh, he can't. He joined some kind of a union where he can only do five jobs for me. <laughs> He's up to his quota now. Anyway, fellas, getting back to Mrs. Day, if she doesn't... Whoops, that must be her now. Don't say anything, fellas. Come in. Well, Andy! Hiya, Buck! Well, hello. Well, Andy! Hey, 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 hey. well, Andy, it's about time you showed up. I was expecting you to drop in last Sunday. Well, I couldn't make it, Buck. I had to drive Ma and Pa to the Pomona Fair. We never miss it. Oh, the Pomola Fair. I say, did your mother win first prize again on her famous elderberry wine? Well, she was expecting to, Buck, but Pa was all alone in the back seat with the jug. <laughs> oh, so... <laughs> so your Pa drank it, huh? I think so. We passed an orange grove on the way, and Pa said, Holy smoke, look at that sunset. <laughs> Well, then you're probably right. Say, Andy, they generally have pretty good exhibits at the Pomona Fair. How are they this year? Swell. The farm products were wonderful. Oh. You know, Buck, they had an ear of corn there three feet long. What was that, Andy? I knew you'd be interested, <laughs> Bill. Well, I'm glad you had such a good time, Andy. By the way, did you get a chance to tune in on our show last week? I sure did, Buck. Uh, how'd you like our new tenor, Dennis Day? Oh, he was great, but Ma was a little disappointed. She thought I was going to sing this year. Well, you could hardly talk that one. Huh? <laughs> That's all we need. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Andy. Wait a minute. You're not a tenor. I am on some words. You're a quartet on some words. <laughs> well, stick around, Andy. I'll have you meet the kid. He'll be here pretty soon. I'd like to, Buck, but I gotta run along now. Why, Andy? What's your hurry? Well, my girl's picking me up in front of the studio. Oh, your girl, eh? Who is she? Whoever picks me up, so long, but... <laughs> well, say, that... That Andy's getting to be quite a devil. Well, come on, Phil, let's get going with the show. How about a number? Okay, Jackson, would you like a newie or an oldie? Uh, Phil, just play a goodie if you can eat. Mm, a newie or an oldie. <laughs> Down in writing, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And Phil, in all fairness to you, the band sounded very good, much better than last week. What are you talking about? The music was sensational last week. 
Sensational? Yeah. Did you see that marvelous write-up I got in the musical Curio? <laughs> the musical what? Curio. I got it right here. Let's see that. Curio. That's Courier. Musical Courier. <laughs> he owns a fraternity pin yet. If I could trust that strap, I'd give it back. I don't blame you. What does the write-up say, Phil? It's a rave from start to finish, kid. You read it, Jackson. I don't want to sound hammy. <laughs> okay. It says, a musical review. Phil Harris and his orchestra are back again on the Jell-O program this year. And on the opening broadcast, Sunday, October 8th, we can only say that the music was abominable. I guess that's bad, eh? <laughs> In all selections played, the brass was turbulent and the strings were as stagnant as anything this uh, reporter has ever heard. And that guy's one of the best critics in the country. <laughs> he certainly is, Phil, so that's what you call a rave notice, eh? Sure, I got a scrapbook full of that stuff. <laughs> Did you hear that, Mary? He saves those kind of write-ups. Maybe he's gonna blackmail himself. <laughs> That must be it. What are you kids talking about? Why, that's one of the best write-ups I ever got. Did you notice them big words? Phil, this review says that your music was abominable, turbulent, stagnant. If you take a bow on that, it proves that you're definitely an illiterate egomaniac. No kidding. <laughs> Gee, that went to his head, too. Well, I give up. I did my best. Now, let's drop all this nonsense and get down to business. Say, Jack. Yes, Don? Speaking of write-ups, our opening program got a lovely notice in the Grocer's Journal. Oh, in the Grocer's Journal, eh? Have you got it with you, Don? Sure, here it is, right here. It says, uh, the Jell-O program opened its fall season last Sunday night with the most enjoyable half hour. Well. It was a distinct pleasure to hear Don Jolly Boy Wilson. <laughs> Jolly Boy? <laughs> yeah. Again, remind us that Jell-O is not only economical and easy to make, but that it comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Well, that's very nice, Don. Doesn't it say anything about the rest of us? Oh, yes, it says, uh... Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, and Phil Harris maintained perfect silence as Mr. Wilson, in a voice vibrant with emotion, stressed the importance of insisting on genuine jello with the big red letters on the box. Well, that's a marvelous review, Don. You went over very big. You know, fellas, when you get that kind hey, of... Hey, Jack, what? here comes Dennis Day now. Where? Right behind his mother. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, hello? Hello, Dennis? Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Well... Well, did you hear that, Dennis? That shows everybody liked you last week. You were a big hit. Gee, it all seems like a dream to me. I can imagine. Oh, hello, Mrs. Day. How do you do? Hmm. And, um, how are you, Miss Livingston? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Mary. Uh, now, Dennis. Yes, please? Uh, Dennis, <laughs> I don't want to harp on any particular subject because this is all new to you. But as I told you last Sunday, it's rather important that you be here on time. You were a little late again today. I'm very sorry, Mr. Benny. That's quite all right. You see, we haven't lived out here very long. You've apologized, Dennis. That's enough. But, Mrs. Day, your son was just trying to be courteous. That's all. He said he was sorry. That's all that's necessary. Oh, brother. What was that? I said, oh, brother. I was talking to my brother. He's sitting in the 18th <laughs> row. Hello, Sam. <laughs> My goodness. Now, Dennis, tell me, did you hear any nice comments about your singing last week? Did your friends like you? Oh, yes, Mr. Benny. I was so thrilled that I took the first paycheck you gave me and framed it. Oh, you framed your check. You mean you're not even going to cash it? No, sir, never. This is the happiest moment of Jack's life. <laughs> now, Mary, I'm glad he's sentimental. It shows good character, Dennis. Thanks for the frame, Mr. Benny. <laughs> never mind. You know, Dennis, I'm one of the friends who thought you were grand last week. You went over very well. Sure, the kid went over. Say, Mrs. Day, how'd you like the way my orchestra accompanied your son? Since you asked me, I thought the music was a bum. There you are, Jackson. Everybody says so. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I can't stand this any longer. I'm going to explain this whole thing to you in your native tongue. When that 
critic said that your music was abominable, he meant that you weren't jiving, that you were off the beam. You mean I wasn't in the groove, I wasn't hep? Exactly. Well, dummy up on that. Mama Jackson. <laughs> Now, don't take it too hard, Phil. We all get a bad write-up once in a while. Shucks, and I just subscribed to that paper for 25 years. Well, that's too bad. Oh, Jack, you shouldn't have told him. He was so ignorant and happy. <laughs> I did it for his own good, Mary. Phil's been getting pretty swell-headed lately. Is that so? Yes, Phil. You know, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, when orchestra leader gets kick in pants, hat fit better. <laughs> Remember that, Phil. Now, Dennis... Yes, please? Uh, we're ready for a number Have you got your song prepared for tonight? Oh, indeed I have, Mr. Benny Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen Dennis Day, our young vocal discovery Will sing that old and popular favorite Melancholy Baby Dennis is not going to sing Melancholy Baby He's going to sing Cinderella, Stay in My Arms Now, Mrs. Day, I've arranged with Dennis To sing Melancholy Baby It's my favorite torch song Dennis is singing Cinderella, Stay in My Arms Just one minute, Mrs. Day Whose program is this? It's up for grabs <laughs> Stay out of this, Mary. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Day is going to sing Melancholy Baby. Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yes, he is. It's no use, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Dennis, I'm handling this. Just do as I say and we'll have no trouble. Melancholy Baby, folks. Sing, Dennis. <laughs> Melancholy Baby, sung by Dennis Day. And now, ladies and gentlemen... That was Cinderella, stay in my arms. Now, listen, Mrs. Day. Cinderella was a melancholy baby, and you know it. Anyway, Dennis, you sang that number beautifully. You didn't sound a bit nervous tonight. I wasn't, Mr. Benny, but last week, gee, oh boy. Well, that's only natural. Gosh, if it hadn't been for Miss Livingston, I don't know what I'd have done. Oh, it was nothing, Dennis. I didn't want you to be scared, that's all. Well, that was awfully sweet of you, Mary. What'd you tell him? I just said that if a certain comedian got by for seven years, why should he worry? <laughs> well, that's a fine way to talk about Fred Allen. <laughs> Anyway, Dennis, don't feel upset about last week because we were all just as jittery as you were. Every one of us. I was as cool as a cucumber. Is that so, Mrs. Day? As if I care. What was that? I said we're on the air. <laughs> we're on the air. And hello, Sam. <laughs> Mary, I'm talking. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may resume control here, I would like to announce our play for next Sunday. A week from tonight, the Benny Belligerent Barnstormers will inaugurate their new season of dramatic offering. After much thought and careful consideration, we decided to open with our version of Daryl F. Zanuck's 20th Century Fox production, that historical drama of adventure in darkest Africa, Stanley and Livingston. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kismet. <laughs> This, I feel, will be one of our outstanding uh, presentations. I agree with you, Jack. I think it's a great idea to do Stanley and Livingston. Yes, Don, at least it'll be something new. New? Fred Allen did it two weeks ago. Mrs. Day, what Fred Allen does on his program is no concern of mine. This is a true story that took place in the year 1875. And I have just as much right to do Stanley and Livingston as Fred Allen. Even more, you knew the boys. <laughs> I'm not that old, Mary. Now, getting back... <laughs> now, getting back to next week's attraction... Oh, Mr. Benny. Yes, please. I mean, uh, yes... <laughs> uh, yes, Dennis. Why does Mr. Allen talk through his nose? What was that, Dennis? I said, why does Mr. Allen talk through his nose? Because he hasn't enough strength to blow it, and thanks for asking. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen Oh, gosh, I hope he's listening And now, ladies and gentlemen We are going to take the remaining moments of our program To give you a preview of some of the highlights From next week's stirring drama First Pardon me, I'll take it Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester Well, Rochester, I'm busy now Call me back later But it's important, boss Carmichael's got a toothache Toothache? Doggone, I knew there was something wrong With that polar bear this morning is he in pain, Rochester? Yes, boss, and he's in a bad mood. I threw a fish at him, and he declined it right back in my face. <laughs> well, Rochester, it's your own fault. Carmichael wouldn't have a toothache if you take care of him. Did you brush his teeth this morning? Only as I passed by. <laughs> well, 
Well, that's awful. Which tooth is bothering him, Rochester? Is it a molar or a bicuspid? Uh, what's that, boss? I said, is it a molar or a bicuspid? Yes, pretty bad. <laughs> Rochester, what I'm trying to get at, what's bothering him? Is it a front tooth or a back tooth? It's that long front one, the one he dimpled my leg with. <laughs> well, look, I'll be home pretty soon. Meanwhile, here's what I want you to do. Now, pay strict attention. Okay, boss. Now, take a piece of cotton. Take a piece of cotton. Yeah, roll it into a ball. Roll it into a ball. Uh, put some toothache drops on it. Put some toothache drops on it. And then shove it in the cavity. <laughs> Rochester. Rochester! Your echo just resigned! <laughs> For heaven's sake, now, don't be such a coward. Animals understand when you're trying to help them. Uh -huh. You remember... You remember that story about the man who took a thorn out of the lion's paw? Yeah, whatever become of him? <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, just leave the bear alone. I'll take care of him later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What? Can I borrow your top hat tonight? My top hat? Yeah, I got a date with a tall girl. <laughs> well, just stand on your tiptoes and leave my hat alone. Goodbye. And that polar bear's got more troubles. What's the matter, Jack? Oh, Carmichael's got a toothache. There'll be no living with him all week. Well, where were we? Uh, you were going to give us a preview of Stanley and Livingston. Oh, yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the highlights of our next week's attraction, Stanley and Livingston. That thrilling saga of the dark continent. Take it, Don. Africa. The jungle. Headhunters. These, ladies and gentlemen, are just a few of the highlights from next week's Sunday's sensational offering, <laughs> Stanley and Nivingston. So be sure and tune in. Pardon me, come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I'll be seeing you in the jungle next week. Oh, are you a headhunter? No, hair is all I'm after. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and he's not kidding, folks. Play with it. You know, there's always something new for dessert if you just look around. And the new Jell-O puddings make the best desserts that you've tasted in a long time. Just try that Jell-O butterscotch pudding and find out how delicious it is. It has a creamy, mellow flavor, the flavor of real old-fashioned butterscotch, the kind you loved when you were a kid. And it has a tempting golden color like taffy that makes you hungry just to look at it. Then try Jell-O chocolate pudding, rich and dark and satin smooth. And a jello vanilla pudding with that rich color of old ivory and a delicately tempting flavor. Yes, ma'am, you'll say all three jello puddings are tops in goodness. And all three are quick and easy to make. For all you do is add milk and then cook and stir over a low flame till the mixture is smooth and thick. Simple directions are in every package and you can't go wrong. Jello puddings are a swell cold weather dessert, a truly heartening treat for a brisk fall night. So try all three and try them soon. Ask your grocer tomorrow for Jell-O butterscotch, chocolate, and vanilla pudding. This is the last number of the second program in the new Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. So be sure and listen in to the opening of our dramatic season. Say, Jack, what? let's go out someplace and get a sandwich. I can't, Mary. I gotta run home and take care of Carmichael. Oh, say, do you know a good dentist I can get for him? Sure, I got an uncle that's a swell dentist. Well, call him, will you? Is he painless? No, he's got rheumatism, something awful. <laughs> oh, well, I guess he'll do. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Here's news. Every Tuesday night, the Aldrich family is on the air, starring Ezra Stone and Henry Aldrich, that lovable hard luck kid. 
Consult your local newspaper for time and stations, and be sure to tune in on The Aldrich Family next Tuesday night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Family, starring Ezra Stone, written by Clifford Goldsmith. Brought to you by the puddings that are tops in taste. Jell-O pudding. They say the happiest years of your life are the teens. But I know one person who has his doubts about that. Henry Aldrich. Henry has all the troubles and growing pains that most boys go through in their high school days. For Henry is a typical American boy. Tonight out in Centerville, the Aldriches are just having dinner. And our scene opens in the dining room of the Aldrich home. Have another lamb chop, Alice? No, thank you. You aren't eating anything. Sam, I'm so tired of planning meals and cooking meals, I don't know what to do. Chops are awfully good, Mother. Yes, Mary. Say, say, who do you think I was just talking to on the phone? Who, Henry? Kathleen. Her folks want me to come over for dinner Saturday night. Tomorrow night? Sure. Isn't that a break for you, Mother? Why for me? Well, if I'm not here, you can just have any old thing for dinner. What do you mean she can? I've got to go out in the kitchen and whip some cream. I'll be clearing the table, Mother. Boy, can you imagine? Weren't any of the rest of us invited, Henry? She didn't mention any of you. Goodness knows the Andersons have been here often enough. Mary, is that very kind? But, Father, just inviting Henry's hardly any way to pay off a social debt. Henry, would you be disappointed if you didn't go to Kathleen's? Not go? Have you forgotten what day Sunday is? Sunday? Mm Mm-hmm. Sunday. It's Mother's Day. Oh, but, but Father, I'm, I'm just going for dinner Saturday night. Well, I'd, I'd planned to take your mother and you and Mary out to dinner Saturday as a Mother's Day celebration. You had, Father? Now, it's up to you as to where you'd rather go. Oh, gee, I don't want to offend Mother, but I... You'd rather go to Kathleen? Well, I... I don't know. It's a hard thing to decide. It isn't every day that mothers have a day. Henry, if you're coming this way, will you bring your plate? I'm not coming that way, Mary. <laughs> what would you like to do? Well, I'll phone Kathleen. Yeah, sure, I'd love to go with you. Well, I, I guess I ought to get Mother something nice, don't you think? Splendid. Would uh, you care to contribute anything toward it? <laughs> I contribute? I'll tell you what. Let it be a present from the entire family. It seems to me, son, you should have saved up for this occasion. I have, Father. I have. I've earned nearly uh, five dollars. Only I hate to see it all go at once. Henry, may I have your plate now? I'm not through with my plate, Mary. May I have your glass, please? I'm not through with that either. You may take my plate, Mary. Thank you, Father. I'm glad somebody in this house cooperates. Father, Father, how do you think Mother would like to have me get her a new dress? A dress? Sure, I don't see what would be so difficult about it. All I have to do is get Mother down to the store and just happen to take her by the dress department. And what? And as we go by, I say, uh, gee, Mother, look. And she'll say, oh, isn't that one swell? And I've got it all picked out. But supposing she picks one of the more expensive dresses? Oh, I wouldn't mind the sacrifice. I'd just as soon spend the whole five (laughs) dollars. I think I ought to do something for Mother. She, she's, she's puts up with a, with an awful lot from us. Mother wants to know if you drank any milk this afternoon. Just one glass, Mary. Well, what you drank was cream. Cream? Cream? Yeah, I thought that was awful rich when I drank it. There isn't one speck out there to whip. She was... Well, well, tell her on Sunday I'll make up for everything. Excuse me while I take this. I'm not through with that plate. 
There isn't anything left on it, Henry. I've got my chop in my hand. May I have your bread and butter, please? But you're not to come any closer than that. And, Henry, will you please eat your chop as you should? But, Father, I, I waste so much when I eat it politely. <laughs> Mary, you wouldn't like to go in on something real nice for Mother's Day, would you? I'd plan to get Mother something alone, Henry. What? A blouse. A blouse, Mary? A blouse? Mm-hmm. No skirt? <laughs> My goodness, I'm going to pay nearly three ninety five for it as it is. Well, uh, how much would one come to? The very cheapest would be two ninety five. What? Yes. I wonder whether Mother wouldn't like to go to the movies instead. Mary! I'm coming, Mother. Father, there's an awfully good movie this week. Oh? What is it? Uh, the Cowboy Returns. Yes. I'd even be willing to blow the whole family to it. Well, first, don't you think you'd better make sure the Cowboy Returns is what your mother wants to see? Oh, I'll let her have her choice. You know, Father, if, if we didn't go to an expensive place, I could I could almost take the whole family to dinner, too. I think the movies will be sufficient. Oh, no, Father. I know of a place where it's very reasonable. I'd be glad to take all of you. How about it? Henry, can you make room for this dessert? Mary, Mother can't hear me out there, can she? Mother isn't even speaking to you. She isn't, Mary? She will. How would you like to go to the movies Mother's Day Eve? What's that, Henry? Saturday night. I mean it. We're all going to the movies and to dinner. As my guest. Really? Ask Father. He's right, Mary. <gasps> That's wonderful, because I was going to take Mother down to get that blouse, and now we can meet you right afterwards. Boy, there isn't anything Mother likes more than a party. Here's your dessert, Sam. Uh. If you want any cream, ask Henry for it. <laughs> but, Mother, that cream I drank was in a pitcher. Well, of course it was in a pitcher. Well, do you mind if I change the subject of cream just a second? Mm, to what? What are you doing Saturday night? Dear, I'm probably cooking dinner. You are? We're all going to meet downtown for something. For what? Don't tell her, Mary. Where shall we meet? At the Emporium Department Store at uh, 445. It's all set, 445. Well, that's going to make it terribly late for me to get home and cook dinner. Don't worry about cooking dinner, Mother. But what are we going to do? Gee whiz, you wait. You're going to have one of the swellest times you ever had in your life. <laughs> What is it, lady? Have you seen anyone waiting here at the entrance to the Emporium? No, ma'am. Not recently. Oh, thank you very much. Here it is, 12 minutes after 5. I don't mind waiting so much. I just keep wondering if they haven't been in an accident. Yes, ma'am. It's perfect the way it is. Would you like to buy some flowers, lady? No, thank you. Wouldn't you like to buy some carnations for Mother's Day? No, thank you. Well, you ought to remember your mother. That's the least anyone can do. Yes. Boy, boy, could I have a paper, please? Here you are. Oh, on what street does the family live? It's nobody in this town. Oh, then I won't need the paper. Extra paper, extra. Alice, Alice, why have you been waiting here at this entrance? Sam, where on earth do you think I'd wait? Well, I've been standing around the corner. But that's not the main entrance, Sam. Well, Alice, that is certainly the main entrance on that street. Well, at least you're safe. That's something. And the thing for us to worry about is my car. Well, what's happened to that? I left it 30 minutes ago in a 15-minute parking space. But that still isn't as important as Henry and Mary. Well, they're probably at the entrance all the way around on Market Street. Well, go around and look, Sam. Where will you be? I'll wait right here. I won't move one foot. Lady, like to buy a box of candy for Mother's Day? No, thank you. They're hand-dipped and cherry-filled. No, thank you. Like some hazelnuts? No, thank you. Fresh chocolates with cherries for your mother. Gee whiz, Mother, where have you been? Right here where I was supposed to be, Henry. Oldie. Imagine that. Where have you been? Just inside the door. Why, dear? Did you wait in there? But, Mother, I think the inside of a door would be the only logical place to wait for someone. Well, couldn't you have at least looked outside? I finally did, and there you were. <laughs> Where's Mary? I have no idea where she is. Well, where's Father? Your father's gone round to the Market Street entrance to see where you are. I? Why would he look for me there? Well, dear, you certainly weren't here, were you? Well, Mother, I was here. Yes. Oh, I don't mean to argue with you, but, but all that's been separating us is that door. Yes, Henry. Now, supposing you take this nickel and go inside and telephone and see whether Mary has left the house yet. Yes, Mother. Tell her the store closes at 5.30. Yes, Extra paper, young girl, disappear. Boris, Boris! Mother, am I terribly late? Where have you been, 
Mary. Joe Graham dropped in just as I was leaving. I thought he never would go. Yes, dear. Shall we go in and do our shopping? Well, not until Henry and your father get back. Where are they? Henry's phoning you, and your father's waiting for you around on Market Street. Well, isn't that ridiculous, Mother? It certainly is. What have we got to do now? Wait for them until I get back? I'm afraid we have, dear. Now, at least one other better. You stay right here while I go around and get your father. Can you find him? Well, of course I can find him. Now, don't move until I get back. No, Mother. Pardon me, sir. What do you have, lady? On um, what it would take me more than three minutes to run in and get one. As to that, I couldn't say. Oh, dear. I wonder where... Mary. Mary, where is your mother? Father, where did you come from? Where do you think I came from? Well, Mother just went around after you. Now, what did she do that for? So we wouldn't have to wait so long. Well, where's Henry? He's inside phoning me. What's that? Don't you think I ought to go in and tell him I'm here? You wait where you are. I'll go in. Yes, Father. Flowers. Flowers for Mother's Day. Fresh carnation. Mother, I'm going to need another nickel. Gee whiz, Mary, where's Mother? She's gone after Father. Where's Father? He thought you were phony. Yeah, but Mary, I couldn't get you. Of course you couldn't. I'll go get Father. How long will he be gone? Two minutes. And, oh, Kathleen phoned you at the house. What did she want? Henry, did you tell her you couldn't come to dinner? Sure I did. I left the message with the maid. Well, Kathleen's expecting you. Oh, gee whiz, she couldn't be. She's cherry-filled candies for Mother's Day. Listen, mister, are you going to be here for a few minutes? Uh, yeah. Well, could you deliver a message for me? If you see a lady or a man or my sister looking for a fellow in a brown suit like this, could you tell him that I just stopped in to phone a second? <laughs> Well, now, friends, while Henry is reflecting on his latest predicament, I'd like to bring you a news item about something that happened the other night in one of Centerville's finest families. The headline reads, Prominent Local Man Trapped in Raid. And the article goes on to read, Last night, about 11.30, one of Centerville's leading citizens was surprised by his wife just as he had tiptoed to the kitchen, raided the refrigerator, and finished eating a dish of pudding. Jello butterscotch pudding that had been left over from dinner. His wife was desolated, as she had been planning to eat the jello butterscotch pudding today for lunch. But the culprit showed no remorse. When questioned, he merely kept repeating, I'm glad I did it. Yes, and I do it again. I simply can't resist jello butterscotch pudding. Well, friends, seriously, that is just another way of saying that Jell-O butterscotch pudding is a dish that people won't be denied. Probably it has something to do with the grand, buttery, brown sugar flavor of this swell dessert. And the fact that Jell-O butterscotch pudding is as smooth as rich golden cream undoubtedly plays a big part in its appeal. At any rate, this mellow treat is a mealtime favorite in thousands of homes the country over. And I'm sure you'll find it your favorite, too. So try some real soon. You've honestly never tasted a more luscious dessert than Jell-O butterscotch pudding. Well, now, getting back to Henry Aldrich. Henry has just learned that although he's going out with his family, Kathleen is expecting him for dinner. This scene opens in Kathleen Anderson's home. you, Kathleen? Yes, Henry. Did Mary tell you we're having dinner at 7 instead of 6.30? Uh, didn't your maid tell you? I'm going out for dinner with my mother. Henry! Uh, do you think you'll understand, Kathleen? Do you have to go with your mother? I'm taking her. I'm her host. Oh. Uh, I'll tell you what I might try. Perhaps I could eat with her real fast, see, and then come up to your house. Well, wouldn't that make you late? Well, what's the latest I could get there and still eat? Well, uh... Well, I guess when you stop to think of it, Kathleen, maybe that would be trying to do too much. Kathleen? Who are you talking? Mother! Henry, hold the line! Mother, Henry can't come next Saturday night. Well, why not? He's having dinner with his mother. Why don't you ask both of them to come? Hmm? Are you sure next Saturday night will be all right? Oh, yes, of course. Hello, Henry! Yes? Henry, my mother says to bring your mother, too. Well, Kathleen... 
what will I do with my father and Mary? What? Well, hold the line just a second, Henry. Mother. Yes? Could we ask Mr. Aldridge and Mary, too? Well, as a matter of fact, I think we should have them. Hello, Henry. Well? Mother says to bring the whole family. Oh, Kathleen, I don't think you should go to all that trouble. No, really, Henry. Mother would be very much offended if you didn't. Well, they're waiting at the department store for me, I think. <laughs> if, if you don't hear from me, you'll know we're coming. All right. Do you understand about the time, Henry? Oh, sure. Seven o'clock. Goodbye, Kathleen. <laughs> What time is it? It's exactly 20 minutes past six. Did that man say how long it would be before Henry got back? No, dear. And where'd father go? Your father went down the street to get the car. That was 35 minutes ago. Would you like to have me go down and find him? No, dear. We're not going to break this family up again. Well, I'm awfully sorry the store closed before I could get your blouse. That's all right, dear. Just as long as we all finally get back together. It's starting to rain. Goodness. Yes, it's a good thing we didn't buy any new clothes. Yes, dear. Although, please remember, I still have on the best I own. Mother, step back into this entrance before you're drowned. Well, at least there's one consolation. Well, I'm glad you can see one. The restaurant we're going to after the movie serves a swell food. Mm. Look, look, there, Mary. There's your father. Let's run out and get in the car. Hurry up, Alice. Open the door, Sam. Get in, Mother. Now, where's Henry? We don't know, Sam. Well, get in anyhow. We can't go off and leave him. Mother, you're getting all wet. Sam, why did you suggest something? Certainly can't park here, Alice. Mother, why don't you and Father go ahead and I'll stay here? No, Mary, you get in and I'll stay. Both of you, get in. Father, can't you pull up closer to the curb and let that trolley go by? This is a narrow street, Mary. The only way that trolley can get around me is to go up on the sidewalk. I'll get in. Come on, Mary. Close the door. Yes, Sam. Oh, no, what do we do now? We've got to get out of here. Hey! Get moving there! Something the matter with the car, Sam? No, not at all. What is the trouble? Mary, must you just sit there and ask questions? Mary, no chocolate, the sister from other day. No, no, I do not want any Jerry no chocolate. Okay, okay. You better hurry up, Father. It is. Thank heaven for moving. Oh, Sam, stop! Now what's the matter? Here's Henry! Where? Under that newspaper! What? Father! Wait for me! Stop, Sam! I can't stop here! Goodbye, Father! Goodbye, everybody! Now here's a place I can pull in. Henry! Wait for me! Wait and wait until I tell you the good news. There's no time for good news. Get in the car. Couldn't. Could you move over, Mary? Henry, why didn't you leave that wet newspaper outside? Oh, gee whiz. Wait until I tell you the news. Henry, ordered you simply soaked to the skin. Mother, this is going to be a swell Mother's Day yet. We've all got an invitation to go to Kathleen's for dinner. Really, Henry? Sure. Henry ordered we couldn't have. But, Mother, I just got through talking with Kathleen. Henry, you're dripping water all over me. Well, I can't help where it runs, Mary. <laughs> the only thing I can do is sit still and let it go where it wants. How about it, Mother? Henry, they couldn't have asked us for tonight. Mother, Kathleen stood there by the phone and begged us to come tonight. What do you think, Sam? Don't leave it up to him, Mother. This is your party. Up to now, you haven't had a good time at all. But this way, you could have a wonderful evening. What are you going to do with all the money you save, Henry? I'm not going to save a cent, Mary. I've got it all figured out. I'm getting Mother a dress with my money. Well, Sam, pull up someplace, and I'll telephone and make sure. Mother, if you phone her, you'll only be wasting your nickel. Well, are we or aren't we going? What do you think, Sam? It's up to you, Alice. Mother, they always have awfully good food at the Anderson. Of course they do, dear. I love to go there. And there you are. Well, make up your mind, Alice. Sam, I don't... Look, like... Mother, how many Mother's Days are there in a year? One. Move on! Move on there! Yes, officer. We're just making up our minds. Well, I'd like to tell... Are Sam, you... Uh, you're going. <laughs> I guess, officer, we are. Hooray, right, Father. We're going to the Anderson. And boy, am I hungry. You're not any hungrier than I am. Oh, no, no, 
thank you. They're all wiped and put away. Anybody seen the evening paper? It's in the big chair, Father. Oh, I've been looking forward to just sitting around tonight. Robert, do you want Kathleen to go up and get your slippers? No, dear, I got them on. Uh, where did I put my necktie? Over on the land. Oh, yes, yes. I always did like this chair. Now, uh, Kathleen, I want you to go up and do your home. Now go up. My goodness. I... <laughs> oh, would you look at the dust on this keyboard? <laughs> You know, Robert, I'm glad we let that maid go. Uh, Robert. Well? Uh, look, dear, when the Aldriches come next Saturday, let's have everything just as nice as we know how. Mm-hmm, yep. Do it up brown. Oh, isn't it nice to have one evening at home? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, the Dodgers won today. <laughs> Did I hear the doorbell ring? Now, who in the world do you suppose that is? Well, it's probably Daniel. Well, I'm not going to answer the door. Well, I'm going to run upstairs. Now, listen, Dorothy. Daniel isn't going to notice those curlers. Oh, all right. I'll go to the door. Why don't you stop then? Well, now, where, where, where's my other slipper? It's way there underneath your chair. Oh, come in. Come in. The door's unlocked. Let him in and find your slipper later. Oh, look at the ashes all over my breast oh. here. Hello there, Mr. Anderson. Well, uh, hello. Hello, Bob. Well, well, uh, hello. Is this a terrible way for us to drop in? No, 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 not at all. Uh, the Aldrichers. Oh. oh, well, why don't you ask them to come in? They are in. <laughs> oh, hello there, Dorothy. Oh, well, Alice and Sam hello. and everyone. <laughs> How do you do, Mrs. Anderson? Well, uh, you might as well put your things down and let's all go into the living room. <laughs> living room? My goodness, Alice, I was just going upstairs to take these curlers off. Oh, Dorothy, you look lovely. Well, <laughs> Here we are. Aren't you glad now, Mother, we didn't go to the movies? Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, sit, sit down, everyone. <laughs> yeah, no mind if I do. Yes. Well, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, uh, how, uh, how, how's business, Sam? Oh, pretty good. How's yours? Fair. <laughs> well, uh, may I ask... I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I interrupt you, Sam? Uh, no, no, no. I, I interrupted you. Oh, no, you didn't. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, the fact is, I, I don't remember what I was going to say. Well, I was going to ask Alice what movie she was going to see. Stars for Love. Oh. Oh, my dear, they tell me that's the most beautiful picture. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Anderson, is, is Kathleen out in the kitchen sort of helping you? No, no, she's upstairs studying. Oh, is that right? Yes. Uh, uh, have a cigar, Sam? Oh, uh, no. No, thank you. Not just before... <laughs> no, dear. It's I, Kathleen. Oh, is that Henry? I'll be right down. Robert, would you mind opening the window just an inch or two? <laughs> You see, we had steak and onions for dinner, and I'm afraid the house will never be the same. Steak and onions? <laughs> do you like them, Henry? Oh, boy, do I. <laughs> Mother's very fond of them, too. <laughs> Alice, I want to show you something. This box Kathleen gave me for Mother's Day. Isn't that lovely? What is it, Mrs. Anderson? Well, I have no idea, Mary. Looks like candy to me. Well, if it is, I should never have promised Kathleen I wouldn't open it till tomorrow. You did promise her? <laughs> Mother, could you come upstairs and help me a minute? Alice, would you excuse me? Of course. Well, if you'll pardon me, I, I'll go out to the kitchen and see whether we have any ginger ale in the ice box. Oh, Bob, don't bother. We just had dinner. Father. Mary, supposing he could hear you. Well, Henry, so we were invited here for dinner. Someplace there's been a very serious mistake. 
I should be putting it mildly. Ben, this is the most embarrassing moment I've ever had. The thing for us to do is to get out of here. Well, I think we should stay long enough to be polite. Stay, Mother, as hungry as I am? You're not any hungrier than the rest of us, Henry. All I had for lunch was a cup of tea. Then I didn't have anything. Supposing, Alice, we run on before they discover the mistake we've made. Well, Father... Father, do you mind if I make a suggestion? I I do. Alice, we'll tell them we're sorry, but we're going to run on to the movies, and as soon as we get away, we'll go get some dinner. I have a sort of an apology to make to you folks, I'm afraid. Oh, what's the trouble, Bob? Well, here's the ginger ale, but we don't have any ice. <laughs> now, now, listen, Bob, I give you my word, not one of us could drink a thing. And besides, we're, we're going to have to run a little... I'm afraid it is, dear. Uh, the fact is, Dorothy, uh, tomorrow being Mother's Day, we told Alice we were coming here, but we're really taking her to the movies. Oh, well, well isn't that lovely? Yeah. <laughs> Bob, why don't you and I get on our things and go along with them? <laughs> Good idea. And we'll make it an evening together. But, but Mrs. Anderson, uh, let me explain something. Henry? But Mother... Henry! Yes, Mother. Mrs. Anderson, we'd be very glad to have you come along. Oh, wasn't that the best picture, Alice, you ever saw in all your life? Yes, Dorothy, and it's been the best Mother's Day party I ever had in my life. Would you like another hamburger, Mother? No, thank you. Three is all I could possibly eat. Father? Uh, yes, Henry, just two more. My Henry, this was the smartest idea of yours that we drop into this little hamburger stand. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Anderson. I haven't been in one of these places in years. I love them. Sam and I used to drop in all the time. Oh, mister, may I have the check, please? Oh, now, Henry, I, I'll pay the check. The movies were on you. But, Mr. Anderson, this whole evening has been on me. <laughs> yes, Henry, it certainly has. <laughs> Henry Aldrich will be back in just a moment. Friends, the next time that you want to give a party, there's no need to send out invitations. You just drop the word here and there that you're planning to make some Jell-O pudding whip. And before you can say come in, you'll have a house full of smiling guests. Yes, this swell new dessert has certainly become a big favorite, and there's every reason why it should. Because Jell-O pudding whip is wonderfully good and downright easy to make. You just take one package of Jell-O, any flavor and one package of Jell-O vanilla pudding, and make them up as you usually do. Then chill the Jell-O and whip it as directed on the box. Next, you chill the Jell-O vanilla pudding and add it to the whipped Jell-O, beating constantly until it's blended. Then mold. And there you have a grand, inexpensive treat, serving 10 to 12 people and simply ideal for parties and special occasions. So be sure to try this new and intriguing combination of delicious Jell-O and rich, creamy Jell-O vanilla pudding. Ladies and gentlemen, this week is National Restaurant Week. Now why not take the occasion to dine out at your favorite restaurant and climax that dinner pleasantly by choosing the most popular dessert on the menu, Jell-O Pudding. Father, do you see this dime bank I have? I do, Henry. Well, I'm going to start a savings fund. Well, I'm delighted to hear you say that. Uh, here. Here is your first dime to put in it. Thank you. You know what I'm going to save toward? What? A, fa- a party on Father's Day. May I have that dime back, please? <laughs> Family, starring as the stone, is written by Clifford Goldsmith. Original music is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. This is Harry Von Zell speaking and wishing you good night for the puddings that are tops in taste.
We present My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denny. the story of Mr. and Mrs. Cougar, the record of a happy marriage. Two people who live together and like it. The comfortable front bedroom of the comfortable suburban home of the Cougats doesn't look very comfortable this morning. Articles of clothing are strewn about the floor and across the bed. George hurriedly plows through the debris getting dressed while Liz tries to cram all of their things into three suitcases. Liz, dear, what's all this stuff you're packing? We're only spending the weekend at your mother's, not the whole summer. Well, I'm only taking the bare necessities. Slacks, sunsuit, a few dresses, shoes, cosmetics, hose, undies. Mm, Well, what have you packed for me? Your toothbrush and trunks. (laughs) Is that all? I want you to get a good tan. Pack some clothes for me, Scatterbrain. I wish you were driving out to Mother's with me, George. No, it's impossible, darling. Can't miss my board meeting. I wonder what the surprise can be that Mother's been telling us about. Hmm, I'm afraid to guess. Her last surprise was the wrestler she was sponsoring. Remember? Mm -hmm. He called himself the Hawk. (laughs) Oh, what a wrestler. Yeah, in his first match, the Hawk flew clear out of the ring. Well, if she has another wrestler, I'll just throw him out of the house. Evidently, you've never heard of Gorgeous George. You are Gorgeous George. Finish your packing. (laughs) Where's my new bathing suit? I can't find it. Your new bathing suit? Well, maybe a moth had a spare second and ate it. Here it is, and it isn't that skimpy. It's shameful. You're too prudish. You're too (laughs) nudish. You should see Alice Sturm's bathing suit. She got arrested at the beach. Hmm, must be... Pretty bad. Oh, it was. But they couldn't prosecute. Why not? No evidence. (laughs) Mm, Which nightgown should I take? My canary yellow or my parrot green? Mm, What about your goose chartreuse? (laughs) Well, got to run now, honey. See you tonight. Drive carefully. George Cougar, don't you criticize my driving. I'm a good driver. Sure, honey. You've never driven up a telephone pole. Of course not. Anyway, not to the top. Ha, ha, very funny. I read in a magazine the more accidents were caused by men than by women. Yeah? When did you read that? The other day while I was driving downtown. <laughs> Mother! Oh, Liz, darling! Mother, you look <laughs> marvelous, so young and healthy. Oh, it's just country life, dear. I found there's nothing better than fresh milk and clean soil. Well, it's certainly done a lot for you. <laughs> yes. Makes a wonderful mud pack. Oh. Uh, where's George? Well, he had to attend the board of directors meeting. He'll be up later. Oh, they're having him during the day now. That's nice. Your father always had to go to the board meetings at night. At night? Oh, yes, poor dear. Tell me, are they still holding them at the Whoopie Club? <laughs> No, Mother. Now the bubble dancer comes to the bank. Oh. <laughs> Mom, what's this big surprise of yours? I've been wondering about it all the way up here. Oh, well, see if you can guess. Well, some of the things you do, Mother, I'm almost afraid to guess. Oh. Let's see now. Pole vaulting? No. Motorcycle hill climbing? No, 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 no. Sky riding? Oh, no. You're way off. Well, I'll have to think of something a little more sensible. But this is very sensible. Uh, Chickasaw Indian tap dancing. Oh, Liz, really? I... A Chickasaw Indian tap dancing? Oh, I wonder if they teach that at Arthur Murray. Now, we're not talking about Arthur Murray. <laughs> What's your surprise? Well, uh, you, you'd better sit down. I don't need to sit down. What is it? I'm going to get married. Well, I see you decided to sit down. <laughs> I always do when my knees buckle. You, you seem so surprised, dear. I, I suppose you thought that I, I was too old to get a husband. I thought no such thing. You're very beautiful. Oh, I do have a few wrinkles, though. Oh. Of course, just on the outside. That's right, Mother. <laughs> and they're just happy little crow's feet. 
Oh, oh, I know you're going to love your new father, Liz. So tell me all about him. Who is he? Where'd you meet him? What's he like? His name is Daniel Carson, and I met him in Houston. Oh, he's a real Texan, Liz. He's just like Gary Cooper. Not quite that tall, of course, and, and, and a little older, and, and he wears bifocals. Oh, but he's just like Gary Cooper. <laughs> well, they're, they're both men. <laughs> Well, he sounds grand, darling. How'd you meet him? I, I was walking past the theater, and as he rushed up to buy his ticket, he knocked me down. Uh, he was in quite a hurry. It, it was a Randolph Scott picture. He really did sweep you off your feet. Skin both my elbows. <laughs> he, he apologized, and he asked me to see the picture with him. But, of course, a young girl couldn't accept an invitation from a man she, she didn't know. <laughs> Of course not. Uh, but I'm not a young girl, so I accept it. <laughs> Mother, hmm? do you suppose this man could be after your money? Not that you aren't beautiful. Oh, no, 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 dear. He's quite wealthy himself. He owns several oil fields. Oh, he has a huge ranch, factories, and... Uh, oh, dear. What's wrong, Mother? You don't suppose I'm after his money, do you? <laughs> See, no. You were in Houston last April. Have you been engaged all this time without telling us? Oh, no, no, dear. Dan and I have been corresponding, and, and it just happened. He asked me in his last letter. What did he say? Dan isn't a man of many words, dear. He... Well, here's his letter. You read it. <laughs> My dear Louise. Howdy. <laughs> Love, Dan. <laughs> P.S. Will you marry me? Oh, I, I've read it over and over again. I almost know it by heart. <laughs> oh, you know, he, he's coming in on the five o'clock train, Liz. And he, he, I've made all the arrangements for the church. Now, just a minute, Mother. Before you go any further, I think we'd better have a little talk. A talk? Well, what about, dear? Well, Mother, you're getting married, and I think there are a few things that you should know. Oh, Liz, dear. Yes, yes. <laughs> Don't you remember ten years ago when you were going to get married? Didn't I take you into the parlor for a little talk? Yes. Well, I haven't forgotten any of the things you told me. <laughs> oh, dear, I, I thought little Susan Palmer could be the flower girl, and, and maybe George could be the best man. Oh, <laughs> Liz, dear, what's wrong? I'm just so happy for you. Well, then, then why are you crying? Well, you cried when I married George. Well, well, that was different, dear. Oh, mother. My little mother. Oh, Liz. <laughs> Liz, darling, please don't cry. Oh, mother, I can't help it. You'll understand someday when you have one of your own. <laughs> Come on, give me a kiss. Kiss, kiss, kiss. I want a kiss. Give me a kiss. What's the matter? I never board a train when it's moving. Well, it's standing in the station now, ready for refiring. <laughs> Nuts. Hmm. Okay, conductor? Mm-hmm. Steam's way up. Careful you don't burst your boiler. When there's any danger, the whistle blows. Kiss me again. Watch out, George. Uh, can I carry your bags, ma'am? <laughs> oh, George, wait till I tell you about the about Mother's secret. Yeah, what is it? I can't tell you. It's a secret. Liz. George, a secret's only a secret if it's kept a secret. You know about the whispering grass. The grass told it to the trees, and the, the trees told it to the breeze. You understand, George? Yes, very clear. Your mother's been out in the grass whispering to trees. <laughs> Forget about it, darling. You'll find out. Better get dressed for dinner. Won't tell me, huh? Uh-uh. All right. You have your secrets. I have mine. <laughs> I just thought of something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are you laughing about? 
Nothing, but if you're going crazy, I want to go with you. I'm not going crazy, Liz. I was just thinking about the time I took Myra Ponsonby on the hayride. <laughs> You've always wanted to hear what happened. <laughs> You're not going to get me to tell you Mother's secret that way. No, of course not. Forget it, dear. <laughs> you think you're pretty sly. Who cares what happened when you went on the hayride with Myra? What could happen on a hayride? <laughs> you're just trying to arouse my curiosity, but it won't work. I've gone on hayrides, lots of hayrides. They were all in the spirit of good fun. We'd go down some dark, lonely country road, stop the wagon. Some of the couples would go blackberry picking. We'd just sit there in the hay and... George Cougar, what happened on that hayride? It's a secret, remember? The grass? The heck with the grass. What about the hay? Well, you tell me your secret, and I'll tell you my secret. All right, Mother's getting married. Now what... George, what happened? I bet the stem off my pipe. Your mother's what? Getting married. Now, what happened on the hayride? Oh, Jimmy Paterno dropped his cigar and we had a weenie bake instead. <laughs> now, Liz, now, now, what's this business about your mother getting married? Well, we're going to meet her fiancé tonight. Mother met him in April. They've been corresponding, and in his last letter, he proposed. Hmm. Where'd your mother meet him? In Houston, in front of a theater. You mean he picked her up? He knocked her down first. <laughs> now, hurry and get dressed, George. We want to look nice when we meet him. All right, but I wish your mother had consulted me first. I might have refused his proposal. I should hope so. You're already married. <laughs> mother, mother, sit down and relax. Oh, oh, I, I can't, Liz. Dan will be here any minute. <laughs> now, you've got to calm down, Mrs. Elliot. Yes. I remember how nervous I was when Liz and I got married, but... I had a simple formula for overcoming it. Oh, well, what was it? He fainted. <laughs> I didn't faint. I just relaxed. All of a sudden. Oh, oh I, I'm so nervous. I, I haven't been this upset since the day my scales were broken, and I thought I'd gained 200 pounds. <laughs> There's your man, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, 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 now, 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 don't all of you stare at me. <laughs> I'll let him in. Hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, Dan. Uh, will you come in? Reckon I will. <laughs> uh, are you embarrassed, Dan? Nope. Well, reckon I'll be going now. <laughs> Dan, you, you just arrived. Well, <laughs> just don't know what to say, Louise. I ain't a man of many words. Had me a long-winded speech wrote down on the back of a cigarette paper. Forgotten smoking. Well. Yeah. <clears throat> Mother. Oh. oh, Liz, dear, I'm sorry. Well, I guess we kind of forgot our manners, Louise, standing here chattering like a couple of blue jays. Yes. Uh, oh, Dan, Dan, this is my daughter, Elizabeth. Hello, Mr. Carson. Hmm. Even prettier than the picture your mama sent me. Mother sent you my picture? Yep. Laying on a blanket, taking your bottle. <laughs> well, I've changed quite a bit since then. Yeah. You're a lot longer now. <laughs> Got a little more hair, too. Well, when I was a baby, I used to wear my hair very close to my head, under the skin. I'm uh, George Cougat, Liz's husband. How do you do, Mr. Carson? Well, hiya, George. Say, I like the way you shake hands real tight, like you mean it. Oh, uh, you you have quite a grip yourself. Yeah, I hate wishy-washy shake. Like to feel a friendship there. Ain't never forgot Herb Jackson, the friendliest feller I ever met. Broke seven bones in my hand. <laughs> You'll be having dinner in a moment, Dan. Uh, would you care to go upstairs and wash? No. Took care of it before I left Houston. <laughs> well, I'd better wash. I've never been to Houston. Uh, I got a little surprise for you, Louise. Oh, a surprise, Dan. But what is it? Oh, it's coming later. Well, I guess I'm ready for Chuck now. Chuck, Mr. Carson? Yeah, that's what we call dinner in Texas, Lizzie. 
What about late at night when you go down to the icebox and sneak a snack? What do you call that? Snap. <laughs> your dinner, Mr. Carson? Oh, I reckon it did, George. It's mighty fine grub. Grub? What's grub? Chuck. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for that surprise, Dad. Well, it ought to be here in a little while, Louise. Mr. Carson, uh, I understand you have some oil property in Texas. Yeah, yeah. It was originally my granddaddy's. He got it from some Indians. Swapped them for it. Swapped them for oil property? What did he give them? Colored beads, bits of cloth, fire water? No, $650,000. <laughs> did you ever meet an Indian, Mr. Carson? Yeah, Lizzie. Sorry I did, too. Oh, did you have trouble with him? Uh, kind of. Did you kill him? Nope. Did you hurt him? Kind of. With a gun? Nope. Backed over him in a gas station. <laughs> Mr. Carson, uh, I understand along with your oil properties, you have quite a ranch, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got me a nice big ranch. Oh. Ain't it, Louise? It's really tremendous. What do you call your ranch, Mr. Carson? Dallas. <laughs> well, uh, what about my surprise, Dad? Well, it ought to be here any minute, Louise. Let's see. Well, this is sure going to be a fine wedding. A pretty bride. Is... <laughs> and you'll be a rather handsome groom yourself, Dan. <laughs> well, I went to a lot of trouble for the ceremony. Spent all day yesterday at the chiropractor's having my legs straightened out. <laughs> <laughs> you should have kept your pants on. They're still bow-legged. <laughs> Tell me, uh, do you have a horse, Mr. Carson? Oh, now there's something that I like to talk about. You bet I got me a horse. His name is Shotgun. Shotgun? Do you feed him or load him? Oh, he's a good old horse. Had him for 18 years. Showing his age a little. Graying around the tail. Oh, now that's nice. I think a gray tail makes a horse look distinguished. As I always say, an old horse is just as good as a new horse. I've never heard you say that, George. Well, you've never been around while I was talking to an old horse. Oh. <laughs> Why don't we all go out on the porch and... Oh, I reckon that's your surprise now, Louise. Excuse me. Oh, what do you suppose that silly boy's gotten me? Mother, you're holding that third finger out too conspicuously. Well, well, uh, here's your surprise, Louise. Come on in, Slim. Drinking some Texas, everybody. Gee, ho. Slim with old saddle buddy, Louise. He's going to be our best man. Dan, you old horn swaddle son of a rattlesnake. Slim, you old saddle sore mule buster. You old leather eating coyote. You old thieving noose dodger. You old horn toad. You old sippy cat. You old prairie dog. You old. You. <laughs> Dan, uh, he's going to be our best man. Yeah, some surprise, huh, Lou? Uh, Slim, this year is Louie. So that's her. Well, dog gone. Twang my banjo, bust my bridges, dog gone. Go darn, ding dong, darn, Dan. Slim says he likes your figure, Lou. <laughs> oh, mother's always had nice gal darns. Oh. <laughs> a little gal darn, some I brung you, Miss Lou. For when you and old ding dong Dan set up gal darn housekeeping, dog gone. Oh, oh, so. Uh, how nice. Aren't they, Liz? Oh, yes. Look, George. A set. Hers and hisn. <laughs> I'll be right back, Liz. I think we're going to need some smelling salts. I heard that. If you don't like my vapor, just open some windows. Dog gone, Dan. Who's the strawberry rose? Oh, this is my daughter, Lizzie. God, darn it, she's pretty. A ding dong redhead, too. Makes me want to kick off my boots and jump smack dab barefoot into a doggone tub of salt alley. <laughs> Bust my britches. Bust my britches. Bend over. Told <laughs> so, Dan, I just can't wait no longer. I've got a doll darn surprise for you outside. Music for your wedding. <laughs> 
Music, Dad? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Oh, I mean, just a doggone minute. Oh, Slim, you brought the sons of the thing in a sagebrush. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Slim say about music for our wedding? Oh, I know they ain't the best, Miss Lou, but Spade truly weren't available. Oh, there ain't no finer music in the sons of the singing sagebrush. Sing some of that by wedding music firm, sons. I'm ahead for the last round of... <laughs> oh, horse, make up your mind. do 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 Mr. Carson. Have you ever thought that Mrs. Elliot may have other plans for the music at her wedding? Uh, Lou? Why, Lou is loco about the sons, ain't you, Lou? Uh, well, Dan, uh, they were all right when we went to the barn dance in San Antonio, but I, I had planned on other music for the wedding, and I, I more or less thought that George could be the best man. Oh, I'm being the best man. I, who's George? I'm George. Now, ah, look at here, George. Shoot him, Slim. <laughs> <laughs> George is going to be the best man, aren't you, George? I say I'm going to be the best man. What do you say, George? Well, Liz, I think Slim really has his heart set on it. Is this going to be a wedding, or is this going to be a wedding? That's a very good question. Well, let me hear some more of that wedding music, son. Oh, promise me that someday you and I will take our love together to some sky. Wahoo! Son! Oh, shut up! Shoot him, Slim! Shotgun sure would love this. George, where are the bloody How's your mother, dear? Doctor says she'll be all right. All she needs is quiet. Fine. I got a room in town for the surging sons of the screaming sage. <laughs> Did they mind leaving? Yes, I think they were a little hurt. As they walked away, they were singing something called, I don't think they like us here and I wish we were back in Texas blues. <laughs> Poor mother. The way she tried to smile when Slim brought in that box of dirt so their marriage could be held on Texas soil. I can see the write-up of the wedding in the paper. To the soft strains of Beat My Desert Doggy Ate to the Bar, <laughs> Louise Elliott and Daniel Carson were married. On the altar, campfires blazed brightly. And the highlight of the affair was when the bride threw her bouquet of cactus and pin three flower girls to the parson. <laughs> I won't let your mother go through with it, Liz. Well, Mother confided in me, George. She doesn't want to go through with it. She doesn't? No. But unless Mr. Carson leaves, she'll have to marry him. Oh, fine. Well, what could possibly make Mr. Car Carson leave? Who is it? It's me. It's Dad. Well, speak of the Carson. Hello, Liz. George. Why, Mr. Carson, you look so sad. Well, I can't help it, Lizzie. It's a terrible thing that's happened. Terrible thing. Oh, Mother's going to be all right, Mr. Carson. Don't worry. It ain't your mother. Shotgun's down with a hoof and mouth disease. Shotgun? You're more worried about your horse than Mrs. Elliot? Well, I reckon I'd be pretty worried about her, too, if she had hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> Poor old shotgun. I just got a phone call about him from a Western Union office. I got to go to shotgun. You aren't leaving? Yeah, reckon so. But I'll always remember Louise. I'm gonna keep the picture I got of her. And I'd be obliged if if she'd keep my box of dirt. <laughs> well, I'm sure she will, Mr. Carson. Well, goodbye, Liz. Bye, George. Goodbye, Mr. Carson. Uh, don't bother to shake. I'll just slam the door on my hand. <laughs> Goodbye, and I hope Shotgun gets his hoof out of his mouth. <laughs> Liz, he's gone. And Mother has a box of dirt. 
Uh, what'll she do with it? Oh, it'll make nice Christmas presents for people who don't have dirt. <laughs> Darling, he's gone, but let's not make light of it. He was a nice old guy. Yeah. You don't have anything against him, do you? Why, certainly not, George. I hope his horse will be all right. It'd be a shame if Shotgun popped off before he got back. <laughs> Liz, I can't get over the coincidence of this thing. Here we're sitting in our room, and you're saying how nice it would be if Mr. Carson left. Yeah. In walks Mr. Carson. Had a phone call from Western Union, and he's leaving. Positively amazing. Well, I guess we can go break the news to your mother. She already knows about it. What? I made the phone call from her room. Liz. Want to send you... a telegram? <laughs> Why not? I keep lying here waiting for you to say, George, are you asleep? <laughs> Do you love me, George? Madly. Would you swim oceans to be at my side? I'd swim oceans to be at your side. Would you climb mountains to be at my side? I'd climb mountains to be at your side. Would you get up and get me a glass of water? <laughs> no. Why not? I'm pooped from climbing those mountains and swimming those oceans. Please get me a glass of water, George. All right. Hmm. What smells so good? I left the top off my taboo. Hmm. I thought it was night-blooming jasmine. Why does jasmine only bloom at night? Oh, they have a very strong union. I love you, George. I love you, too. Remember, I want cold water. That's the left faucet. Yes, Liz, the left faucet. Oh, George, I've changed my mind. I'd like a Coke instead. Okay. Which faucet is the Coke? <laughs> oh, never mind. You'd have to go downstairs. I don't want you to leave me. I'll take water. Here you are, darling. Thanks. Little cuddle puddle. You're welcome. A little drip. <laughs> Good night, honey. Good night, dear. <laughs> What's the matter, Liz? You got a feather leak in your pillow? <laughs> no. I was just thinking that I'm pretty clever. Today I figured out a way to make someone not marry someone. And if I wanted to, I could scheme a way to make someone marry someone. You really think you could? Mm-hmm. I did it once. You schemed a way to make someone marry someone? Yes. Who? Good night, George. favorite husband has been presented through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
The National Broadcasting Company presents Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 12. Tonight, a first play by a new author, Mother, written by Stanley Robert Mednick, a most talented young American for whom we forecast, and he'd better not disappoint us, a brilliant future. With the production directed by Harry W. Junkin, here is Stanley Robert Mednick's first radio play, Mother. Attraction 12 on Radio City Playhouse. It's 7 o'clock on New Year's Eve in New York, the most exciting night of the year in the world's most exciting town. The offices in the RCA building are still brightly lit. The restaurants and bars are crowded. There are parties everywhere, although some of them show signs of breaking up. Everybody's having a wonderful time. Everybody except Mary Adams. Mary is 30, and she never seems to have a really good time. And she's just a little bit shy, too shy for her own good. Come on, Sylvia. Let's go. It's 7 o'clock. Okay, Mary, but it's a wonderful party. Well, are you coming or not? <laughs> Look at those guys. Aren't they a scream? <laughs> yes. Yes, sure. The scream? They're drunk. All drunk. It's disgusting. I'm glad I'm not like them. Getting drunk just because one rotten year is ending and another beginning. Well, what? For Pete's sake, Mary, you've been asking me to leave for an hour, and now you're standing there gawking. Do you want me to walk to the subway with you or not? I, I don't... Well, yes. <laughs> yes, sure. Oh, I don't want to walk to the subway with her. All she'll do is tell me about the date she's having tonight, how handsome he is, how he dances so well, and I'm not interested. Actually, they go to a dive to have dinner. Then they go dancing with hundreds of people coughing smoke in their faces. And then they come home dead drunk and say they had a wonderful time. Well, what are we waiting for? You look a little funny, Mary. Is anything wrong? No. Nothing's the matter. For a minute, I thought you were sick or something. Uh, I'm fine. Shall we go? Sure. <laughs> Why am I walking with her? Why didn't I tell her I had some last-minute shopping to do? Now she's going to boast. Boast and boast like all of them. Isn't this crazy, Sylvia? Raining in New York City on New Year's Eve? Yeah, yeah, it is. But I'm still going to have fun. Are you going with me? No, I'm not. I'm going to spend a quiet evening at home. Oh. Oh, what? Nothing. I was just thinking. <laughs> But I know what she was thinking. She was thinking about me not going anyplace tonight. She's probably glad, too. I know that type. Oh, why should I bother? After all, I must stay home tonight. It isn't right to keep an invalid mother home alone, especially on New Year's Eve when there are drunks all over. Mother would be very unhappy and frightened if I didn't stay home with her. Here's the subway. Coming down. As a matter of fact, no. I just remember I have to get something down the street. Oh, I'll wait for you. Oh, no, you don't have to. It'll take some time. You better go on ahead of me. Uh, I'll see you later in the week. Okay, Barry. Good night. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. There, I'm rid of her. Thank heaven. Now I'll wait here for a few minutes till I'm sure her train is gone. Then I'll go down. Why didn't I go with her on that train? I was afraid, that's why, and jealous. Afraid she'd talk about her date and jealous because I've never had one. Oh, I must get this silly talk out of my head. I know very well the only reason I haven't had a date is because I haven't had time for any. But with Mother ill for as long as I can remember in my job and all, let the others waste their time on dates. I'll take care of my mother. Oh, 
Well, I suppose your train has left. I can go down now. Uh, excuse me, miss. Oh, you startled me. Oh, what does a strange man want with me? He looks odd. I must get away from him. I must. I'll run down the subway steps. There are people there. He can't try anything if there are people around. What do you want? Uh, I'm a stranger here, miss, and I, I was wondering if you could direct me to Fifth Avenue. Three blocks west. <laughs> Is that all? Uh, that's all. <laughs> well, thank you. you. You're welcome. Well, I've told him what he wanted to know. Why doesn't he leave? Why is he just standing there? If, if he thinks he's going to make time with me. Is there something else? Uh, well, miss. Yes? I I'm a stranger here. Oh, he already told me that. Why is he stalling? Why? I know. He thinks I'm a cheap pickup. That's what he thinks. Well, he's greatly mistaken. And let him make just one, just one sassy remark, and I'll scream for a cop. I know these types prowling around for help this morning. He's probably drunk. You say you're a stranger here? Yes. I, I realize this may sound sort of queer, but since I know absolutely nobody in New York, I was thinking, well, that is... Well, I hope you don't think I'm trying to be fresh, but... Well, it's this way. Are you busy tonight? Busy tonight? Why, uh... I've got my I... umbrella handy. I'll call a cop. I'll scream. I'll yell. I'll hit him. Imagine saying that to me. To me. Mother will be furious when she hears this. She always tells me not to wear red. People think the wrong things. Like this prowling bum. Am I busy tonight? Yes. Well, I, I, I'm... Well, I am busy. I am busy. I have to stay home with my mother. Well, I've got to tell him I just can't stand here gaping. I can't say I'm not busy. You want me to go with him. I don't want to go with him. Do I? Maybe I do. But he may murder me for all I know. I wonder if he would... No. He looks nice. He looks harmless. I've got to say something for heaven's sakes, but what will I say? I'll say I have to go home to my sick mother. But I don't want to. I don't. I want to go with this man. <gasps> I have all things to think. I'm behaving like a... Like a... I just can't go with him. Mother is home ill. As a matter of fact, I'm not busy tonight. Oh, wonderful. Do you think you'd mind having a bite with me and then maybe go dancing? But I don't know you. Oh, I can fix that. My name's Harry. Harry Wilson. <sighs> I come from Cleveland, Ohio, work in an office there. I'm 33 years old, live with my parents when I'm home, and I'm not married. Now tell me, what's your name? Mary. Mary Adams. Oh, I shouldn't have told him. Now he won't leave me alone. I don't care. He's a nice, friendly man. He's lonely. He's just looking for a companion. I'll go with him. I have nothing to lose. Of course I'll go with him. I deserve a good time. I'll leave Mother alone for once. Fifteen years I've spent New Year's Eve at home with Mother. Oh, but Mother needs me. She's sick. So what? She's sick. She's made me sick fifteen years nagging, yelling, preaching. It's because of her that I'm an old maid. Oh, I've got to get these thoughts out of my head. Mother is the loveliest lady in the world. I love her deeply. She always sacrificed so much for me. And I think of leaving her alone on New Year's Eve. I can't go with this gentleman. I can't. I can't. Mary Adams. Just plain Mary. Mary? That's a wonderful name. Well, now that we know each other, is it okay? Well, I can't go. A well-brought-up lady doesn't allow herself to be picked up at night by strangers, even by nice, harmless-looking strangers. Well, uh, yes, I will go with you. Well. No, I've done it. I've consented. Now I have to go with him. So what? So I'll go with him, and I'll have a wonderful time. I'll enjoy myself on New Year's Eve for a change. I'll have a good time for once in my boring life. But I better call Mother. She'll worry otherwise. And I'll stop at a drugstore and call her. Oh, maybe I better not. She'll yell at me and rant. She'll tell me all sorts of things. Now well, she'll tell me I'll be the death of her yet. I won't call her. Oh, but I must. She'll think I was run over. She has enough worries. I don't want to add to them, but if I do phone, she'll insist I come home. I won't call her. I don't care what worries she has. She certainly gives me enough. 
<laughs> Harry, I have a funny feeling this is going to be a wonderful night. <laughs> I like that music. Do you? Very much. You no, know, it reminds me of years ago, way before the war. I was in college then. We used to have music like that at all our dances. What were you studying at college? Medicine. Uh, then you're a doctor. Oh, no, I'm not. You see, things sort of interrupted my plan. <laughs> what things? Well, war came along, and when that was over, I didn't feel like spending six or seven years more in school. And what do you do in Cleveland? I work in the office of a department store. <gasps> not very exciting, but I managed to live. And every so often, I get a few days off, and I travel around. That's how I happen to come to New York. Oh, I see. Oh, he is a nice fellow. I'm awfully glad I came. Mother would like him, too. Why don't I invite him to the house for dinner some night? No, I better not. After all, the only reason he took me out was because he had no one else. I'm sure he wouldn't want to see me after this. Why should he? I'm no raving beauty. He's only seen me at night under lights. I look different in daylight. What were you thinking of, Mary? Uh, thinking? Uh -huh. Why, well, it wasn't anything. I, I was just wondering if you were engaged. Oh. Now, why did I have to say that? What difference does it make? And he says, yes, I'll be disillusioned all evening. Oh, I ought to be shot. I don't mean to, to snoop by asking if you were engaged. Oh, no, I'm not engaged. I was before the war, but things didn't pan out. She's married now to a garage mechanic in Los Angeles. Very happy, too, I hear. Uh, are, are you attached to anybody in particular? Me? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no. Hmm. He just asked that to be polite. He knows inwardly that no man would look twice at me. He's a very kind man, but I wish he wouldn't pity me. I don't like people to pity me. I know now. He only asked me to go out with him because I looked lonely at the subway. Oh, now, that's a silly thought. He asked me to go out because he wanted to. No man out of pity asks a strange girl for a date, especially on New Year's Eve. Oh, no. I'm not attached to anybody. Well, were you ever engaged? Oh, yes. When I graduated from high school, I went with a fellow for a few months. Then I found he wasn't exactly my type. I lied. I lied like Sylvia and the rest of them just to make an impression on a silly man. Mother would be furious if she knew. Mother's always furious. Well, so I did lie. I didn't hurt anybody, at least. He, he, he wasn't my type at all. Well, at any rate, you don't have to worry. I bet a hundred fellows bother you a week. Well, not exactly. You see, I have an invalid mother. She takes up most of my spare time. I don't usually have time for such things as dates. Oh, that's too bad. Ladies and gentlemen, in five minutes, the new year will be ushered in. And we're going to play all Lang Syne. Now, until then, we'd like all of you to come out on the dance floor so we can all celebrate the wonderful new year together. Shall we dance, Mary? I don't dance well, Harry. <laughs> Neither do I. But at least we'll be better than being the only ones at a table. Okay. But I warn you. <laughs> it's almost midnight. Yes. Yes. And I always feel kind of sad on New Year's. It brings back so many memories. For me, too. For me, too. Memories of sitting next to a radio, hearing the crowds in Times Square yelling their heads off while Mother told me not to listen to such drivel. Memories. What memories does it bring back for you, Harry? Oh, all sorts. Mainly about Leela. Who's Leela? The girl I was engaged to. <laughs> she was a sweet kid. But you said things didn't pan out. No, they didn't. Oh, you know, she wanted to run around when I wanted to stay home. She wanted me to go into business. I didn't. I wanted to live one place, she another. But I remember her. Well, if you were engaged to her, why not? Oh, remember her. Sure, he remembers her. <laughs> He's probably married to her. Probably has four kids or something. He's just stringing me along. One at a date for New Year's that makes up some silly lies about his being a stranger in New York, not knowing anybody. I bet he lives in New York. He thinks I'm a pickup. That's what he thinks. I was crazy to go with him. I'm so ashamed of what Mother will think. Well, it's, it's still not too late. I'll go home. I'll make some excuse. I'll say, it's all been very nice, but I really have to get home. <laughs> Mary, would you mind? Would I 
mind? He wants to kiss me. I mustn't let him. It's not right. Think of Mother. She wouldn't like it. No. No, no, no. I mustn't kiss him. I mustn't. I mustn't. I wouldn't mind, Harry. You're an awfully lovely girl, Mary. <laughs> oh, it's... Uh, Mary, what's happening? Why are you crying? Oh, I always get sentimental on New Year's Eve. There's really <laughs> nothing. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> Happy New Year, Harry. <laughs> I do wish the band would stop playing that song. Uh, don't you like it? Usually, yes. But right now, I want something light and gay. Something bouncing. To fit your mood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, you know, it's absolutely amazing. What is it? You. Oh. An hour ago, you were nervous and jumpy. Every few seconds, you seem a million miles away. And now? Now you're somehow changed. I don't know. You're you're suddenly bubbling. Why, even your eyes are glittering. It's just fancy lighting the heavier. It's not the lighting. Okay. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Oh, that's the first real compliment I've ever had. Oh, he is nice. And what if he is married or engaged? He's mine for now, and nothing else matters. What about later? I'll never see him again, and that will make me feel even worse. No, I won't think about it. I'm having fun, really, I am. I'll worry about later, later. Hey, Mary. Hmm? You're a million miles away again. No, I'm not, Harry. No, I'm not. I'm right here, next to you. <laughs> So what? I hate things out of season. It should be snowing now. And what would you be doing if it were snowing? Walking. Well, isn't that what we're doing now? It's different walking in the snow. I love to hear the crunching sound of my boots plowing in. <laughs> I love that cold wind that makes my nose so red. <laughs> <laughs> my mother thinks I'm weird when I tell her these things. She always tells me I'll get pneumonia. Mm, my mother is the same. Can't see the poetry in walking in the rain. What do you like about walking in the rain? Me? Well, I like to sing in the rain. Sing? Sure. Haven't you ever sung in the rain? No. Oh, then you've missed a wonderful experience. There's nothing like it. <clears throat> Though April showers may come your way. Oh, Harry. They bring the flowers that bloom in May. Tight, so Harry. what? It's New Year's Eve. That's the night when people let loose. Oh, no. That's the night when people are supposed to do what they want, and I want to sing. Oh, no, Harry, don't. So when it's raining, oh. have no regrets. Oh, no. Come on, Mary. No. Because it isn't raining rain, you know. It's raining violets. Come on, Mary, oh. sing. And when you <laughs> see clouds upon a hill, you soon will see. Sing, Mary, clouds. Of daffodil, that's the way. So keep on looking for a bluebird and listening for his song whenever April showers. <laughs> you see what fun it is? Yes, Harry. Harry. Huh? What's up? Let's cross the street quickly. Why? See what's happened? There's someone down the street I don't want to see. Please, I have my reason. Okay, Mary, who is it? That blonde girl, she's working in the office with me. Uh, Don't look now, Harry. I think it's too late. She spotted her. Oh, no. She's coming here. Then let's cross. Oh, but she sees you. It'll look as if you're purposely trying to avoid her. Oh, Mary! Hiya! Hello, Sylvia. Oh, so this is why you had to get down the street. No, I knew you didn't want me to wait for you. Well, aren't you going to introduce me? Uh, of course. Harry, this is Sylvia Miller. How do you do? Uh, Sylvia... Mr. Harry Wilson. Please to meet you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. This mug of mine's named Brian or huh? something. He'll say hello if he isn't too drunk. Say hello, lover boy. Hello. Jim, please. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, Sylvia, please Say, don't... Mary, you blame me. All your big talk about spending a quiet evening at home, and then you go crying about this like all the rest oh, of us. Sylvia. You know, Mr. Wilson, mm -hmm. your girl Mary's always putting on airs at the office. Yeah. That's some queer idea about being better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Even though she's only been with us two weeks, I think you know it out. <laughs> but I guess she ain't after all. Hi, Mary. Oh, what's the matter? Did I say something wrong as usual, or am I just a little bit boiled? All right, Sylvie, stop gabbing. I want to get going. Ah! 
Well, water boy. We've been painting the town red all night, and he still thinks it needs an overcoat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. We gotta go now, Mary. Yeah, we gotta go. Come on, Mr. Rose. Yeah, we gotta go. Bye, Mr. Bye, Mary. See you in the office. I will stop nothing up tonight. Say goodbye, River Boy. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Harry. Terribly sorry. But what? Your friend? She's not my friend. You think I'd have a friend like her? Well, don't get worked up, Mary. She was only drunk. She didn't even know what she was saying. And she probably won't even remember having met you. No. No, I suppose she won't. Yes, she will. She'll have a fine time in the office telling people that Mary Adams was running around on New Year's Eve with a man who picked her up, and she'll be telling the truth, too. Everybody will laugh when she tells them. And it'll get back to Mother. And I won't be able to deny it either, because it's all true. But it's still not too late. I still can break away from him. I'll tell him I have to go home. I'll tell him. It's still not too late. Harry, I... I... It's getting late, Harry. I have to be getting home. Oh, it's not that late. But it is. My mother asked... Well, she wants me home early. Well, okay, Mary. I'm going home alone. Alone? No, oh, no, you aren't. You think I'm the type that let my date go home alone on New Year's Eve with drunkards roaming all over? But I must <laughs> go home alone, Harry. But why? I must. That's why. Look, Harry. I have to tell you something. I lied to you earlier this evening when I said I wasn't engaged. I am. But you see, my fellow and I had an argument... Oh, it wasn't really anything. Just a silly quarrel. Well, I just wanted to spite him. And that's why I let you pick me. That's why I went out with you tonight. But I realized it was a terrible thing to do. I'm just leading you along on a string, and you're too nice for that. And that's why it's best to say goodbye now, to forget about tonight. And... I see. Don't think too lowly of me, Harry. After all, tonight was... Just for laughs. Oh, no. Then what was it? Well, I... It was for laughs. You make up with your boyfriend, you can tell him what a hilarious time you had on New Year's Eve with a jerk from Ohio. Please don't say such things, Well, Harry. it's true. That's what Leela did. That's what most girls do. I thought you were different. Oh, Harry, I thought I... you were sweet and kind. I thought you were the kind who'd understand a fellow like me. I thought I'd like to see you again. I wanted to see you again. But now I see I was just wasting my time. Your friend was right. You're no different from the others. Harry! So long, Mary. Happy New Year! Harry, wait! Wait, please! Harry, come back. Come back, Harry. Oh. Why can't this subway go faster? I want to go home. Um, that couple over there, necking, necking in public, haven't they any self-respect? Oh, why should I bother? I don't behave like them. I behaved very sensibly this evening. I did what was right. I did. Oh, why do I have to lie to myself? The reason I didn't let him take me home was because I'm stupid. He liked me. But I threw him over simply because I was afraid of what Sylvia would think and what Mother would say. It's my fear. My idiotic, ridiculous fear that made me give him up. I have only myself to blame. Only myself. <laughs> I'm almost home. Just down the block, then up the steps. Oh, thank heavens. What will I tell Mother? True? No. No, I mustn't. She'll yell and rant. She'll laugh, maybe. She won't even believe me. I know what. I'll tell her Sylvia's date suddenly got sick, and Syl and I went to the movies. I, um, had tried to get her on the phone all evening, but the lines were tied up because of the holiday. Oh, maybe she's sleeping. Maybe she won't even hear me come in. Well, here I am. There's a light on in the browns. I wonder why. Home. Home. 
Hello, Mary. Oh, Mrs. Brown. Up a bit late tonight? Oh, no, you know, the new year and all. We even had a little shindig a while ago. Just broke up. Uh, that's nice. I rang your bell to see if you were home, but I guess you weren't. Uh, no, I, I had an appointment. Well, I better run now. Mother's expecting Mother. me. Now, Mary, please. You know perfectly well... Stop it! Mary, you've please. just got to get it through your head. I mean, you've got to realize... Stop it! Stop it! But Mary, your mother's dead! She's been dead for over two years. Just got to realize it. She isn't dead. You're lying. You've always lied to me. She isn't dead. She isn't. She isn't. She isn't. Mother's not dead. Mother. Mother! New Year's Eve is a climax, a climax of many things. Something ends, and something begins on New Year's Eve. And sometimes, something both begins and ends. That was Mother, Attraction 12 on Radio City Playhouse, written by Stanley Robert Mednick. The production was directed by Harry W. Junkin. Members of the cast included Sylvia Davis, Abby Lewis, Anne Petoniak, Ross Martin, and Eugene Francis. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shield. Radio City Playhouse is supervised for the National Broadcasting Company by Richard P. McDonough. <laughs> Next week, we are happy to welcome Miss Jan Minor to a third appearance on Radio City Playhouse. She'll be heard as Constance in a tense and moving story written by our director, Harry W. Duncan. We hope you'll be with us, and that you'll note our new time and broadcast date, Saturday at 8 o'clock. Be with us then next Saturday, 8 o'clock, for Soundless, Attraction 13 on Radio City Playhouse. Robert Warren speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Good health to all from Rexall. Sunday, time for the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, presented by the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, taking a little time from behind the prescription counter this Sunday evening to speak for all 10,000 of us. The 10,000 independent druggists who have added the word Rexall to our own store names. You can always tell us by the orange and blue Rexall sign on our windows. The sign means that we carry the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. They range all the way from aspirin to penicillin, and they're as fine and pure and dependable as science can make them. We independent druggists recommend them to our customers because we know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show, written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet, with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, Robert North, Janine Roos, and Whitfield, Walter Sharp and his music, yours truly, Bill Foreman, and starring Alice Fay and Phil Harris. <laughs> Today is...
is Mother's Day, and Phil doesn't have anything for Alice. He intended to buy her something very nice, but... Well, let's go back two days. Alice and Phil are downtown shopping. Hey, Alice, let's go home. I'm tired of looking in shop windows and walking oh, up... Oh, Phil, and... just look at that stunning two-piece French bathing suit. Well, I'll look, but I ain't gonna... Ooh, la, la. <laughs> you like it? Viva la France and cherche my femme. <laughs> All right, take it easy, Father. Simmer down. I just wanted to know how you liked it. I think it's very seductive. <laughs> <laughs> then why don't you go in and buy it? Yeah, maybe I'll... Nah, I'll stick to my Hawaiian trunks. <laughs> Bill, I thought you might buy it for... Well, uh, uh... For who? Oh, I might as well tell you. Sunday is Mother's Day, and it would make a wonderful gift. Oh, don't be silly. My mother ain't the type for that. <laughs> Bill, I was suggesting that you buy it for me. You? Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't let my wife wear one of them things. Why not? Well, it's too scanty. You're... you're well, you're liable to catch cold in it. <laughs> I'm just thinking of your health, dear. You need something warmer. Well, then how about buying me that full-length mink coat we saw? That ought to keep me warm. That'd keep you too warm. <laughs> You'd only perspire and run a temperature. <laughs> There must be a healthy present he can buy me. Hey, Doc, how about a diamond bracelet? Honey, diamond bracelets, fur coats, take it easy. I don't have that kind of cabbage. Well, if you're a little short, I'll help you out. <laughs> Tell you what, Phil, I'll give you an advance on your allowance. No, thank you. I have a stipend. <laughs> now, let me see. I got 20, 40, 60, 70. Hey, Bud, could you spare five bucks for a guy who needs a curly? <laughs> Oh, hello, Alice. I didn't recognize Wait you. Wait a minute, Remy. What's the idea of panhandling? <laughs> Please, I am not panhandling. I happen to be soliciting financial aid for a worthy people. <laughs> Who? The INLGPNRs. Oh, the Anilkapers. <laughs> Fine race of people. <laughs> Who on earth are the INLGPNRs? The Institute for Needy Left Handed Guitar Players named Remley. <laughs> oh, it's for you, huh? Alice, he's trying to raise money to pay his bookie. He owes him $134. Curly, you're maligning me. <laughs> Just trying to raise enough money to send my dear old mom a gift for Mother's Day. Oh, that's sweet, Frankie. What are you going to send her? A shawl, a knitting bag, or... No, a... no, I have a sentimental custom. I send her money, a dollar for every year of her life. Oh, now, Frankie, that's a wonderful idea, and I'll lend you the money. How old is your mother? 134. <laughs> Plus interest. <laughs> Ah, uh, so it is your bookie. I was right the first time. Oh, Remley, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Forgetting your mother on Mother's Day. I didn't forget her. I already sent her something. Did you get something for Alice? No, but, no. but I'm going to right now. Look, Alice, you run along and I'm... You go on home and I'm going to stay downtown and I'm going to shop for your present. All right, honey. See you later. Okay. Hey, Remley. Hmm? She's a sweet hunk of stuff, boy. <laughs> Sure wish I knew what to get her. Isn't there something she expressed a desire for? Yeah. Yeah, she liked that mink coat in the window there, but it cost $3,000. Well, yeah, if you buy it in a swanky store like that, but not if you buy it wholesale. <laughs> well, where can I get it home? <laughs> what did you say? I said, I don't know if I want you to answer this or not. <laughs> Why'd you try? I said, where can I get it wholesale? I happen to know a guy. Uh, I know. Wait a minute. See you later. No, wait a minute. Come here, Curly. Look. 
I don't know this guy personally, but they say he's a reputable furrier. Uh, His name is I.J. Grogan. (laughs) At least look at his furs if you don't like them. You don't have to buy them. True. All right, I'll look. Come on, let's go. Hey, Remley. Hmm? Is Grogan's place in this ritzy neighborhood? Oh, yeah. It's just off this street. Come on, Curly. We turn right in here. Okay, I'll get... Wait a minute. Hmm? What are we going up this dark alley for? The store is out of the high rent district. (laughs) See, it's along here someplace. Hey, Pat, you want to buy a fur coat? (laughs) Oh, here's Grogan's fur shop, hey, now. He has his fur shop right out here in the open. Yeah, no overhead. Uh, Mr. Grogan, we're here to look at some mink coats. Well, see, you come to the right place. I got a couple hanging right here on the fence. <laughs> now, here. Now, here's a beautiful pelt. I can let you have it for 500 Now, just feel this fur. Go ahead. Stroke it. Okay. Hey. This feels nice and soft and... <laughs> Sounds like a good mink. Cut it out, will you? It ain't no mink, it's a cat. In that case, I'll let you have it for two fifty. Wait a minute. Frankie, let's get out of here. I've seen this guy in a cowboy hat selling radios all the time. I don't want to do no business up no alley. I want to go to a regular store. Well, now, why don't you say so? Follow me into my shop. Careful, now you watch your step, man. Nobody's ash cans here. That's it. Now, if you just crawl in here through this window... Ah, here we are. Here we are where? Here. Remley, how do you find these places? I got contacts. Now, gents, you wanted to buy a good fur coat. Is that right? Yeah. I got one right here. Well, let me see it. Okay. Wait till I turn the lights out. (laughs) Oh, I've come to the right place. (laughs) What's the idea turning the lights out? It's for your own protection. This coat is so highly glazed, if I leave the lights on, it'll dazzle you. Now, just look at this fur. Look at it. A guy's got to be an owl to buy a coat in this joint. Stop horsing around. Shall I wrap this coat up, or do you want to wear it? I wouldn't buy a coat in this jip joint. Come on, Frankie. Hey, I'm sorry, Grogan. I changed my mind. I ain't going to buy my wife a fur. I'm going to buy her a diamond bracelet. Diamond bracelet. You come to the right place. Hey, step right behind this crate. Into our jewelry department. Now, wait till I turn the lights on. Oh, this we get to see with the lights on. Of course. I ain't ashamed of my jewelry. Hey, just look at this piece here. Now, there's a bracelet any woman would be proud to own. Hey, Curly, this is a beautiful hunk of jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like the real thing. Yeah. Hey, Grog, how much you want for this? Well, sir, I can let you have it for as little as how much you got. $200. $200. So, you drive a hard bargain, bud. <laughs> All right, get the cash out while I wrap this up. Uh, would you like to have a gift wrapped? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. I'll use this beautiful paper here. No, I better wrap it in something else. This is today's racing form, and I haven't read it yet. <laughs> have you got the 200 have I got it? I got the money right here in my hand. But wait a minute. Before I hand it over, are you sure that this is genuine? Looks like good money to me. I mean, a brace. <laughs> well, have it appraised. If they say it's worth less than $500, I'll give you your money back. Fair enough, eh? You? Yeah. Say, tell me, Grogan, if this is worth 500 how can you afford to sell it to me for 200 That's simple. I eliminate the middleman. 
<laughs> or any other man who happens to get in my way. <laughs> it's a pleasure to do business with someone like you. What do you know? It's a five o'clock whistle already. <laughs> Time to go home. I'll, I'll just take that 200. Thanks. So long. Wait a minute, Grogan. I... Frankie, why is he going down that trap door? I guess he has an apartment under the store. <laughs> well, now that you got Alice's present, let's take it home and we'll see. All right, you mugs, stay where you are and get your hands up. This is a law. Well, if it ain't Seymour subpoena in person. <laughs> yeah, old Nick Nightstick himself. <laughs> You're under arrest for receiving stolen goods. Hand over that bracelet. Beat it, will you, bud? You're cluttering up the aisle. Go pound a beat. Hey, something. Why? Right, curly, curly. Can't talk that way to a cop. Yeah, what are you talking about? He ain't no cop. It's a racket. Grogan sells you the stuff, and this guy sticks you up and takes it back. He works with Grogan. He's a confederate. <laughs> Curly, he can't be a confederate. Why not? He's wearing a blue uniform. <laughs> well, Mr. Bones, we finished with that missile routine last week. <laughs> Well, I just thought that I'd get a little yak in here. While... <laughs> All right, pick and pass. <laughs> Let's see how funny you can be down at the station house. Station house? <laughs> hey, Rebel, did he say station house? Yeah, that must be the play. All right, come on, come on. I'll now, wait a minute. Wait. Come on. Sirs, we called you down to headquarters because we have a mug here who claims to be your husband. Turnkey's bringing him in now. Oh, he can't be my husband. Mr. Harris is downtown shopping. Oh, wait till I see this phony who's masquerading as my husband. I'll, I'll tell... Hello, honey. <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no! Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> hey, Alice, I'm glad you're here. Now you can tell these guys who... Quiet, are... you... Mrs. Harris, is this man your husband? Before I answer that, can it be used against me? Honey, <laughs> will you please tell the man who I am? I want to Sergeant, get out. he is my husband. Oh, my mistake. His mistake, he says. <laughs> Phil, how did you get into this? Honey, I was buying you a Mother's Day present, and I didn't know the guy had stolen goods. Miss Harris, if you'll vouch for these men, I'll let them go in your custody. Oh, Thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> and now to show my appreciation, I'd like to do something for you. Here's a couple of tickets to my radio show. Oh, Mr. Harris, you're so good to me. <laughs> I'm on duty Sunday. I won't be able to go. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> I'd hate to have you miss my song, Sarge. Hey, I'll tell you what, I'll sing it for you right now. Curly, please, not in the police station. You'll get us arrested again. Quiet, Remley. <laughs> this one Alice does with me. Oh. Let's show him, honey. I simply can't But baby, stay. it's cold outside. I've got to go but away. But baby, it's cold outside. This evening has been, been hoping that you drop so in. very warm. I'll hold your hands, they're just like My I mother do. will start Let's to worry what you hurry And father will be pacing the floor The fireplace roar So really I'd better Beautiful, discourage. please don't hurry Well, maybe just a half a drink more Put some records on while I'm The neighbors may but think But baby, it's bad out there Hey, what's in no this No cabs to be had out there I wish I knew your how Your eyes are like starlight to now To break the spell I'll take your hat, your Hair looks I swell. ought to say no, no, Mind no, sir. if I move any At least closer. I'm gonna say that I tried. What's the sense of her? I really can't Oh, stay. baby, don't hold out. Oh, baby, but it's, it's cold outside. I simply must but go. baby, it's cold outside. The answer is Ooh, no. It's cold outside. The welcome has How been. How lucky that you dropped so in. Nice. Look out the window at that storm. 
Guys, your lips look My delicious. brother will be there at the door. Waves upon the tropical My show. My maiden aunt's mind is delicious. Guys, your lips are delicious. Well, maybe just a cigarette more. Never such a bliss I've before. got to get but home. But baby, you freeze out there. Say, lend me a cold. It's up to your knees out there. You've really been I'd dragged. thrill when you touch my but hand. don't you see? How can you do this thing There's to me? There's bound to be talk to me. Think of my lifelong sorrow. At least sorrow. there will be plenty in fly. If you caught no more, I I really can't get stay. over that old out. Ah, oh, but it's, it's cold, cold People sing in the darndest places. Phil, <laughs> let's go home. Oh, he can't go home yet. He has to get that $200 back from Grogan so he can buy your Mother's Day present. Frankie's right. Phil. I'd rather forget the present. No, no. We won't have any trouble getting the money back. Come on, Curly. Grogan belongs to a very exclusive club. We'll find him there. Okay, look, Alice, you go home and I'll call you right after I get my money back, but huh? Phil, please don't. I get want it. my money back. <laughs> Hey, Frankie, hmm? this is a swanky club. Are you sure Grogan belongs to this? Oh, yeah, he's a charter member. He must be around someplace. Ah, oh, there he is. Hey, Grogan. Grogan. Hey, number 297341. Wait a minute, me. There he is. Oh, that's... Oh, 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 it's you guys. Well, bud, how'd the little woman like the trinket? She didn't see it. I got arrested for having stolen goods. Ah, Rest it. Remley, I'll thank you to get this ex-con out of here. <laughs> I don't do business with criminals. I'm a criminal. You sold me a hot bracelet. All right, come around tomorrow. I'll send you a fan to cool it off. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Grogan. I want my money back or I'm going to tell the police on you. Oh, you big tattletale. <laughs> That's it. If you want your money back, I'll give it to you. Come on in the dining room. I'll get it for you. Yo, Levin, the winner. Five, six, seven. Get in the field. Everybody, get in the field. Number, number 14, black. Get in the field, everybody. Get in. Come on now. All right, you wait here. I'll get your money. This is a nice big dining room. <laughs> Look at all the tables. Yeah. Wonder why everybody's standing at them tables. Must be buffet service. <laughs> well, I'm hungry. Let's get something to eat. Hey, let's go over to this table. Yeah. Hey, look at it, really. Hmm? Hey, this is a cute tablecloth. Green with numbers on it. <laughs> Good idea. And look at the nice big lazy Susan they got in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, but they ain't much food on it. All they got is one little white meatball spinning around. <laughs> Curly. Wow. That's a roulette wheel. <laughs> this is a gambling joint. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is what they look like. <laughs> Heavens to Betsy, what a rude awakening. Yeah, and we better get out of here. If we ever got caught in a spot... Ow! Everybody stay where you are. This is a rape. No, it's the Everybody scatter! Oh, right, oh, 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 oh. Heavens, Dark, this is our chance to get away from here. Come on. Come on, yeah, let's beat it. Follow me and don't lose your head, Remley. I'll get you out of this. Oh, I hope you can. I've never been so frightened in all my life. And control yourself, will you, Frankie? Every time you get excited, your voice goes up to... <laughs> Me, it's a dame. Oh, that's all we need. Oh, please, please help me get okay, out. Okay, lady, okay, lady, okay, calm down. Just come right with us, right through this door. There. Yeah. Well, thank goodness we made it. Nobody's here but the three of us. And little me. <laughs> get your hands up. Hey, look, it's Blue Boy again. <laughs> Homer handcuff. <laughs> oh. Oh, so it's you two, huh? 
You guys get around, don't you? You ain't exactly a stay-at-home yourself. <laughs> now, officer, this time it's a mistake. You hear me? I'm... Yeah, it always is. Hey, uh, Murph, can I get these people's names from my paper? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Oh, no, early. Now, look, Remley, whatever you do, don't give your right name. Tell him you're somebody else. Mm. I'm Larkin of the Mirror. What's your name, bud? My name? Um, um, Julius Abrosio, Mac. <laughs> and what's your name, mister? Bill Harris. <laughs> What did you give my name for? You took the one I was going to use. <laughs> Yours is the only other one I could think of. So you're Phil Harris, huh? And who are you, Blondie? Are you with him? Yes, yes, I, I'm his wife. Alice Faye? No, no, look. Oh, wait, now, wait a minute, Story hits the street. Faye and Harris wait fought a minute, in a gambling raid. I'll have this on the stands in an hour. Now, wait a minute. Come back here. That's not Alice and I'm not me. I'll... All right, all right. Get moving, all of you. If we hurry, you can get your old cell back. Oh. Gee, this story in the papers is horrible. Miss Faye in jail, caught in a gambling raid. I'd never have thunk it of her. I guess you can't tell a book by its cover. And such a beautiful cover. <laughs> what a binding. <laughs> I wonder who's here at the house taking care of the kids while she's incarcerated. Oh, hello, Julia. Miss Faye, you just been sprung. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you shoot your way out? What on earth are you talking about? You're supposed to be in jail. It says here in the paper that Phil Harris and Alice Faye was arrested in a gambling raid. A gambling raid? Oh, Julia, sorry. You don't have to explain, Somi. I don't care about your sordid past. <laughs> I know your husband drug you into this. Now, Julius, listen to me. Let you... me take you away from that Fagan and this criminal existence. <laughs> Julius, please, Mr. Harris is in jail. What'll I do? Leave him there! <laughs> this is our opportunity, Dream Girl. Let's fly away to Hawaii. Julius! Blue Hawaii! <laughs> Where the hookah, hookah, nookah, nookah, snookah, snookah's go swimming by. Oh, stop it. I have to go down and get him out. Oh, I'd love to teach him a lesson. Then take me with you. I'm the best little teacher you can get. <laughs> Miss Harris, I'm sorry you had to come down to the station house again. Oh, Alice, thank goodness you showed up. I've been trying to tell that sergeant that I'm innocent and I want to get out of here. If you show it on baby face, the gang's mouthpiece will have you out in no time. (laughs) Alice. What gang? Don't tell me you never heard of the Harris band. He's the leader of the toughest mob this side of Chicago. He's public enemy number one. But I... I, I, I... Oh, so you're the leader of a band of bad men, eh? Well, it's not their fault. They just happen to be lousy musicians. (laughs) Now, wait a minute. Let's get this straight. You tell me, son. Is this Phil Harris the radio comedian, or is he public enemy number one? Yes. Why, you little... Stand back. Mrs. Harris, is this man your husband? Is he a crook? Is he a band leader? Or is he nuts? Yes. (laughs) I mean, no. Sergeant, this man is my husband. He's not guilty of any crime, and if you'll release him in my custody, I'll be responsible. Okay, but this time, keep him out of trouble. Get out of here, Harris. And turnkey, throw that Remley character out, too. Come along, Phil. And this time we're going right home. No, we're not. We are not going home. I'm just storing up. We're not going till I get that money back from Grogan so I can buy you a Mother's Day present. Phil, please stay away from I'm that man. I'm not going to stay away please. from that man. He owes me that money, and this time I'm going to his house. Now, I'm not going to get in any trouble there. Remley knows where he lives. Now, go home, and I'll call you as soon as I get my $200 back. <laughs> Hello, Alice, it's me. Oh, thank goodness. Did you get the 200 from Grogan? Yeah, I got it, and I went downtown and bought you a Mother's Day present with it. Oh, Phil, I can't wait to see it. 
When will you be home? Just a minute. Hey, Sarge, how long do you think I'll be here? <laughs> Phil, you're in jail again? Yes, dear. What for now? Passing counterfeit money. <laughs> Alice and Phil will be back in just a moment. But first, here's your Rexall family druggist. Recently, a customer asked me for an example of Rexall quality that she could see with her own eyes. I told her one example like that is the label on a Rexall drug product, and she came back with... But every drug product has a label. Yes, ma'am, that's true, but let's take a look at this Rexall label for a minute. See these three different sets of numbers? One here in this corner, one over here, and one up here? Yeah. Now, you've probably never noticed them before, but... Each one means that certain important steps in the preparation of this product have been carefully done and thoroughly checked. For instance, this one here is the product's code number and tells the tested formula by which it was compounded. This one here is the control number which was assigned to the complete case history that has been kept on this product through every step of its manufacture. And um, this one here? That's the identification of the label itself. And it means that the label has been carefully checked for the proper directions and is the right one for this particular product. And I've always looked on a label as just a piece of paper with the name of the product. Well, ma'am, those pieces of paper are handled like currency in a bank. They're kept in a locked room until the labeling process begins. Then a certain amount is counted out very carefully. And after the labeling run, every one of them is again counted and checked against the number of bottles or packages labeled. Naturally, the two have to balance Well, that is evidence I can see for myself. Yes, ma'am. Evidence of the painstaking care and accuracy that go into the preparation of all of the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. When you remember things like this, you understand why some 10,000 independent Rexall druggists tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Alice, I'm sorry I didn't get you anything for Mother's Day. I didn't get my money back from Grogan and... Oh, that's all right, Phil. You don't have to get me anything. But I want to. Well, if you insist, okay. But don't spend too much money. Get me something inexpensive. Like what? Well, I I could use something to get around town in. How about a Cadillac convertible, darling? Or would you rather buy me a Lincoln Continental, sweetheart? Take roller skates and call me stinky. <laughs> This is Bill Foreman wishing good health to all from Rexall. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the terrifying world of your own imagination. And I hope you won't hold it against us if we scare you a little with a tale that really could happen, I suppose. But when you hear the outcome, you'll hope it never does. Consider the case of Paula Richards, age 24, who put her future in the hands of an old fortune teller and a dealer in the macabre. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes? On the birth of the child, I will demand one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? What? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor, but it is part of the bargain. And believe me, Mrs. Richards... If you do decide to bargain with me, I warn you to be ready to keep your part of it. Our 
mystery drama, Mother Love, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Joan Hackett. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K Cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time Beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way. Because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say... Well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. This is WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has a beautiful buy to help you serve dinner. Fine imported porcelain china. The beautifully crafted Lovelace pattern by Crown Victoria. An elegant white-on-white platinum banded pattern to complement any table. Now available only at ShopRite. The basic place setting pieces, dinner plate, cup and saucer, dessert plate, and bread and butter plate, are just 39 cents. 39 cents each with every $3 purchase. A different place setting piece is featured each week at this special price. You'll want to collect all the magnificent completer pieces and matching ovenware available every week at low prices, too. Visit ShopRite and start your set of lovely porcelain china today. It's a beautiful buy. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Offer not available in Westchester, Ulster, Orange, Dutchess, and Columbia counties. A doctor's waiting room is not the most pleasant place to spend a winter morning. And for Paula and George Richards, this morning is a very fateful one. What's taking him so long? Easy, honey. Dr. Morton has other patients, sick patients. Why can't Dr. Morton say yes or no? Why does he have to keep us waiting? He wanted to see us together in person. I understand how he feels. Sometimes a doctor's word can make or wreck a life. This waiting is making a wreck out of me. I'm, I'm going to call Mr. Jordan. I'll tell him I won't be in today. I told him I'd be late, but I'm, I'm just no good for work today. I'm sure the doctor won't mind my using his phone. Jordan Electric. Oh, Mr. Jordan, I didn't expect you to answer. Oh, Millie's out sick. What's the verdict, Paula? Uh, I, I don't know yet. That's why I'm calling. I'm just... I'm too upset to come in today. Is it all right? Sure, sure, I understand. The books can wait another day. No audit till the end of the quarter, anyway. Thank you. What's the holdup? The doctor's busy. We're next. Courage up, Paula. I've got my fingers crossed for you. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Goodbye. Bye, Paula. He didn't mind, did he? No, no, he didn't. He said if I wanted... Mrs. Richards, Mr. Richards. Hello, Doc. Oh, thank heavens. Will you step inside, please? Come right in. Take those chairs by the desk. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to wait. Doctor, I'd like... I know, Miss Richards. You're anxious about the tests. Oh, you have no idea. Easy, honey. I'll come right to the point. I think that's what you want. Yes. Please, doctor. All right. I can't sweet-talk my way through to make it easier for you. The results are negative. I'm sorry, Mrs. Richards, but from my examination, Dr. Field's examination, and the lab tests... You simply cannot ever hope to bear a child. Oh, George. It's certain, then. Absolutely certain. Yes, it is. Would artificial... No. The trouble lies with Mrs. Richards. <laughs> She's physically incapable of conceiving or bearing a child. I was, I was trying to prepare for this, but it sort of hits you right between the eyes. Take me home, George, please. <laughs> I hate to leave you alone today, but I have to get to the studio. It's all right, George. 
You know that I'm I'm not going to love you any the less, Paula. Darling, I just wanted to give you a son. So it's not in our cards. We have each other. That's the main reason we got married, to be together. A baby would have been extra icing on the cake. Don't stop loving me, George, please. Please, George. Don't stop loving me. I told you I won't, honey. And I meant it. You'll be okay today? I'll be okay. I won't be singing around the apartment, but I... I won't be jumping out the window either. I hate like the devil to leave you, honey, but I'm due on the air with the new news. I'll be all right. See you at seven. <laughs> Edna, would you have lunch with me today? I know our date isn't until Friday, and I know that it's snowing awful hard, but of if you could just... Of course I'll have lunch, but, but get me down off the ceiling. What did the doctor say? I'll meet you at the towers. One o'clock? Oh, of course. Paula, what happened? Bad news? Yes, bad news. <laughs> oh, I, I can imagine how tough it is for you, Paula. No, you can't. I'm going to lose George. Did he say that? No, just the opposite, but... Oh, wait, now I know. I have a feeling. Oh, now, Paula, honey, don't start planning your own downfall. I'm afraid it's all planned. It's it's all in the cards. In the cards? Yes, you know, it's just an expression. Well, honey, I don't know whether I should suggest this. What? Well, you're just mentioning cards. It... It seems sort of frivolous at a time like this, but... Well, there's a woman down in the East Village. She tells fortunes, you know, with cards and tea leaves. <laughs> and what could you do for me? Tell me what I already know. Well, this woman specializes in herbs. She calls herself Mother Love. <laughs> Mother Love? Well, now, mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting, but maybe... Just maybe this woman could help you. How? Sometimes these old crones can read things in the future. Maybe a baby is in the cards for you. After the doctor said that well, there it's wasn't just a... an idea. Well, how do you how do you know this mother love? Oh, quite by accident. About oh, six months ago, Henry and well, maybe it was Ed. I anyway, it was the current one at the time. We were bar hopping in the village when we came on this fantastic storefront. The window was painted green and purple with red curtains, and it said, Mother Love, in orange letters. Fortunes told secret herb remedies. Seemed like a lark, so we went in. And all I remember from then on was mumbling and incense. And being told, one, I'd never marry. Two, that I was too fickle and flighty. And three, <laughs> that my mother had had a ward on her right side. Oh, <laughs> really? Darned if the old crone wasn't right about that, too. Edna, the idea that a fortune teller spell can help me have a baby is just nonsense. Well, looking at it in the cold light of day, you're right. It's just a thought. Oh, something to say, I guess. Oh, honestly, Pa, I feel so uncomfortable. I mean, what, what do you say to someone in your predicament? Hello? Edna? Oh, hi, Paula. Edna, look, last month you mentioned a woman in the village. She works with herbs. Um, Mother Love? You, oh, Paula, you don't mean you've been thinking seriously about that? Not until now, not really, but I'd... Look, I'd, I'd like to know how to find her. Well, I... I seem to remember it was on 8th Street. No, no, it was 9th. Yeah, 9th, near 1st. Well, that's about all I'm sure of. 9th, near 1st. Oh, Paula, I wasn't really being serious that much. Well, I can't do any harm. Right now I'm ready to grab at any straws. Oh, when are you going? Saturday. Have you told George? No, he'd be furious. Do you want me to come with you? Would you? I'd feel a lot better. Paula, let's, let's not go too far. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, we all laugh at fortune telling and spells and brews, but sometimes when we want to believe, well, things happen. I'm going to this mother love because I... I want something to happen. Maybe she can't do anything to help me have the baby, but I'm going to try. Look, it was all your idea, Edna. I think it's at the end of this block. What a neighborhood. Mm. Makes my skin crawl. That's it. I see what you mean about those red curtains and orange letters. <laughs> Looks like a Coney Island transplant that failed. Mother, love, fortunes, toll, secret, herb, remedies. Well, mother, love, here I come. Good heavens. I never expected anything like this. Mm, it's not what I remember. Oh, but then I'd been bar hopping. This rock, it must be worth a fortune. Edna, mm. look at the paintings. Mm. Too much incense, though. Ah, mother has company. Good morning, ladies. Come in. How can mother serve you? Your fortunes, perhaps? Maybe an ailment? Well? Uh, uh, <clears throat> I would, uh, I'd like to talk to you. It will cost you. Mother's time is expensive. I'll pay. Are uh, both of you? Oh, no, I'm I'm just along for the ride. Come then. We'll go into my studio. Edna, I'll be here. This way, my dear. Through the curtains. It's a little dark, but I like it that way. Mother, is that you? Mother? Of course, Claude. Mother, is that you? Don't be alarmed. He's harmless. He's my son the matter with him? He's blind and feeble-minded. Oh, I'm so sorry. Come, sit down at the table. What will it be? Cards, tea leaves, crystal ball? Uh, no, I I'm more interested in uh, herbs, I think. What is it you want? I want to have a baby. I was told that you might be able to help. Who told you I can do things like that? A, a, a friend? That one out there? No, 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 someone else. Mother, is that you? Yes, Claude. Everything's all right. I tell fortunes. I give herbs for minor complaints. I do not deal in that sort of thing. Is there a herb that might help me? Of course not. Not without... A spell. Forget it. I've said too much already. Mother love, I want desperately to have a child. The doctor says that I can't. The problem is my fault. I'll try anything, even if a spell is necessary. It would be expensive. I don't care. There may be a way to help you have a normal baby with your own husband. Please, that's all I want. It will cost you $1,000. I have that. Plus another 5000 when you have conceived... I said it would be expensive, and I guarantee nothing. With these things, we can only try. Will you tell me one thing? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Have you ever done this or this sort of thing before? I cannot answer that. Quite a gamble for Paula. $6,000 and no guarantee. A long shot if there ever was one. Will she take the gamble? Is she desperate enough? We'll soon see. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. And now another tale of the ball and chain. At Kellogg's Special K. Presents overweight on an overnight train. Is the seat taken? Please, sit down. Mm. You have exceptional legs. Oh. Uh, but why is one of them attached to a ball and chain? This ball and chain? It's a symbol. Funny, I would have sworn it was a ball and chain. I mean symbolic. Because carrying around a few extra pounds can be just like lugging around this ball and chain. I see. May I suggest something? Uh -huh. Try a bowl of Special K skim milk, orange juice, and coffee. It's the Special K 
breakfast. Will it make me lose weight? No. Oh. You must also exercise and eat smart at every meal. I see. Do you know the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free and delicious? No, but if you hum a few bars... No, no, no. And that's another tale of the ball and chain. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. Good night. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. No matter what you're saving for, that's what suburban savings for suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Welcome again to the studio of Mother Love in a dingy part of New York City. A strange and eerie place where strange things are said to happen. Let's see if they do, as Paula Richards considers a bargain, a bargain for a baby. I'll, I'll have to think this over. I admit that I am desperate, but I, I'll just have to think about it. It's for you to decide, of course. Mother, who's there? Who I... is that? Hush, hush, Claude. I'll be with you in a moment. I'm sorry. He's very ill. Thank you. Anyway, I'll, I'll be in touch with you if I decide that... You'll be in touch. Yes. Claude, what's the matter now? Mother's here. Mother is always here. Well, I thought you'd never come out. What happened? Let's get out of here. She really said that? Well, she said she doesn't guarantee anything. Paula, now listen to me. Forget it. She's a fraud and you know it. Well, you can't throw away $6,000 on a phony fortune teller. But if she could possibly... Oh, what? You'll have to tell George about oh, this. Oh, heavens, no. No, no, no. I, well, he'd, think I, uh, he'd think I was completely crazy. You know, I'm sorry I ever brought this up. Don't be, Edna. Look, I won't lose my head. Well, now, where would you get the money anyway without telling George? Well, I have $1,000 and a personal account. It's, it's all that's left of my father's inheritance. I'll worry about the rest later. Ah, Mother has company. Ah, it's you. I have the 1000 I want to try. Come in, come in. This way. I thought you'd be back. Mother love knows. Mother, is that you? You, you have the money. Here, in cash. Good. I need it. Claude. He needs medicine so badly. Poor Claude cost me so much. Are you sure you want a child? I want a baby. Get on with whatever you have to do. Yes, of course. Excuse me. I have to get some things. I had them already. I knew you'd be back. Now, first of all, this talisman. You must wear it around your waist. This package contains herbs. A special combination to relax you. That's the secret. To relax. Half a teaspoon in a cup of boiling water once a day. In the morning is best. That's all. For now. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes? On the birth of the child, I will ask you one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? 
But what? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor. Don't worry. But it's part of the bargain. Very well, it's a long way off. Yes, it is. Take the talisman and the herbs. And don't be alarmed if certain unusual things happen in the next few weeks. Unusual things? What kind of things? You'll understand. You'll recognize them. They will mean things are working. Have you told your husband about this? No. Good, good. Tell no one. No one. Now, the last thing I must have is your name. Paula Richards. Your husband? George Richards. Go now. And beware. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. Yes. Five thousand. Remember when you can see you. Mother! Oh, who's there? Oh, who's there? Lord, mother is here now. Only mother. See, Claude? A thousand dollars from the nice lady. The lady who's going to help us. You're going to get better, Claude. You won't be sick anymore. The lady is going to help us. Isn't that nice, Claude? Paula? Hmm? Penny, for your thoughts. Oh, I wasn't thinking of anything, really. You've been like that a lot lately. Distant. I'm surprised you noticed. Look, honey, I know I haven't been a lily to live with either. I mean, we, we've let our problem be too important. We're both disappointed, but we can't change the situation. I mean, we have to adjust to it. Sorry if I've been a pill, if I've done anything to make you so... so... Edgy. <laughs> That's your word. Is that how you feel? I guess. George, let's go to the show tonight. We haven't been out in weeks. I'd like that, Paul. I'd really like that. I, I've had uh, <clears throat> a lot on my mind, and you're right. I, I've been thinking about myself too much. I'll see what I can get tickets for. Look at the time. I've got to shower and run. Hey, will you look at that? What is it? It's a bird. At the window, I think, I think it's a crow. No, crows are bigger. A blackbird? I, no, I don't know. I thought they all went south for the winter. It looks awfully cold. Well, don't invite it in. They know how to take care of themselves. I'll see you tonight, honey. Bye, George. I'll call you at the office about the tickets for tonight. Okay. Shoo. Go away. Shoo. Oh, well, a few crumbs. Then I've got to get to work. You look so cold. Now, here. Here's some bread. Get out of here. Get out. Get out. What am I going to do? Get off the floor, lad. Get out. Get out. Oh, Lord. What? Oh. What am I going to do? Get out. Shoot. Oh. Oh, good. Go away. Shh. Hello? Mrs. Jensen? Is Mr. Jensen there? This is Mrs. Richards in 3A. No, 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 it's not about the heat. It's about a bird in my apartment. I can't get it out. Well, I thought that Mr. Jensen might... Oh, uh, no, I've got to get to work. All right, uh, I'll leave... Uh, he can get in with a passkey. Maybe the bird will just fly out, and I'll leave the window open a little. Yes, yes, all right, thank you. Bye. Stop following me. Get out! Shh. What am I going to get, to get rid of you? I... You wanted to see me, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Uh, sit down, Paula. How are you feeling? Why? Well, I, I know you've had a personal disappointment. You've been under a strain. You don't have to say it, Mr. Jordan. I know that my work has just been rotten lately, and I'm I'm just all on edge. And today there is a there is a bird in my apartment. A bird? Tapped on the window this morning, and stupid me opened the window and gave it some crumbs. Well, what kind of bird? I, I don't know. It's black and shiny. Uh, not too big. I asked the superintendent to get it out. It's so unnerving. Well, I can imagine. I'm sorry about the work, Mr. Jordan. I know I've been letting you down. No, well, I'm, I'm sure it's just a passing thing. 
Your work has always been tops, Paula. But the books are important. And with the auditors coming in next month, well, everything just has to be in order. I know, Mr. Jordan, and I'll... I promise I'll straighten up. Yes? Yes, she's here. It's a call for you. Oh, it must be George about tonight. Hello? Mrs. Uh, Richards? You know who this is? Yes, I know. Tell me, Mrs. Richards. Has the visitor arrived yet? The visitor? You'll know. You'll know when the visitor arrives. Uh, you don't mean the bird. Good, good. He has arrived. It's working. Yes, it's working, Mrs. Richards. Oh. Don't neglect the tea now, whatever you do. And take care of the visitor. It is most important. I'll be in touch with you again. Very soon. Oh, Paula, is it... Is it trouble? You're white as a ghost. No, no, no trouble at all. That is, I don't know. Well, you mentioned the bird, is that it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the superintendent got it out. Oh, good, good. Then, then there's nothing to worry about. Hey, honey. I'm home. Paula? D don't touch it, George. What? Just let it alone. Oh, good. Great. Oh. How did it get in? Look, I... I let it in by accident. It won't leave. I'll get it to leave. No, 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 George. Don't, don't, don't go near it. Please. Paula, we are not going to live with that in the house. It, it has a broken leg. I, I was thinking of getting a, a cage for it. You can't cage a wild bird, and I'm not going to sit around with one beady eye staring at me like that. George, don't touch it, please. Just, just go along with me. Oh, Paula. A pet is one thing, but this. I, I... I... I have to take care of it. Why, why, why a wild bird? I, you know, I, I can't stand the way it stares at me. It stares at me, too. Well, just get used to it. Now, well, this gives me the willies. I'll get dinner. You have to be back at the studio at nine, don't you? Yeah, I'm sorry about our theater day, but with Pete's wife in the delivery room, I've got to cover the evening news. Of course, Pete shouldn't be anywhere else when the baby is born. Do you want French fries or boiled potatoes? Whatever is fastest. <laughs> So oh, you found a home, did you? Well, I'm not in favor of it, but it looks like you're part of the family. Paula, come in, come in. I haven't seen you, why, since your father's funeral, almost three years. It was nice of you to see me, Mr. Martin. And why wouldn't I? I'm only sorry I wasn't more attentive to you after your father passed away. Fred and I were good friends. I've missed him. Thank you. So have I. I, uh... I'm here to ask a favor. Of course, Paula. <sighs> Mr. Martin. Would you lend me $5,000? No questions asked. 5000 All right. Are you in some kind of trouble, Paula? No questions? <laughs> yes, of course. You wouldn't ask me if you didn't need it badly. I will, Paula. I don't have that much on hand. Suppose I send you a check. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't need it immediately. Any time in the next few weeks will just be fine. You'll have it in a few days. I promise you, I will pay you back. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Hello? Mrs. Richards? Yes, it's you. Things are ready. You'll be needing the 5000 very soon. I I've arranged that. Good, good. How is the visitor? Still there? It must be there. It is. Good, good. 5000 dollars, Claude. What? The lady will give us $5,000. Mother. You'll be going to get better, Claude. You'll be able to see again. Your legs won't hurt. Mother. Mother has to leave you for a while. But don't worry, Claude. We'll be together soon with $5,000. 
Everything will be all right. I promise you. Everything will be all right for Mother Love and Claude. And presumably Paula. But when we tamper with the unknown, the results can be very unexpected. I'll return shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. In recent weeks, I've invited listeners to enter a weekly prize drawing and to send along comments about our program if you wished. Well, you leave me just about speechless except to say thank you, thank you for the fantastic response. Thousands upon thousands of letters, and they're still pouring in. But although we couldn't feel more gratified, there is a problem. In addition to your kind words, many of you ask questions. And the volume of mail is so great that we can't get around to sifting through it for many weeks. But now that the drawing is over, if you have a specific question, please try us again, and we'll aim for a quick reply. Address, Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. This is WOR New York, 710 on your dial, your Mystery Theater station. John Wingate, with a reminder, tonight at 10 o'clock, the Wingate News Digest. And question, you planning to dry this weekend? Great. New England? Forget it. The Poconos? Watch out. Upstate? Westchester, Rockland, you're in trouble there, too. A spokesman for the Auto Club of New York will tell you it's going to be a dry weekend coming up. And he'll also let you know how he feels about the gas shortage. It's short, he says, but why, he doesn't know. Then a special, our White House correspondent, Clifford Evans, analyzing Richard Nixon's speech at 9 o'clock tonight. Mr. Evans on with me at 10 o'clock. Later, deafness. What are the early warning signs that you, at whatever age, may be going deaf? We'll find out from a top expert on hearing. He himself has the problem and knows. Tonight, 10 o'clock, John Wingate, WOR. Well, let's return now to the plight of Paula and George Richards. You'll remember that Mother Love told Claude everything would be all right. But things are not quite so right for George. In fact, things for George are getting downright impossible. Paula, I am not going to bed another night with the bird on the dresser. It's been there every night for two weeks. All it does is sleep. You've got to admit he hasn't been in any trouble. I still don't like the look in its eye. The way it hobbles with that broken leg, it's... I mean, it's grotesque. Turn out the light, George. You won't see it then. Oh, 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 boy. I never thought I'd be sharing my bedroom with a bird. Good night, Tommy. What's the matter with that thing? I don't know. It never acted that way before. Keep that up. I'm going to shoot it. Good night, George. Good night, Paula. <laughs> Paula. Paula, what is it? Paula. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get the light. There. I, I can't wait. I'll call Dr. Morton. No. Wait. Wait. Oh, what's the matter? What is the matter with the bird? The devil take the bird. I'm concerned I, about you. It's really... Stop. What time is it? It's, it's, it's 4.30. I'm calling Dr. Morton. Uh, no. Don't. No. Not yet. It no. might be appendicitis. No, 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 it, it, you know, it's not that. I'm going to kill that bird if it doesn't shut up. Uh, 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 look, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll see... Uh, God, I'll, I'll see Dr. Morton in the mo morning. George? Yes, honey? What time is it? Seven o'clock. Oh, I fell asleep. After the pain seemed to stop. So much better now. Well, we're going to see Dr. Morton just as soon as you feel well enough to get up. No, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll just stay home. I don't want to see Dr. Morton today. Paula, you can't let it go. It might be something serious. 
I promise I'll see him when... when it is necessary. I, I just... I want to stay in bed today. I'm going to call him and tell him about it after I make us some coffee. All right. I'm going to wash. I'll call Mr. Jordan also and tell him that you won't be in today. He isn't going to like that. Paula. What? Come in here. What's the matter? You sound so... I didn't do it, Paul. I know I threatened to, but I swear I didn't. I never gave the bird another thought after that paintage. I never touched it. Oh, George, it's all crumpled up. It's dead, Paul. The bird is dead. How long ago was this attack? A little over a month ago, Dr. Morton. Why didn't you see me right away? Well, I wanted to be sure. Well, Paula, there are some preliminary signs similar to pregnancy. That's what I thought. I, I knew it would be. Don't get your hopes up yet, Paula. I told you about the impossibility of your... I know, I know, but I think that... And I said these symptoms are similar to pregnancy. They could be caused by something else. I'd like to run a few more tests. All right, anything that you say, but this time they're going to be positive. I know, Dr. Morton, I just know. A woman knows when life has started within her. Hello? Mrs. Richards, I thought I'd be seeing you by now. Oh, yes, well, uh, the doctor hasn't confirmed it yet, but I... But I... we know, don't we? Yes. The second part of our bargain is due, Mrs. Richards. Five thousand dollars. And after what we've already been through, I think you know I mean what I say. Yes, I do. Good. Good. I'll be expecting you, Mrs. Richards. I promise I'll keep my end of the bargain. I told you I arranged for the money. It just hasn't come in yet. I'll, I'll check on it today. Good. Good. I'll be seeing you soon, then. Yes, I promise. I hope so. I hope so, Mrs. Richards. You know what I can do. Hello? Hello, may I speak to Mr. Morton, please? No, no, Mr. S Mr. Morton Sr. Yes. What? Good God, when? Well, he can't be dead. He just can't be dead. You... Well, listen, do you know if he sent... Oh, no, no, you wouldn't know that. What am I going to do? Oh, dear God. No, 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 I don't want to speak to anyone else. I expected you sooner. I'm sorry. I, I had to turn to another source for the money. It doesn't matter. You're here with it now? Uh, it's all there. Good, good. We're almost even then, eh? I hope so. You don't sound great for Mrs. Richards. You wanted a child, and you are pregnant. You should be grateful. I have lost my son. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Claude is dead. But he was so ill, perhaps it's better. Part of this will pay for the funeral. The rest is for the future. I really must go now. Of course. Go. And good fortune. You won't need the amulet anymore. Save it as a souvenir. And I'll be seeing you when the baby is born. Paula, George. Sit down. Well, I'm sure glad Paula's finally decided to have you check on those stomach pains, Dr. Morton. When I examined her last week... Last week? I didn't tell you, George. I wanted to be sure first. Sure what? I'm going to have a baby. What? That's right, George. <laughs> I wanted to see you both about the results of the tests. It's almost impossible for me to believe, but it's conclusive. Paula is pregnant. I wanted it so much for you, George. What? You said that Paula could never conceive or bear a child. I did, but Paula proved us wrong. <laughs> Believe me, many things happen to prove us wrong now and then. You're happy, George? Happy? Oh, Paula, now I know why you've been so irritable and distant. 
You know, I feel like I'm getting my wife back along with a baby. Well, I want to see you every two weeks. We usually make it a monthly visit, but you're an unusual case. A very wonderful case. I wish you both much happiness. You wanted to see me, Mr. Jordan? Yes, yes, Paula. How are you feeling? <laughs> I think full is the word. Uh, when is the big day? The end of August. It's only three months. I'm I'm going to spend an uncomfortable summer. It, uh, it looks that way. I, I don't know any way of saying this, Paula, other than just coming right out with it. You know we were audited last month at the end of the quarter. Yes. The auditors found a shortage of $5,000. I'll have to have an explanation. Yes, I suppose you will. Now, I know there must be a reason, Paula. You've worked for me for five years. Never a mistake. I'm going to tell you the truth. I just hope that you can believe it. Why shouldn't I? I simply couldn't get the money anywhere. I, I haven't told George, but we'll pay it back. Look, I promise you. I hope so. But I'll go along with that. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Right now, the baby's the important thing. George, it's time. I know it. I'll get Dr. Morton. I'll get the suitcase. Congratulations, Dad. Everything's all right. Paula? Paula's fine. Boy or girl? Only the mother that can tell you that. Go on in. Paula, honey. George, isn't he beautiful? I've already named him George Jr. I hope you don't mind. Mind? Oh, no. Honey, honey, honey. More champagne, Edna? Silly question. A toast to the godmother. Here, here. Oh, you two. You, you know you're going to make a grown woman cry. To Edna and to little George. Oh, I'm so happy for both of you. And you don't know how relieved I am. Relieved? Oh, oh. Well, what I mean is, well, I... I think that Edna means that she's relieved she doesn't have to listen to my troubles at lunch anymore. From now on, everything's roses. I'll get it. Hello? Yes. It's for you, honey. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Richards. Congratulations on your new son. Well, how did you... Thank you. It's time now for the favor. The last part of our bargain... Yes, I suppose it is. Good, good. I'll see you here in my studio tomorrow with the baby. Just to see him? That's all. Just to see him. All right. Good. Good. Come in. I don't want to seem rude, but I'd like to get this over with just as quickly as possible. Come. Let me hold him. Ah. There we are. What a fine, healthy boy. Aren't you, Claude? Such a fine, strong legs now. They don't hurt anymore, do they, Claude? Give me back the baby. Mother told you everything would be all right, Claude. Yes, Claude. Oh, my God. My God, what is, what is it? Mother told you that you'd be away for a little while. But now we're together again. And you won't be sick anymore, Claude. Oh, God. Have a fine new body now. And we'll take better care of it than we did with the last one. Mother will see to that, Claude. Mother will see to it. So, little George, or little Claude, whichever you prefer, seems to have more than his share of mothers. Perhaps Paula and Mother Love will share the raising of the child. 
But whatever they do, I hope that you, if you're ever tempted to deal in spells, will remember some age-old advice and follow it. Caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. I'll be back shortly. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... Anxiety. What's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he's succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Eric. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. <laughs> Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in, Bob and Ray, on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. Good evening, everyone. This is Patricia McCann. Welcome back to the New York Times, Craig Claiborne, and to the McCann program tomorrow morning at 11.15 a.m. right here on WOR. Sweet mystery, magic, mysticism. These are the ingredients we mix well, chill, and serve nightly on Radio Mystery Theater. Come and enjoy our hospitality again when malice heads the menu and menace is our mead. Our cast included Joan Hackett, Bennett Carroll, Mason Adams, Leon Janney, Evie Juster, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Am I dead? Not quite. You're in a hospital with a bullet in your brain. As the saying goes, as good as dead. And Sherry and Herb got away with it. Oh, it isn't fair. I only had it to do all over again. Suppose you had. Could you do better? Of course. Of course, if I knew what I know now. Naturally. That would have to be a precondition if you're asking for yesterday to live over again. Oh, please. Please, give me the chance. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W.O.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. And Suburban Savings, with offices throughout New Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Next, a scene from tomorrow night's Edge of the Seat Entertainment of the W.O.R. Radio Mystery Theater. Breathing, Sergeant. Touch and go. Right. You want to stay with it as we take him in? You don't see the... What is he saying? Search me. Could hold up a minute so I can hear what he's saying. Not a second, Sergeant. 
Anything this guy has to tell you will be after he's operated on, not before. If then. It sounds like he's talking with someone. Asking for something. It was yesterday. There, there, there. Something about I yesterday. I what this baby ought to be worrying about is tomorrow. Listen for The Man Who Asked For Yesterday, another chilling tale on the WOR Radio Mystery Theater, tomorrow night, right after the Fulton Lewis commentary at 7. This is Sherry Henry, proud as a winning politician to announce my special guest tomorrow is Mrs. Malcolm Wilson, the wife of our new governor of New York. Now, you know, the truth is, even though the Wilsons have been at the pinnacle of state government for 16 years, we really know very little about them as people. And what fun, I promise you, it's going to be to meet this charming first lady. That's Mrs. Malcolm Wilson on the Sherry Henry program. It's tomorrow afternoon, 2.15 on WOR Radio. You're now to set for news with John Scott, WOR New York. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ginger Rogers and Frederick Marsh in Bachelor Mother with Frank Albertson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. To the young ladies of our modern business world, the lunch hour means a great deal more than just lunch. It may mean a shopping trip, a visit to the hairdresser, a rendezvous, or perhaps an unexpected adventure. And during a lunch hour, the alert young businesswoman is prepared for almost anything to happen. But Miss Polly Parrish, in our play Bachelor Mother, was just minding her own business when something happened that not only upset her lunch hour, but changed her whole life. One thing led to another in such a gay series of adventures that RKO's picture, Bachelor Mother, turned out to be one of the comedy hits of the year. Although taken by surprise, the modern young woman of our story knew exactly what course to follow. In fact, we take our hats off to the resourcefulness of our modern girls in general. Consider the example sent to me by a member of our audience. It's a clipping from the Birmingham, Alabama News in which a resourceful young lady advertises... Girl in need of work at once will consider dishwashing if Lux is used. <laughs> I'll make a bet she got a job with a wise employer. When Lux Flakes is in the dishpan, both Judy O'Grady and the Colonel's Lady are sisters in the care of their skin. For the role of the modern young Miss Polly Parrish in Bachelor Mother, our choice was the modern young Miss Ginger Rogers, who played the part with typical... Uh, ginger and wit on the screen. She comes to us from the set of the new RKO picture, Primrose Path. As David Merlin, the son of Polly's employer, we planned to have Joel McRae. But Joel was taken ill during the week, and I'm glad to report that he's improving rapidly, and that Frederick March returned to Hollywood just in time to play this role. We've been, <laughs> we've been trying to get Freddie back to our microphone for a long time, but a stage engagement in New York held him there. This week, he begins a new MGM picture, Susan and God. And tonight, you'll hear him as David Merlin. I suggest now that you move up to the edge of your chair as we raise the curtain on Act One of this gay and exciting comedy, Bachelor Mother, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly Parrish and Frederick March as David Merlin, with Frank Albertson of the screencast as Frank Miller. Polly Parrish, young and pretty, is about to lose her job. This is hard enough to face at any time, but when it happens on the day before Christmas, it's almost too much. During her lunch hour, Polly Parrish walks slowly along a street in downtown New York. Vaguely, she wonders what's to become of her. As she passes the Atkins home for foundlings, fate steps in. <laughs> steps in, gallops in, for a woman in a heavy shawl is just leaving a bundle at the door. With a gasp of indignation, Polly rushes to the woman and catches her by the arm. Here, 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 
Why don't you dare? Why don't you dare leave your baby? Please, I'm not the baby's mother. There is no mother. They'll take good care of it here. Just the same, you have no right to do I such I thought a... I could take care of it after the mother died, but I couldn't. Oh, it's such a wonderful baby. They'll be good to it. Wait! Hey, come back here! Come back! Oh. Oh, you poor little kid. All alone. Now, don't cry, darling. Here, I'll hold you. Oh. Would you come in? What? Oh, just come this way, please. Oh, take your finger out of your mouth. There, now, now don't eat your finger. You hungry? Well, I'll give you something to eat here. That's a good baby. Right here, please. Uh, Another one, <laughs> Mr. Fry. Oh, yes. Oh, your sweet. name, please? Poor little thing. So... Your, your name, please. Polly Parrish. Come on, take your finger out of your mouth. <laughs> Are you employed anywhere? <laughs> I'm at Merlin's until tomorrow. You darling, you. That's a good baby. Now, just uh, not... why did you abandon your baby, <laughs> Mrs. Parrish? It's such a sweet... What? Oh, well, this isn't my baby. Uh, it was on the doorstep. Yes, yes, we we know. Well, no, really. Well, an old lady left it on the doorstep, and I I, I thought it would roll uh, my off, My dear, so... we're only here to help you. We're your friends. Well, I wish it was mine, but it isn't. I wasn't leaving it. I, I was just picking it up. Uh, many mothers say babies are not their own, but from experience, we've discovered the wisest thing is to make a clean breast of it. Now, look here. This is ridiculous. This is not my baby, whether you believe it or not. Here, nurse, you take the baby. I'm getting out of here. You see, my dear? Well, you give the baby to the nurse, it cries. Take it back. Just for a moment. There. Well, my dear. Oh, for heaven's sake. The baby seems to know you. Well, I don't know it. Here, you take it. No, no, no. No, let me alone. When I want a family, I'll get married and do it right. Oh, it's pathetic, isn't it? Well, anyway, we know she works at the Merlin department store. Mr. Merlin and his son have always been very charitable. I'll go right over there after lunch. Sit down, Mr. Fry. Now, what can I do for you? You are Mr. Merlin, sir. Mr. Merlin the Younger. Hmm. Was it my uh, father you wanted to see? Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm sure you can take care of this. Well? Uh, Mr. Merlin, an employee of yours, a young woman in the toy department, uh, left a baby at the Atkins home today. Oh, I see. And I discovered, on calling your personnel manager, that she was discharged as of tomorrow. She was probably only hired for the holiday rush. Exactly. But I believe the loss of her position is the reason she has abandoned her baby son. Mr. Marlin, give her back her job. Well, this is really very unfortunate. What's her name? Uh, Parrish. Polly Parrish. Uh, Mr. Marlin, if you had seen this mother denying the parenthood of her own child, it would have touched your heart. Excuse me. Uh, hello, Miss Wilson. Call the toy department and have a girl named... Uh, uh, Parrish. Uh, Parrish. Send up here at once. Oh, it was pitiful, Mr. Merlin, to see the child crying as soon as it left her arms and stopping its crying as it returned to the bosom where it rightfully belonged. Yes, pitiful. And as you may know, it's the home's policy not merely to care for unwanted babies, but to make possible, if possible, the return of the baby to its mother. I think we can arrange that, Mr. Fry. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure of it. When the girl understands... Good afternoon, madam. Can I interest you in a mechanical dock? You see, it winds up with a key in it. No, helps... Henry's much too old for that. Hiya, Polly. How's the girl? Hitting on all six? Hello. Hey, no kidding now, Polly. What are you getting me for Christmas, huh? You wouldn't drink it. <laughs> oh, what a day, Ma. She's crazy for me. No way. Well, you get that hand truck moving and bring back some more ducks. We're running low. Oh, now, take it easy. I've been pushing that truck overtime. Say, Polly, I saw you hooping at the employee's ball, and you got it, babe. Think so? Uh, I'll prove it to you. We're going dancing tonight. But I don't feel like it. Is it worth uh, $50? You mean you're going to give me $50? Well, not exactly. No, listen. There's a dance contest at the Blue Heaven. Now, the orchestra leader is one of the judges, and he's my best pal. The prize is 50 bucks, and we split it up the middle. Uh, cheese it. Here comes a floor walker. What do you say? You've just made a deal. I'll be around to pick you up after dinner. Miss Parrish? Miss Parrish. Uh, yes, Mr. Hargraves. Uh, Miss Parrish, you are wanted in Mr. Merlin's office. Mr. Merlin. At once, please. I don't know why. Uh, 
Mr. Merlin? Oh, yes, come in. Come in. Oh. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Uh... Uh, Miss Parrish? Oh, Miss, Miss Parrish. That's right. Oh, well. Uh, did you receive a card today saying that you were discharged as of the end of this week? Yes, I did. Well, it was a mistake. Will you excuse us? It won't happen again. The job is yours for as long as you care to have it. Huh? Uh, what do you say, Miss Parrish? Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And you're being raised $5 a week, starting as of last week. Is that satisfactory? What do you say, Miss Parrish? Oh, thank you. Well, you're, you're quite welcome. But merely getting your job back and an increase is not your real Christmas present. No? No, no. Your Christmas present is probably the greatest gift a woman could possibly have. I, I almost envy you. Yes, I, I do envy you. Really? Oh, you fortunate girl to have an employer like Mr. Merlin. Yes, but I don't... When you go home tonight, you'll get your Christmas present. Tonight, Mr. Fry? Tonight. Tonight. Fine. You, uh, you may go back to your department now, Miss Parrish. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I want to wish you and yours a very, very Merry Christmas. Well, thank you. And same to you. Yes. Good day. Good day. Good day. A nice-looking girl like that. Ah, uh, yes, it's a funny world. I can just see the look on that girl's face tonight. Yes. Yes, so can I. Wait a second, wait a second. I told you, seven o'clock... Merry Christmas, Miss Parrish. Well, what do you want here? I brought your baby. Uh -huh. uh, what? Here you are, my dear. Your Christmas present uh -huh. from John B. Merlin and Son. Uh -huh. Christmas present? And what do you say, Miss Parrish? Well, I'll tell you what I say. You take that baby right out of here in this minute. What? Do you realize what you're saying? I certainly do. That's not my baby, and you can just take it back to the foundling home where it belongs. Do you understand that Mr. Merlin has given you your job back, that you can raise your child in security and comfort, and you are choosing instead to let it be raised as an orphan without a mother's love? This is not my baby. I am not its mother. No, oh, for shame, for shame, acting like this. Take your baby and be happy. Good night, Miss Perry. Wait, this baby will be back at the foundling home before you get there. I wouldn't try that if I were you, and there's no use le leaving it elsewhere either, because it'll come back to us, and we have its footprints. Oh, well, the nerve. You have... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, kid. Oh, well, gee, this is nothing personal. Gee, I'd love to have you around, but I I couldn't do right by you. Well, come on now. Now, you don't want your teeth to grow in there crooked, do you? No. Come on, take your fingers out, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, who is it? Hi, Paul. This is Frank, the well-dressed man from the toy department. Oh, oh, one minute. Oh, just a minute. Now, look, kid. I'm going to hide you behind the sofa. Now, you just stay there, and don't you make a sound, do you hear? All right, all right. Listen. Hiya, sugar. Oh, hello. Well, well, what a layout. <sighs> Look, Frank, I'm sorry. I, I won't be able to go with you tonight. I, I think I'm going to have a headache. Oh, now, wait a second, baby. You can't do that to the chief. Stand up the old maestro. Why, everything's all set. My brother, let me have his car. It's champing at the curb right this minute. Yeah, well, I'm really awfully sorry, but... Uh, Something's come up. Oh, now, you just listen to the old doctor, honey. Everything's fixed. The orchestra leader's a pal of mine. I just spoke to him on the phone, as a matter of fact, and... Hey, that's funny. I thought I heard a baby crying. Oh, <laughs> well, go on, Frank. Well, so I talked to him, and it's in the bag. So you talked to him, and what did he say? Well, he, he says he's got it all fixed. Hey, listen. I do hear a baby crying. Oh, that. That's next door. Yes, it keeps me awake sometimes, so I think I'll go out of my mind. Oh, that's tough. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, it, it sounds like it's right over here behind the... Holy mackerel! Look! It, it's a baby. A live baby. Well, what of it? Well, what did it do? Crawl through the wall? Don't be silly. Is it, uh... Is it yours? No, it's not mine. Well, where did it come from? 
I got it for Christmas. Oh. Huh? This Christmas or last Christmas? Now, listen, I don't know what you're thinking, but you're all wrong. Oh, oh, sure, And if you'll sure, wait until I get my sure. hat and coat on, we'll go stepping. Oh, well, now, look, if you've got a headache or if you think you might have one, well, just don't Don't bother. worry, it's all cured, and I've got another little situation to cure when we're on our way. Come on, baby. Hey, wait a minute. You're taking that along with us? Certainly. I've got a little errand to do. We're just going to drop it off someplace. Come on. Oh, listen, this is worse than a blind date. I didn't figure... Pull up over there, Frank. Hey, you certainly picked a nice place anyway. Come to the door with me, will you, Frank? Okay. Uh, is this where the baby lives? From now on, it does. Pretty fancy, all right. Ring the bell, will you? Okay. Uh-huh. Goodbye, baby. Uh-huh. You certainly uh-huh. are cute. Gee, uh-huh. isn't this a cute baby? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't they answer the door? <sighs> good evening. Oh, good evening. Is Mr. Merlin in? The, the son. I'd like to... I'd like to see him. Merlin? Hey, Shut would, up. Would you tell me in reference to what? Well, it's a personal matter... He'll know what it's about when he sees me. Well, madam, he's not in just now. Uh, Couldn't you write him a letter? Well, I can't take care of this baby. After all, it's his responsibility, and and he's got influence, and he got me into this fix. He can just get me out. I'm I'm very sorry, madam. Good evening. Oh, no, you don't take this baby. Look here, madam, I... I, Just put your hand under its back. That's right. But but, but wait a minute, madam. You you can't do this. I just did. Come on, let's get going, Frank. Yeah, let's. Well, here we are. Yeah, back home and broke. I'm sorry we didn't win that prize, Polly. Oh, forget it. My friend double-crossed me. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing me home. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Say to Polly, how about giving a fellow a little drinky, huh? Sorry, I I haven't any liquor here. Well, then, how about letting a fellow in for a smoke? I haven't any cigarettes, oh, either. Oh, well, I've got the cigarettes. I only need a match. Now, Frank, it's pretty late, and I have to get up early. All I want is a match. You could give a guy a match, can't you? One little match. <laughs> that never hurt you. One little match. Come on. Frank, Come get on. out of here. <laughs> oh, stop. Get stop. out. Get out. <laughs> who, who said that? I did. <laughs> Go on. Get out of here. Mr. Merlin, Mr. Did you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, sure. I, I just, uh... Well, good night, Mr. Merlin. Well, Mr. Merlin, how did you get into my apartment? The landlady was kind enough to let me, uh, to let us in out of the cold. I've been here three hours. Us? Yes, us. You'll find your child right there on the chair. But I tell you that... Miss Parrish, I followed you tonight, and I came back here to ask you just one question. What possibly could be going on in that peculiar brain of yours that lets you jump around a dance floor like an idiot ten minutes after you've left your child in a strange home with strange people who, for all you know, could strangle it. Are you through? No. I've seen some low things in my time, but a mother who's just abandoned her child going out to enter a dance contest, that will stand alone in my memory as something revolting. I thought that was pretty revolting myself. Are you interested in knowing what I'm going to do? Would it interest you to know that I am not the mother of that child? That, to me, is the lowest thing of all. To deny your own child when it cries as it leaves your arms. Those people have experience. They know a real mother when they see one. I'm going to fire you. In fact, you are fired. But that's nothing. I am not the mother of that child. Fine, fine. You're not the mother. As you go from place to place looking for employment, you will discover that no department store in the Mm. entire Merchants of America Association will hire you. I'll see to that. But that's nothing. Any employer will ask you for a character effort. In my wildest imagination, I cannot conceive of anyone with a character less deserving of a reference than you. I'll explain your character. Why? That's persecution. I'll say it is. And eventually, you'll come and you'll plead for your job back. And then you'll realize what a privilege it is to have security and a chance to raise your child yourself. What? You danced, yes. Well, now you pay the the, the, the fiddler fellow. You have an obligation to that child. You fulfill it. Well... You made up your mind to ask for your job back? Or are you going to starve a while first? Well, I... Uh, well, I'll take my job back. Now, that's better. I'm only doing this for your own good, Miss Parrish. As the years go by, you'll realize what a terrible thing I've saved you from doing. But I'm really not as bad as you think. Well, then why did you do it? Well, I had to. 
There was no one I could turn to. Oh, I see. Well, but isn't there some legal way to make the father support the baby? I, I don't want anything to do with him. Oh, I see. He used to beat me. No. Yeah. See that scar on my head? Where? Coffee pot. Threw it at me. Oh. You poor kid. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I'll be going now. You, you'd better get some sleep. Mm-hmm. And don't worry about anything, Miss Parrish. This store is behind you. Thank you, Mr. Merlin. So that's all right. Good night. Good night. Well, baby, what do we do now? <laughs> Have you got any suggestions? Gurgle, huh? That's fine. Well, I'll think about that. In the meantime, well, thanks for the job anyway. Mr. DeMille brings us Ginger Rogers, Frederick March, and Frank Albertson in Act Two of Bachelor Mother in just a moment. Suppose someone asked you to illustrate speed. How would you do it? One way is with music, a fast, lively tune like this on the xylophone. That expresses musically the marvelous speed of new quick lux. It's really amazing how fast it is. An added ingredient speeds up the action of Lux Flakes, so you get suds in a second. Try it yourself and see. Just pour out the delicate tissue-thin flakes and turn on the water. Then watch the suds bubble up. Those suds come so fast, it's amazing. In water as cool as your hand, New Quick Lux dissolves three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. New Quick Lux is not only wonderfully fast, it's thrifty. Ounce for ounce, it gives you more suds than any of the other soaps tested. That's true even in hard water. There are, there are no builders or fillers in New Quick Lux. It's rich, pure soap. Have you tried it yet? Well, your grocer has New Quick Lux now in the same familiar box at no extra cost to you. Women who've used it are so enthusiastic, they keep saying... I didn't think Lux Flakes could be improved. They've always been so wonderful. But now, they're even better than ever. Don't delay another day. Buy new Quick Lux tomorrow for all your washables and your dishes. Get the generous big box. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Bachelor Mother, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly Parrish and Frederick March as David Merlin, with Frank Albertson as Frank Miller. Two days have passed, and with them, of course, two nights. Silent, restful nights, interrupted only by the constant screeching of Polly's adopted baby. Back at her job in the toy department, Polly is still winding up ducks. But her heart isn't really in her work. Her eyes are half closed from lack of sleep. And she moves slowly as in a dream. Well, well, well. Good morning, Polly, my girl. Good morning. Don't talk too loud. You wake me up. Well, what's the matter? Haven't you been sleeping? Not for two nights. How long can a person go without sleep, Frank? Well, Polly, listen. You, you can trust me. I'm the kind of a guy, you know, see nothing, say nothing. How about putting in a good word for me with, uh, you know, uh, upstairs? What's the matter with you? Well, the assistant floor walker job is open right in this department. Mm-hmm. With that little carnation and everything. Mm-hmm. Now, one word from you and I stop pushing this silly wagon around. What do you say? Miller, get that truck out of the aisle. Uh, yes, sir, right away. Don't let me catch you talking again, Miller. Converse in your own time, not on the stores. Yes, sir. Uh, ex- excuse me, Mr. Hargrave. And Miss Parrish, keep those ducks in motion, please. Yes, sir. Morning, Hargraves. Oh, uh, good morning, good morning. Uh, uh, quite an honor having you visit our department, sir. Oh, not at all, thank you. Thank uh, you. Any special reason, sir? Oh, no, no. Uh, yes, yes, as a matter of fact, the new uh, assistant floor walker. I wrote you a memo about it. It's to be a man by the name of... Uh, well, I can't think of it right now. 
but he's entitled to promotion by seniority. Uh, Frank Miller, sir? Yes, that's it. Unless you have some personal objection. Oh, no, sir. No, I'll tell him now. I'll tell him now, sir. He'll be very happy, sir. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I can hear you all right, but I can't see you so good. I haven't been sleeping for two nights. Why not? The baby's been crying. Is it sick? No, it's just being a baby. Well, why don't you have it sleep on its stomach? I read that someplace. That's how they sleep. Do you know how to get a baby to sleep on its stomach? You turn it on its stomach and then you go to bed. Then the baby turns over and starts to cry, and then you get up and turn the baby over, and then you go to bed again, and then the baby turns over and starts to cry again, and then you get up and turn it on the stomach, and pretty soon it's 9 o'clock and you're winding ducks. Well, but uh, don't any mothers sleep? I'm beginning to think they don't. Well, you'll get on to it. It's a natural instinct. So sleep. Well, then how, how are you managing? Who, who takes care of the baby while you work? My landlady. She knows all about babies, thank heaven. Oh, well, there can't be much to it. <laughs> After all, every, everybody here was a baby, and they all got through it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about that. That's suppose that all mothers put on, that it's so difficult raising a child. <laughs> I, I saw through that when I was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about that, too. Yeah. <laughs> good, good morning. Good morning. Come on now, baby. Come on and eat your dinner. Yeah. See the pretty duck? Now you watch the duck and you eat your dinner. And before you... Come in. Hello. Oh, well, hello. I, I was uh, walking through the book department and I saw this book. How to Bring Up Your Baby Scientifically by Dr. Uh, Ernest Egelman. Greatest thing I ever read. Everything you have to know is, is right in here. You mean a doctor would know more about a baby than its own mother with her natural instincts? Well, this is scientific and includes the instincts, too. All right, come on, baby, just eat your dinner. Hey, Go right no, ahead. No, wait a minute, just... wait a minute. How do you know you're doing that right? Doing what right? Feeding it. Well, there's nothing scientific in this. The baby opens his mouth and I put the food in it and he swallows it. From then on, he's on his own. Ah, oh, well, that's what you think. We'll just have a look at the feeding. Feeding, feeding with an F here. Ah, there. Here we are. Now, listen. After the food is prepared, the mother will, A, get a spoon. Wonderful how he ever thought of that. Don't be so smart. Just do as it says. Spoon. I've got it. And warm it to room temperature. Warm it. I did. How? I put it under the warm water. Well, that may not be right. I, I think it has to be sterilized. Well, well, anyway. B, take a spoonful of food and, uh... Just a second. Place on a piece of gauze. <laughs> you a, uh, uh, piece of gauze? What for? Will you please do as the book says? All right, but I still think it's no, a no, lot No, no, please. Of... It's just possible, you know, that a, a doctor with 20 years of experience knows what he's talking about. All right, go ahead. Next. And gently rub into the navel. What's that? What? And uh, gently rub into the navel. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, no, no, it, it isn't. No, that's... Uh, well, that, that's probably to adjust the temperature of the baby's stomach to the food. <laughs> but I, uh, I... I think it's very logical. Well, I never heard of such a thing. Here, let me see that. Well, I read very well, you know. I've done it for years. Yes, I read little, too. Let me see. Begins see. right here, at the bottom of this page. Oh, yeah. Take a spoonful of food and place on a piece of gauze and... Gently rub into the navel. Huh? You, you read very well. Well, I don't believe it. I don't care what it says. Now, don't make out that you know more than a doctor in a printed book on the subject. I know I'm not rubbing any oatmeal into this baby's navel. <laughs> Who is this Dr. Eaglefoot, anyway? This book is... is it's, oh, look. What's the matter? The pages were stuck together. Well, what do you think of that? Just listen. To relieve gas on child's stomach, take a spoonful of warm oil and 
place on a piece of gauze and gently rub into the navel. Oh, oh isn't that funny? <laughs> mm -hmm, it certainly is. If the page had said, hang baby by neck, you'd thought it very scientific. I'll feed the baby my own way. Come on, baby, now eat your dinner. You know, somebody could room. sue the store for a thing yeah, like it's that. It's a good baby. You might wind the duck, Mr. Worland, if you've got nothing better to do. Well, you know, just Come because on. those pages stuck together, there's no reason to condemn that book entirely. Okay. Well, that's fine. Now you've broke it. Well, it's a, it's a defective duck. Could it be that you wound it too hard? I just wound it normally. This is inferior merchandise. Where'd you buy this duck? John B. Merlin and son. Oh. Well, that's all right. It's still inferior. Out of 10,000 ducks, one or two can be less than perfect. That's what we have an exchange department for. Just have it exchanged tomorrow. Ha, ha. What's the ha, ha for? Nothing. Just ha, ha. What's the matter with our exchange department? I only work for you. We never resent criticism. We appreciate it. You won't get angry. Certainly not. What's the matter with our exchange department? They won't exchange anything. Oh, they won't, eh? They only exchanged $60,000 worth of goods last year. You don't have to overdo that flip attitude about the store. It isn't very cute. Just have that exchange tomorrow. No, I'll just throw it away and buy a new one. Well, I'll exchange it for you. Give it to me. Oh, yeah, well, sure. You could probably get exchanged for a grand piano. I'll show you I can have it exchanged without anybody recognizing me. I'll, I'll wear dark glasses. I'll disguise myself. And I'll have a new duck for you by, by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. What do you think of that? Come on, girls. No leaning against the counters. Here, pick up that paper. Straighten those boxes. Okay. Take it easy, Frank. Mr. Miller to you. I'm the assistant floor walker now. Yes, Mr. Miller. Well, that's better. There's going to be a few changes around here. Come on, come on. No gossiping there. Break it up. Break it up. Oh, uh, Miss Parrish. Hello. How do I look? <laughs> I'd never have recognized you. Oh, they, they won't know me. Would you, uh, would you mind escorting me to the exchange department? Right over here. Just speak to the gentleman behind the counter. He'll take care of you. I'll have this duck exchanged in exactly one minute, and courteously. Here we are. Go ahead. <coughs> I, uh... <laughs> I have a duck here. I'd like to, uh... Just a minute. Just a minute, please. Oh, of course. Of course. Well, what do you want, please? Well, I, uh... I have a duck here I'd like to have exchanged. Certainly, sir. What's your complaint? <laughs> it's, it's broken. Oh, I can see that. How did it happen to break? What difference does it make? I have to know where to place the responsibility. Oh, well, just place the responsibility on the duck and give me a new one. Hmm. May I see the sail slip? Oh, just a minute. Have you got the sail slip? I threw it away. You should have kept it. I, uh, I threw it away. You should have kept it. How did I know the duck was going to break? Well, how did I know the duck was going to break? It's clearly printed on the slip that it's to be kept for 30 days. You can't expect me to keep a sail slip for everything I buy. You can't expect me to keep a slip for everything I buy. My house would be full of them. My house would be full of them. I'm sorry, sir. I don't make the rules for the store. They're made by the executive office. I don't care anything about the executive office. I want another duck. Well, you're not going to get it by shouting. That's what you think. I'm exchanging it for a new duck, and you straighten it out any way you like. Give me that duck. I'll show him. Hey, you, where you going with that duck? Get out of my way. Oh, a shoplifter, huh? Hey, come Frank, in. Frank, stop. He, he... Let go of me. Oh, I got you red-handed. Did you hear what I... Hey, Mac, shoplifter, shoplifter, come on. Will you let me... Where is he? Okay, I got him. Trying to get away with a duck. Let me uh... go. I'm David Merlin. Mr. Merlin? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Merlin. Merlin, oh. Come here, you. I didn't know it was you, Mr. Merlin. I, I, I thought it was a customer. A customer, eh? You're lucky it was me. A customer at Sue the store. How long have you had this job? Well, you know, since yesterday. What did you do before that? I was a stock clerk. Well, I've got a little secret to tell you. You're still a stock clerk. Get a new assistant, Hargraves. Oh, Mr. Miller, you've disgraced the toy department. <laughs> Man from John B. Merlin and Son. Oh, oh 
Well, it's you. Here you are, madam. Your duck. I exchanged it. No trouble at all. <laughs> oh, well, come in. I certainly didn't expect to see you tonight. Well, I didn't expect to come here. I was taking my shower, and it suddenly occurred to me you must be having kind of a shabby New Year's. You get dressed. We're going to a swell party. Stood up, huh? 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 You were stood up. Well, uh, I just told her I'd call back, and then I forgot to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I'd like to go, but I just can't leave the baby alone. Oh, uh, the baby, the baby. You don't have to devote your whole life to the baby. That's what you told me to do. Well, it's New Year's Eve. Get somebody to take care of it. Get, get the landlady to take care oh, of it. Oh, wait, there's, there's something else. What? Well, me in a sweater and skirt, and you with the... We'd make half of a very lovely couple. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. I'll, I'll take care of the clothes. Yes, how? Stop at the store. Everything you need. Oh. Dress, shoes, ermine wrap. You'll be beautiful. Oh, but... Oh, but look, these people, you're... You're, you know, your friends. I don't know how to talk to those people. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You just say no to the men, and the, uh, the girls won't talk to you anyway. This is where I live. Yes, I know. Well, it's been a grand night. See, I've had a wonderful time. So have I. <laughs> I can't ever remember a better one. Thank you, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, say. Yes? I was just thinking, don't people usually, uh, I mean, on New Year's, don't people usually exchange greetings? You know. <laughs> yes, usually. That's what I thought, yeah. I mean, there were a lot of them back at that party. Remember, they were yeah, so. kissing each yeah, other. So. <laughs> sort of a... And it's silly, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? No. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well? Oh, good night. Oh, you better take this coat back. I, I don't want to keep it over Sunday. Well, nothing can happen to it. You wear it and bring it into the store when you come in. All right. Thanks. Well, say, look, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's just 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock? Mm-hmm. In Chicago. <laughs> See, they, uh, they exchange greetings there, too, you know. <laughs> Happy New Year in Chicago, Polly. The same to you. You, uh, wouldn't want to stay up and welcome in the New Year in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, it's pretty late. Good night. You know what we ought to do tomorrow? Why don't we uh, take a long drive in the country? Oh, that would be wonderful. Oh, but don't you think it'd be a little too cold for the baby? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the baby. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, if you want to see us, we'll be in the park all day tomorrow. And... Well, I don't know if I can make it, but I'll try. <laughs> well, thanks again for a very wonderful evening. Hello, Miss Parrish. Oh, Mrs. Weiss, thank you so much for minding the baby. Oh, it's nothing, nothing. <sighs> Look so cute he is. Why, he's awake. You waited up for me, didn't you, baby? <laughs> he wanted to see if I'd come home early, didn't you? <laughs> he's such a good baby. He didn't cry even once. My Jerome, he's just now 31. Used to cry all the time. <laughs> well, thank you again, Mrs. Weiss. I didn't think I'd be out this late, though. And oh, I... it's nothing. <laughs> what else have I got to do? <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Oh, is that so? Listen, baby. I I think he likes me. Or well, maybe, maybe it's just that I'm hoping. But, baby, I don't think he likes you. <laughs> well, now, don't frown. Nobody's going to come between us. No, sir. No, because you're my fella. Good night, darling. And Happy New Year. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will return with Ginger Rogers, Frederick March, and Frank Albertson for Act Three of Bachelor Mother. 
Men are interested in science. Women in beauty. I want to tell you about a most remarkable scientific test made recently in New York, which has a lot to do with beauty, with the loveliness of a woman's hands. Now, every woman knows that coarse, harsh hands, the kind we call housework hands, are unpleasant to look at. And while everyone admires the woman who does her own housework, nobody admires rough, red hands. That is why clever women who cook and wash dishes don't let their hands shout, drudge. They've discovered by actual experience that gentle, new, quick lux for dishes leaves hands lovely. Now comes scientific proof of the wonderful mildness and gentleness of new quick lux, a series of tests conducted by scientists in a laboratory. To this laboratory came hundreds of women, and each made a one-hand test. She put one hand in lux suds and the other hand in suds from another soap. She dipped her hands in and out of the suds for 20 minutes three times a day, in some cases for as many as 27 days. Now, mind you, these women didn't know what soaps were being tested, and they didn't use any creams or lotions on their hands during the test. Conditions were similar to home dishwashing, and they were equal for each of five leading soaps, including Lux, used in the test. Well, sir, when this exhaustive test was over, there was no doubt about the result. It clearly demonstrated that Lux was kindest to those hands. In case after case, the Lux hand looked smooth, soft, and lovely, while the other hand looked rough, red, and unattractive. Now think of it. The same woman, one hand embarrassingly rough, the other charming as ever, thanks to gentle Lux. Now this convincing test, the most dramatic test ever made of dishwashing soaps, merely confirms scientifically what so many women know, that with gentle, new, quick Lux, free from harmful alkali, you can wash dishes and do other soap and water jobs you must do every day without having rough, red hands. So why not do this tomorrow? Get a big box of new Quick Lux Flakes at your grocer's and use it for your dishwashing. Prove for yourself how lovely and soft and feminine it leaves your hands. It's so gentle. And it's speedy, too, and truly thrifty. Yet it costs you no more. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue with the third act of Bachelor Mother. The meetings in the park have become a Sunday ritual with Polly and David, and of course the founding child. But now a new character enters our story. The personification of dignity and breeding, a frock-coated, silk-hatted gentleman, known to the Merlin employees as old J.B., and to David Merlin as Dad. On a certain Sunday morning, Frank Miller, brooding over the loss of his job, has slipped a note into old J.B.'s car. On his way home from church, J.B. reads it. Dear Mr. J.B. Merlin, this is to let you know that you are a grandfather. Hmm? If you don't believe me, just ask your son and a certain girl whose name I won't mention because I am not a rat. They go to the park every Sunday and wheel the baby. How do you like that, you stuffed shirt, a friend? Good Lord! A grandfather! Jones! Jones! Yes, Mr. Merlin? We're not going home yet. Drive through the park. No, no, you mustn't try to sit up, baby. <laughs> there, that's a good boy. Look at him. Isn't he darling? Mm -hmm. You know, you've come a long way from the girl who wouldn't even admit it was her own child. You think it's quite a baby now, don't you? Well, you get used to it. You get used to anything if it's around long enough. But this is an unusual baby. Really, it is. Oh, I don't know. I guess it's heredity. Oh, yes? Mm. Why, what's the matter with me? Oh, nothing. What about the other 50%? Oh, him. Well, if there's anything in heredity, the baby ought to be able to play a wonderful piano. That's quite a quality, yes. He might also get to be the world's best coffee pot thrower. Now, that was unnecessary. After all, you don't know the circumstances. Maybe I was to oh, blame. Oh, never mind. Let's not discuss it. It's none of my business. I haven't any interest in it anyway. Good morning, David. What, uh, 
Ed, what are you doing here? Just strolling around, my boy. Just strolling around. Polly, this is my father. Uh, this is Miss Parrish. How do you do? How do you do? And who is this? Oh, this is uh, Miss Parrish's little boy. A boy? Uh, would you mind, Miss Parrish, if I was very careful, would you let me hold him just for a moment? Of course. Thank you. Come to your grand... Oh. Come to me, little fellow. Oh. There, there, there. Oh, he's wonderful, isn't he? I'd know that chin anywhere. Oh. Why? What's his oh. name, Miss Parrish? Oh, uh, John. John. Mm. Well, thanks for that, anyway. Is there something I can do for you? No, no, you've done it, my girl. Here, go to your mother, John. Oh, thank you. I, um, I wouldn't keep the baby up much longer. I, I think it's getting chilly. Dad, you're acting very strangely. What's the matter? I'll discuss this with you at home. Goodbye, miss. Goodbye. I'll expect you home in an hour, David. What's the matter with him? I don't... Oh, holy mackerel. He thinks that he... Uh... I'll see you later, Polly. Dad! Dad, wait! Now, listen, Dad. I want to tell Quiet. you... Quiet! Quiet! I'll do the talking. Twenty years I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. What do you think for? Why was I living? What was I looking forward to? So this is the modern generation. So this is the 20th century. Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? Well, marriage was good enough for your father and mother, bless her. And it's good enough for you. What? Young man, you're going to marry that girl. You're going to bring my grandson into this house. Well, now I've got something to tell you. Now, don't you start with me. You know my temper. Remember what I did to Governor Meade? Listen, you haven't any grandson. Don't deny it. The least you can do is not deny it. I saw him with my own eyes. I saw you with a girl. I saw you wheeling the baby. That's not my baby. The least you can do is not deny it. I... I have other information. A letter from a friend. And if I didn't have it, if I never saw you wheeling him, if I saw that baby on a desert island by himself, I'd know it was my grandson. Why, he looks exactly like me. Dad, for heaven's sake, you're jumping to conclusions. I, uh, I figured out what to do. My mind's made up. Nobody is playing around with my grandchild. I'm taking it, and I'll get it if I have to go to the Supreme Court. I'll take it now, and you try to get it back. Will you listen, Dad, before your blood pressure goes through the ceiling? Never you mind my blood pressure. You don't know me in a fight. You're the stubbornest person I ever saw in my whole life. I'll prove to you it's not my child. Oh, you're crazy. That's what's the matter with you. You're, you're unbalanced. You've worked too hard, and your mind's cracked under it. What you need is a vacation. Take a vacation in Florida. <laughs> I'd like to see him try it. He can't take that baby away from me. You don't know him, Polly. He's sending for lawyers and investigators. Well, he can't do it. The baby belongs to me. Well, we've got to stop all him. All right, all right. But if you could dig up the piano player, it'd be a big help. Well, I can't do that. Well, you'll have to. I mean, when half a dozen lawyers walk in here questioning your fitness to raise a baby... Look, take me to your father. Let me talk to him. I'll convince him. Well, he won't believe you, either. He, he's gone off his head. He, he even wanted me to marry you. Oh. He... He wanted to set me up with a ready-made family so he'd have a grandson. I, I tell you, it's serious. Yes, yes. Uh, I would be serious marrying me. No, I didn't mean that. I, I just... Would I... you please go? Well, I didn't realize how that sounded. Oh, I, it I... doesn't matter. All that matters is that you tell your father to leave Johnny and me alone. Well, I'll... I'll do what I can, Polly. Will you please go? Now. I'm sorry, Polly, I, oh, I... get out! <laughs> Come in. Well, hello, Miss Parrish. Hello, Mrs. Weiss. Come in, come in. You know my son, Jerome. Oh, sure, sure. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Mrs. Weiss, would you help me pack? I'm going away. Away? Where? Oh, I don't know, someplace. They're trying to take the baby away from me. Who is? Uh, that their fellow just went out? No, his father. He's the pop of the baby. No, but his father thinks he is. Well, that's ridiculous. Now, I don't pretend to be an attorney, but I know your rights, and I say he can't do it. Well, he'll send people to ask questions, and that's just as bad. Polly, darling, why don't you get the real papa to go to his father, huh? 
I can't. I wish I could. Sure, that would be the solution. Wait, 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 I'm thinking. Jerome, if you could be the papa just for a little while... Huh? What? That's it. That's it. Mama! Jerome, this is your chance to do a good deed. But, Mama! Your, your name's Miller, isn't it? Frank Miller? Yes, sir. That's me, Mr. Merlin. Let me in. I had a hard job finding you. Well, Mr. Merlin, if you came about that note, I didn't mean to make any trouble. What, what note? Oh, uh, oh, nothing. Listen, listen, Miller. Do you know who the father of that baby is? Huh? Who is the father? Well, I don't know anything, Mr. Merlin. Nothing at all. You don't? Are you sure? No, sir. I, I don't know. All right. Look, would you like to be an assistant floor walker again? Would I? Then I can fix it for you. Miller, this is your chance to do a good deed. Beg pardon, Mr. Merlin. Well, well, what is it? There are two people to see you, sir. A Mr. and Mrs. Jerome Weiss. Weiss? Never heard of them. Tell them to write a letter. It's about a baby, sir. A baby? Well, well, send them in, send them in. Yes, sir. This way, please. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Weiss, eh? I thought you were Miss. Miss Parrish. Well, that's the name I use in the store. Uh, Jerome and I have been married for two years. Yeah, that's right. That, uh, two years. <laughs> Your son just called, and well, there seems to be a misunderstanding about our baby. Your baby, Mr. Weiss? Uh-huh. Hey, so, yeah. so there's no need you're sending anybody to investigate the baby. It's only a waste of time. His baby. It's as though there'd, there'd been a death in the family. <laughs> I can't believe it. All right, Miller. Right in here. Sure. David, what is this? Well, Dad, maybe this will convince you. <laughs> this man I brought with me is Frank Miller, the father of that baby. Oh. Really? Oh, that's right, Mr. Merlin. I'm the father. Uh, you see, my wife's a very nervous woman, and, and your son just came over to our flat and, and said you had the wrong impression about my son. Well, my son is my son, and nobody else's. Why, I never heard of such a thing. And I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't send any investigators around to make trouble for us. Just a moment. David, do you know who this other man is? No, who? This is the father she brought around, Mr. Jerome Weiss. So you finally showed up, did you? Uh, 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 well, well, I couldn't come... Any sooner. Oh, that was pretty cute, running out on her like that. Come here. You know what this is? Yes, sir. It's a silver service. I mean, it's a coffee pot. Yeah, you ought to recognize it. You give your wife scars in the head, eh? Well, here's one for you. Oh! How do you like that, piano player? You keep your hands off of him. Don't oh, you touch him. all right. Him. You go ahead and stick up stop, for him. Stop, yeah. stop, stop. You might as well cut all this out. It doesn't convince me. And I'm not through with you, Mr. Miller. I'm going to prosecute you for, for something. Uh, Mr. Merlin, your son made me do this. I'll tell you the truth, and I know what I'm talking about. Your son is the father. Dad, this is the truth. Now listen, that man Weiss is the father. I'm not the father. I don't care who the father is. I'm the grandfather. <laughs> now wait. Now wait. I'll straighten this whole thing out. Now listen, Polly. Polly. Where is she? She's gone. Gone. She'll take the baby. Catch her. Stop that girl. Oh, Lord. Uh, sorry I gumped you up, Mr. Merlin, but a guy's got to think quick. He does, eh? Sure, got to use the old bean. Well, you use it now. Ooh. Open this door. Open it, I say. I'll never open it. Get away. All right, then I'll break it down. Get out of here. Go away. Let me alone. No. You're not going to get this baby. Polly, listen. I'm, I'm not trying to take your baby from you. Since you threw me out this afternoon, you, you don't know what I've been going through. I thought I was only doing all this because I, I wanted to help you. But then I, I realized it's because I'm, I'm in love with you. You sound as if you mean it. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to give up this baby. Where is he? Where's my son? Ha! Ha! I knew I'd find you here. Dad... I want to confess something. I am the father of that child. Well, those are the first true words that have passed your lips in 48 hours. 
Where's the baby? Come on, Johnny. Uh, we're going home. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. <laughs> going bye-bye. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. You and Grandpa. David. David, did you mean what you said before? Yes. And you're willing to spend your life with a ready-made family? If the family is you and Johnny. And I've got a surprise for you, Polly. We're getting married. Tonight. Oh. You... You still think I'm the mother of that baby? Well, certainly. Ha, ha. In just a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, a word to women who want their hands to stay lovely looking in spite of dishwashing. Remember the one-hand tests? They've proved how kind these gentle flakes are to your hands. Yes, and it's just as gentle to your nice things, too. Well, that reminds me, Sally. Will you read what Mrs. Mayton Britton of New York wrote? I'd be glad to. She says, New Quick Lux leaves my sweaters as soft as a kitten. They look perfectly lovely. I've been using Lux flakes for years for my sweaters, silks, and other nice things. I didn't dream it could be improved, but somehow you've done it. New Quick Lux is amazing. It's so fast. It's thrifty, too. And it has the same marvelous gentleness Lux has always had. Now there are three good reasons for using new quick Lux. Count them on your fingers. So fast? Why, well, you get suds in a second. A little goes so far, it's thrifty to use. And new quick Lux is so very, very safe for everything safe in water alone. Yet you don't pay a single cent more for this wonderful new quick Lux. Your grocer has it now in the same familiar box. Buy a big box tomorrow for your stockings, underthings, blouses, dresses, and sweaters... For your very nice things, and for your everyday things, too, to keep them new-looking longer. And now, Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars to the microphone. Having brought Bachelor Mother to the happiest of happy endings, Ginger Rogers and Frederick March are all smiles as they report for their curtain call. Ginger, I hope you don't always get into trouble when you try to help somebody as you did in the play. <laughs> well, once in New York, an old lady dropped her handbag in the subway, and I tried to pick it up for her, and she threatened to have me arrested. Really? <laughs> Oh, I don't think you look like a pickpocket. Why, Freddie, that's the nicest compliment I've had this morning, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> no, seriously, though, there's, there's nothing like a good turn to brighten up the day. Well, like most good ideas, I believe that's in Shakespeare. How far that little candle throws his beams, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. Is he quoting it right, Freddie? Don't look at me. <laughs> Miss, Mr. DeMille's a former Shakespearean actor. Oh, well, in that case... We'll give him an A on tonight's lesson. I'll give you both plus A on tonight's performance. Well, we certainly are grateful to you, Freddie, for stepping in and saving the show at the last minute. And I know you and Mr. DeMille join me in wishing the very speediest, re speediest of recovery to Mr. Joel McRae. <laughs> and now I think it's time for Mr. DeMille to give us a report on what he's planned for next week. We've planned a play for next Monday night, Ginger. It'll keep us busy all week. We're especially proud of both play and stars. The play is Intermezzo, and our stars will be Herbert Marshall, Ingrid Bergman, and Gail Patrick. Intermezzo is the unusual love story of a genius. On the screen, it introduced Ingrid Bergman to American picture audiences. And next Monday night, we introduce her to American radio audiences when she joins Herbert Marshall and Gail Patrick in Intermezzo. Well, even for the world's biggest theater, C.B., that's a big event. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Mr. Bernal. Good night. You know, there's a lot more applause for you, too, that you can't hear. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Herbert Marshall, Ingrid Bergman, Gail Patrick in Intermezzo. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from... Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Lou Merrill as J.B. Murdoch, B. Benaderet as Mrs. Weiss, Emery Parnell as Investigator, Edward Meyer as Jerome, Martha Wentworth as Matron, Ralph Sedan as Hargraves, Thomas Mills as Butler, Kenneth Lawton as Clerk, Walter White as Detective, and Celeste Rush, Audrey Reynolds, and Frank Martin. Ginger Rogers' forthcoming picture is RKO... Gregory LaCava production, Primrose Path. Frank Albertson is now working in the MGM picture, Hooray, I'm Alive. 
Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. We're happy to announce that the radio editors of the United States and Canada have just voted the Lux Radio Theater their favorite dramatic program in the poll conducted by Radio Daily as well as the recent poll conducted by the New York World Telegram. May we remind you that the March of Dimes has begun. You can help to stamp out infantile paralysis by joining the march. Get a birthday card from the President's Birthday Committee in care of your radio station. And if you can't, mail the President your dimes anyway to help fight this terrible disease. Your dimes and those of your neighbors will help crippled children to walk again. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>